Section 1 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Colleen McMahon. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 1. Book 26, Chapters 1 to 21. Book 26. A Continuation of the Remedies Derived from Plants, Classified According to Particular Diseases. Chapter 1. New Forms of Disease. The face of man has recently been sensible of new forms of disease, unknown in ancient times, not only to Italy, but to almost the whole of Europe. Still, however, they have not as yet extended to the whole of Italy, nor have they made any very great inroads in Illyricum, Gaul, or Spain, or indeed any other parts to so great an extent as in Rome and its environs. Though unattended with pain, and not dangerous to life, these diseases are of so loathsome a nature that any form of death would be preferable to them. Chapter 2. The Nature of Lichen the most insupportable of all these diseases is the one which, after its Greek appellation, is known to us as lichen. In consequence, however, of its generally making its first appearance at the chin, the Latins, by way of joke originally, so prone are mankind to make a jest of the misfortunes of others, gave it the name of mentagra, an appellation which has since become established in general use. In many cases, however, this disease spreads over the interior of the mouth and takes possession of the whole face, with the sole exception of the eyes, after which it passes downwards to the neck, breast, and hands, covering them with foul, furfuraceous eruptions. Chapter 3. At what period lichen first made its appearance in Italy? This curse was unknown to the ancients, and in the times of our fathers even, having first entered Italy, in the middle of the reign of the emperor Tiberius Claudius Caesar, where it was introduced from Asia, in which country it had lately made its appearance, by a member of the equestrian order at Rome, a native of Perusium, secretary to the quester. The disease, however, did not attack either females or slaves, nor yet the lower orders, or indeed the middle classes, but only the nobles, being communicated even by the momentary contact requisite for the act of salutation. Many of those who persevered in undergoing a course of remedial treatment, though cured of the disease, retained scars upon the body, more hideous even than the malady itself, it being treated with cauteries, as it was certain to break out afresh unless means were adopted for burning it out of the body by cauterizing to the very bone. Upon this occasion, several physicians repaired to Rome from Egypt, that fruitful parent of maladies of this nature, men who devoted themselves solely to this branch of medical practice, and very considerable were the profits they made. At all events, it is a well-known fact that Manilius Cornutus, a personage of praetorian rank and legatus of the province of Aquitania, expended no less a sum than 200,000 sesterces upon his cure. It is much more frequently, on the other hand, that we hear of new forms of diseases attacking the lower orders, a singular fact, and one quite unequaled for the marvelous phenomena which sometimes attend these outbreaks. Thus, for instance, we find an epidemic suddenly making its appearance in a certain country, and then confining itself, as though it had made its election so to do, to certain parts of the body, certain ages, and even certain pursuits in life. In the same way, too, while one class of diseases attacks the young, another confines itself to adults, while one malady extends itself only to the higher classes, another is felt exclusively by the poor. Chapter 4. Carbuncle. We find it stated in the annals that it was in the censorship of L. Paulus and Q. Marcius that carbuncle was first introduced into Italy a malady which till then had confined itself solely to the province of Gallia Narbonensis. In the year in which I am writing these lines, two persons of consular rank have died of this disease, Julius Rufus and Q. Lacanius Bassus, the former in consequence of an incision unskillfully made by his medical attendants, the latter through a wound upon the thumb of the left hand, by pricking a carbuncle with a needle 
a wound so small originally as to be hardly perceptible. This disease makes its appearance in the more hidden parts of the human body, and mostly beneath the tongue. It originally has the form of a hard red pimple, with a blackish head mostly, though sometimes of a livid color. It produces tension of the flesh, but unattended with swelling, pain, or any itching sensation. Indeed, the only symptom that accompanies it is a confirmed drowsiness, which overpowers the patient and carries him off in the course of three days. Sometimes, however, it is accompanied with shuddering and small pustules about the sore, and occasionally, though but rarely, with fever. When these symptoms extend to the falces and esophagus, death ensues with the greatest rapidity. Chapter 5. Elephantiasis we have already stated that elephantiasis was unknown in Italy before the time of Pompeius Magnus. This malady, too, like those already mentioned, mostly makes its first appearance in the face. In its primary form, it bears a considerable resemblance to a small lentil upon the nose. The skin gradually dries up all over the body, is marked with spots of various colors, and presents an unequal surface, being thick in one place, thin in another, Injurated every here and there, and covered with a sort of rough scab. At a later period, the skin assumes a black hue and compresses the flesh upon the bones, the fingers and toes becoming swollen. This disease was originally peculiar to Egypt. Whenever it attacked the kings of that country, it was attended with peculiarly fatal effects to the people, it being the practice to temper their sitting baths with human blood for the treatment of the disease. As for Italy, however, its career was very soon cut short. The same was the case, too, with the disease known as Gemursa to the ancients, a malady which made its appearance between the toes, and the very name of which is now buried in oblivion. Chapter 6. Colic. It is a remarkable fact that some diseases should disappear from among us, while others again should continue to prevail. Colic, for example. It was only in the reign of Tiberius Caesar that this malady made its appearance in Italy, the emperor himself being the first to be attacked by it, a circumstance which produced considerable mystification throughout the city when it read the edict issued by that prince excusing his inattention to public business on the ground of his being laid up with the disease, the very name of which was till then unknown. To what cause are we to attribute these various diseases? Or how is it that we have thus incurred the anger of the gods? Was it deemed too little for man to be exposed to fixed and determinate classes of maladies, already more than three hundred in number, that he must have new forms of disease to alarm him as well? And then, in addition to all these, not less in number are the troubles and misfortunes which man brings upon himself. The remedies which I am here describing are those which were universally employed in ancient times, Nature herself, so to say, making up the medicines. Indeed, for a long time, these were the only medicines employed. Hippocrates, it is well known, was the first to compile a code of medical precepts, a thing which he did with the greatest perspicuity, as his treatises, we find, are replete with information upon the various plants. No less is the information which we gain from the works of Diocles of Charistus, second only in reputation, as well as date, to Hippocrates. The same, too, with reference to the works of Praxagoras, Chrysippus, and, at a later period, Erasistratus of Cos. Herophilus, too, though himself the founder of a more refined system of medicine, was extremely profuse of his commendations of the use of simples. At a later period, however, experience, our most efficient instructor in all things, medicine in particular, gradually began to be lost sight of in mere words and verbiage, it being found, in fact, much more agreeable to sit in schools and to listen to the talk of a professor than to go assimpling in the deserts and to be searching for this plant or that at all the various seasons of the year. Chapter 7. The New System of Medicine. Asclepiades the Physician. Still, however, the ancient theories remained unshaken based as they were upon the still existing grounds of universally acknowledged experience, until in the time of Pompeius Magnus, Asclepiades, a professor of rhetoric, who considered himself not sufficiently repaid by that pursuit, 
and whose readiness and sagacity rendered him better adapted for any other than forensic practice, suddenly turned his attention to the medical art. Having never practiced medicine, and being totally unacquainted with the nature of remedies, a knowledge only to be acquired by personal examination and actual experience, as a matter of course he was obliged to renounce all previously established theories, and to trust rather to his flowing periods and his well-studied discourses for gaining an influence upon the minds of his audience. Reducing the whole art of medicine to an estimation solely of primary causes, he made it nothing but a merely conjectural art, and established it as his creed that there are five great principles of treatment for all diseases in common. Diet, use or non-use of wine, frictions, exercise on foot, and exercise in a carriage or on horseback. As everyone perceived that each of these methods of treatment lay quite within his own reach, all, of course, with the greatest readiness gave their assent, willing as they were to believe that to be true which was so easy of acquisition, and hence it was that he attracted nearly all the world about him, as though he had been sent among mankind on a special mission from heaven. Chapter 8. The Changes Affected by Asclepiades in the Practice of Medicine In addition to this, he had a wonderful tact in gaining the full confidence of his patients. Sometimes he would make them a promise of wine, and then seize the opportune moment for administering it, while on other occasions, again, he would prescribe cold water. Indeed, as Herophilus, among the ancients, had been the first to inquire into the primary causes of disease, and Cleophantus had brought into notice the treatment of diseases by wine, so did Asclepiades, as we learn from M. Varro, prefer to be indebted for his surname and repute to the extensive use made by him of cold water as a remedy. He employed also various other soothing remedies for his patients. Thus, for instance, it was he that introduced swinging beds, the motion of which might either lull the malady or induce sleep as deemed desirable. It was he, too, that brought baths into such general use, a method of treatment that was adopted with the greatest avidity, in addition to numerous other modes of treatment of a pleasant and soothing nature. By these means he acquired a great professional reputation, and a no less extended fame, which was very considerably enhanced by the following incident. Meeting the funeral procession of a person unknown to him, he ordered the body to be removed from the funeral pile and carried home, and was thus the means of saving his life. This circumstance I am the more desirous to mention, that it may not be imagined that it was on slight grounds only that so extensive a revolution was effected in the medical art. There is, however, one thing, and one thing only, at which we have any ground for indignation, the fact that a single individual, and he belonging to the most frivolous nation in the world, a man born in utter indigence, should all on a sudden, and that too for the sole purpose of increasing his income, give a new code of medical laws to mankind. Laws, however, be it remembered, which have been annulled by numerous authorities since his day. The success of Asclepiades was considerably promoted by many of the usages of ancient medicine, repulsive in their nature, and attended with far too much anxiety. Thus, for instance, it was the practice to cover up the patient with vast numbers of clothes, and to adopt every possible method of promoting the perspiration, to order the body to be roasted before a fire, or else to be continually sending the patient on a search for sunshine, a thing hardly to be found in a showery climate like that of this city of ours, or rather, so to say, of the whole of Italy, so prolific as it is of fogs and rain. It was to remedy these inconveniences that he introduced to the use of hanging baths, an invention that was found grateful to invalids in the very highest degree. In addition to this, he modified the tortures which had hitherto attended the treatment of certain maladies, as in Quincy, for instance, the cure of which before his time had been usually effected by the introduction of an instrument into the throat. He condemned, and with good reason, the indiscriminate use of emetics, which till then had been resorted to in a most extraordinary degree. He disapproved also of the practice of administering internally potions that are naturally injurious to the stomach, a thing that may truthfully be pronounced of the greater part of them. Indeed, it will be as well to take an early opportunity of stating what are the medicaments which act beneficially upon the stomach. Chapter 9. 
remarks in dispraise of the practices of magic. But above all things, it was the follies of magic, more particularly, that contributed so essentially to his success, follies which had been carried to such a pitch as to destroy all confidence in the remedial virtues of plants. Thus, for instance, it was stoutly maintained that by the agency of the plant Ethiopis, rivers and standing waters could be dried up, and that by the very touch, all bars and doors might be opened, that if the plant Achimensis were thrown into the ranks of the enemy, it would be certain to create a panic and put them to flight, that lattice was given by the Persian kings to their ambassadors to ensure them an abundant supply of everything wherever they may happen to be, with numerous other reveries of a similar nature. Where, I should like to know, were all these plants when the Kimbri and Teutons brought upon us the horrors of warfare with their terrific yells? Or when Lucullus defeated, with a few legions, so many kings who ruled over the Magi? Why is it, too, that the Roman generals, who have always made it their first care in warfare to make provision for the victualling of their troops? And how was it that at Pharsalia the troops of Caesar were suffering from famine, if an abundance of everything could have been insured by the fortunate possession of a single plant, would it not have been better, too, for Scipio Almilianus to have opened the gates of Carthage by touching them with an herb, than to have taken so many years to batter down its bulwarks with his engines of war? Turning to the present moment, let them, by the agency of the herb Meroes, dry up the Pompatine marshes, if they can and by these means restore so much territory to the regions of Italy in the neighborhood of our city. In the works, two of Democritus, already mentioned, we find a recipe for the composition of a medicament which will ensure the procreation of issue, both sure to be good and fortunate. What king of Persia, pray, ever obtained that blessing? It really would be a marvelous fact that human credulity, taking its rise originally in the very soundest of notions, should have ultimately arrived at such a pitch as this, if the mind of man understood, under any circumstances, how to keep within the bounds of moderation, and if the very system of medicine thus introduced by Asclepiades had not been carried to a greater pitch of extravagance than the follies of magic even, an assertion which I shall prove on a more appropriate occasion. Such, however, is the natural constitution of the human mind, that, be the circumstances what they may, Commencing with what is necessary, it speedily arrives at the point of launching out in excess. We will now resume our account of the medicinal properties of the plants mentioned in the preceding book, adding to our description such others as the necessities of the case may seem to require. Chapter 10. Lichen. Five Remedies. As to the treatment of lichen, so noisome a disease as it is, we shall here give a number of additional remedies for it, gathered from all quarters, although those already described are by no means few in number. For the cure of lichen, plantago is used, pounded, sink foil also, root of albucus in combination with vinegar, the young shoots of the fig tree boiled in vinegar, or roots of marshmallow boiled down to one-fourth with glue and vinegar. The sores are rubbed also with pumice, and then fomented with the root of rummox bruised in vinegar, or with scum of viscous kneaded up with lime. A decoction, too, of tithamalos with resin is highly esteemed for the same purpose. But to all these remedies, the plant known as lichen, from its efficacy as a cure, is held in preference. It is found growing among rocks and has a single broad leaf near the root and a single long stem with small leaves hanging from it. This plant has the property also of effacing brand marks, being beaten up with honey for that purpose. There is another kind of lichen also, which adheres entirely to rocks, like moss, and which is equally used as a topical application. The juice of it, dropped into wounds or applied to abscesses, has the property of arresting hemorrhage. Mixed with honey, it is curative of jaundice, the face and tongue being rubbed with it. Under this mode of treatment, the patient is recommended to wash in salt water, to anoint himself with oil of almonds, and to abstain from garden vegetables. For the cure of lichen, root of thapsia is also used, bruised in honey. Chapter 11. Quinsy. For the treatment of quinsy, we find argemonia recommended in wine, a decoction of hyssop boiled with figs used as a gargle 
pusidanum with an equal proportion of sea calf's rennet proserpinica beaten up in the pickle of the mena and oil or else placed beneath the tongue as also juice of sink foil taken in doses of three cyathi used as a gargle juice of sink foil is good for the cure of all affections of the falchies verbascum too taken in wine is particularly useful for diseases of the tonsillary glands chapter twelve scrofula for the cure of scrofula plantago is employed chelidonia mixed with honey and axle grease sink foil and the root of persilata this last being applied topically and covered with the leaf of the plant artemisia also and an infusion of the root of mandragora in water the large leafed sideritis cleft by the left hand with a nail is worn attached as an amulet but after the cure has been effected, due care must be taken to preserve the plant, in order that it may not be set again, to promote the wicked designs of the herbalists, and so cause the disease to break out afresh, as sometimes happens in the cases already mentioned, and others which I find stated in reference to persons cured by the agency of Artemisia or Plantago. Damasonian, also known as Alkea, is gathered at the summer solstice and applied with rainwater the leaves being beaten up or the root pounded with axle grease so as to admit when applied of being covered with a leaf of the plant the same plan is adopted also for the cure of all pains in the neck and tumors on all parts of the body chapter thirteen the plant called bellus two remedies bellus is the name of a plant that grows in the fields with a white flower somewhat inclining to red if this is applied with artemisia it is said the remedy is still more efficacious. Chapter 14. The Conjurdum. The Conjurdum, too, is a plant with a red blossom, which flowers at the summer solstice. Suspended from the neck, it arrests scrofula, they say, the same being the case also with vervain in combination with plantago. For the cure of all diseases of the fingers, hangnails in particular, sink foil is used. Chapter 15 cough of all diseases of the chest cough is the one that is the most oppressive for the cure of this malady root of panaces in sweet wine is used and in cases where it is attended with spitting of blood juice of henbane henbane too used as a fumigation is good for cough and the same with scordotus mixed with nasturtium and dry resin beaten up with honey Employed by itself also, scordotus facilitates expectoration, a property which is equally possessed by the greater centauri, even where the patient is troubled with spitting of blood, for which last, juice of plantago is very beneficial. Betony, taken in doses of three oboli in water, is useful for purulent or bloody expectorations. Root also of the persilata, in doses of one drachma, taken with eleven pine nuts, and juice of pusidanum. For pains in the chest, acheron is remarkably useful. Hence it is that it is so much used an ingredient in antidotes. For cough, dalcus and the plant scythici are much employed, this last being good, in fact, for all affections of the chest, coughs, and purulent expectorations, taken in doses of three oboli with the same proportion of raisin wine. The verbascum, too, with a flower like gold, is similarly employed. This last-named plant is so remarkably energetic that an infusion of it, administered in their drink, will relieve beasts of burden, not only when troubled with cough, but when broken-winded even, a property which I find attributed to gentian also. Root of cacalia, chewed or steeped in wine, is good for cough, as well as all affections of the throat. Five sprigs of hyssop, with two of rue and three figs, act detergently upon the thoracic organs and allay cough. Chapter 16. Betion, otherwise known as Archeon, Camelucce, or Tusilago. Three remedies. Betion is also known as Tusilago. There are two kinds of it. Wherever it is found growing wild, it is generally thought that there is a spring of water below, and it is looked upon as a sure sign that such is the case by persons in search of water. The leaves are somewhat larger than those of ivy, and are some five or seven in number, of a whitish hue beneath, and a pale green on the upper surface. The plant is destitute of stem, blossom, and seed, and the root is very diminutive, 
Some persons are of opinion that this Bechian is identical with the Archeon, known as the Camelucci. The smoke of this plant in a dry state, inhaled by the aid of a reed and swallowed, is curative, they say, of chronic cough. It is necessary, however, at each inhalation to take a draught of raisin wine. Chapter 17. The Bechian, known also as Salvia, for remedies. There is another Bechian also, known to some persons as Salvia, and bearing a strong resemblance to verbascum. This plant is triturated, and the juice strained off and taken warm for cough, and for pains in the side. It is considered very beneficial also for the stings of scorpions and sea dragons. It is a good plan, too, to rub the body with this juice, mixed with oil, as a preservative against the stings of serpents. A bunch of hyssop is sometimes boiled down with a quarter of a pound of honey for the cure of cough. Chapter 18. Affections of the Side, Chest, and Stomach For the cure of pains in the side and chest, verbascum is used in water with rue. Powdered betony is also taken in warm water. Juice of scordotus is used as a stomachic. Centauri also. Gentian taken in water. And plantago, either eaten with the food or mixed with lentils or a pottage of alica. Betony, which is in general prejudicial to the stomach, is remedial for some stomachic affections, taken in drink or chewed, the leaves being used for the purpose. In a similar manner, too, aristolochia is taken in drink, or dried agaric is chewed, a draught of undiluted wine being taken every now and then. Nymphia heraclea is also applied topically in these cases, and juice of pusidanum. For burning pains in the stomach, cilion is applied, or else cotyledon beaten up with polenta or Izuum. Chapter 19. Molon or Siron Amomum. Molon is a plant with a striated stem, a soft diminutive leaf, and a root four fingers in length, at the extremity of which there is a head, like that of garlic. By some persons it is known as Siron. Taken in wine, it is curative of affections of the stomach and of hardness of breathing. For similar purposes, the greater centauri is used in an electuary. Juice also of plantago, or else the plant itself, eaten with the food, pounded betony in the proportion of one pound to half an ounce of attic honey, taken daily in warm water, and aristolochia or agaric, taken in doses of three aboli, in warm water or ass's milk. For hardness of breathing, an infusion of sisanthemos is taken in drink, and for the same complaint, as also for asthma, hyssop. For pains in the liver, chest, and side, if unattended with fever, juice of pusidanum is used. For spitting of blood, agaric is employed in doses of one victoriatus, bruised and administered in five syathi of honeyed wine. A momum, too, is equally useful for that purpose. For liver diseases in particular, teucria is taken fresh in doses of four drachmae to one hemina of oxycrate or else betony, in the proportion of one drachma to three syathi of warm water. For diseases of the heart, betony is recommended, in doses of one drachma to two syathi of cold water. Juice of sink foil is remedial for diseases of the liver and lungs, and for spitting of blood, as well as all internal affections of the blood. The two varieties of anagallis are wonderfully efficacious for liver complaints. Patients who eat the plant called capnos discharge the bile by urine. Acheron is also remedial for diseases of the liver, and dalcus is useful for the thorax and the pectoral organs. Chapter 20. The Ephedra or Anabasis. Three Remedies. The Ephedra, by some persons called Anabasis, mostly grows in localities exposed to the wind. It climbs the trunks of trees and hangs down from the branches is destitute of leaves but has numerous suckers, jointed like a bulrush. The root is of a pale color. This plant is given, pounded, in astringent red wine for cough, asthma, and gripings in the bowels. It is administered also in the form of a pottage, to which some wine should be added. For these complaints, gentian is also used, being steeped in water the day before, and then pounded and given in doses of one denarius in three syathi of wine. Chapter 21. Geum. Three Remedies. Geum is a plant with thin diminutive roots, black and aromatic. 
It is curative not only of pains in the chest and sides, but is useful also for dispelling crudities owing to its agreeable flavor. Vervain, too, is good for all affections of the viscera, and for diseases of the sides, lungs, liver, and thorax. But one invaluable remedy for diseases of the lungs, and for cases of incipient thysis, is the root of consiligo, a plant only very recently discovered, as already mentioned. It is a most efficient remedy also for pulmonary diseases in swine and cattle, even though only passed through the ear of the animal. When used, it should be taken in water and kept for a considerable time in the mouth beneath the tongue. Whether the part of this plant which grows above ground is useful or not for any purpose is at present unknown. Plantago, eaten with the food, betony taken in drink, and agaric taken in the way prescribed for cough, are useful, all of them, for diseases of the kidneys. End of section one. Recording by Colleen McMahon. Section 2 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 2. Book 26, Chapters 22 to 48. Chapter 22, Tripolium, Three Remedies. Tripolium is a plant found growing upon cliffs on the seashore, against which the waves break, springing up, so to say, neither upon dry land nor in the sea. The leaves are like those of Isatis, only thicker. The stem is a palm in height, and divided at the extremity, and the root white, thick, and odoriferous, with a warm flavour. It is recommended for diseases of the liver, boiled with spelt. This plant is thought by some to be identical with polium, of which we have already spoken in the appropriate place. Chapter 23. The Gromphina. Gromphina is the name of a plant, the stem of which is covered with leaves of a green and rose colour, arranged alternately. The leaves of it are administered in oxycrate in cases of spitting of blood. Chapter 24. The Melandrum. Two remedies. For diseases of the liver, the Melandrum is prescribed, a plant which grows in meadows and cornfields with a white odoriferous flower. The stem is diminutive and is beaten up in old wine. Chapter 25. Calcitum. Two remedies. Molimonium, one remedy. Calcitum also is the name of a plant which is pounded with grape husks and applied topically for the cure of liver complaints. Root of betony acts as a gentle emetic, taken in the same way as hellebore in doses of four drachme in raisin wine or honeyed wine. Hyssop too is beaten up with honey for similar purposes, but it is more efficacious if nasturtium or irio is taken first. Molimonium is used as an emetic, being taken in doses of one denarius, the same too with syllabum. Both of these plants have a milky juice which thickens like gum and is taken with honey in the proportions above mentioned, being particularly good for carrying off bile. On the other hand, vomiting is arrested by the use of wild cumin or powdered betony taken in water. Crudities and distaste for food are dispelled and the digestion promoted by employing docus, powdered betony taken in hydromel, or else plantago boiled like greens. Hiccup is arrested by taking hemionium or aristolochia and asthma by the use of climinus. For pleurisy and peripneumony, the greater centauri is used, or else hyssop taken in drink. Juice of Pucidinum is also good for pleurisy. Chapter 26. Halus, or Cotonia, Five Remedies. The plant Halus, by the people of Gaul called Sil, and by the Veneti, Cotonia, is curative of pains in the side, affections of the kidneys, ruptures, and convulsions. 
It resembles Cunilla bubula in appearance, and the tops of it are like those of thyme. It is of a sweet flavour and allays thirst. The roots of it are sometimes white, sometimes black. Chapter 27. The Chamerops, one remedy. The Stochas, one remedy. The Chamerops, also, is similarly efficacious for pains in the side. It is a plant with leaves like those of myrtle, arranged in pairs around the stem, the heads of it resembling those of the Greek rose. It is taken in wine. Agaric, administered in drink in the same manner as for cough, assuages sciatica and pains in the vertebra. The same too with powdered stochas or betony, taken in hydromel. Chapter 28. Remedies for Diseases of the Belly But it is the belly, for the gratification of which the greater part of mankind exist, that causes the most suffering to man. Thus, for instance, at one time it will not allow the aliments to pass, while at another it is unable to retain them. Sometimes again it either cannot receive the food, or if it can, cannot digest it. Indeed, such are the excesses practised at the present day, that it is through his aliment, more than anything else, that man hastens his end. This receptacle, more troublesome to us than any other part of the body, is ever craving, like some importunate creditor, and makes its calls repeatedly in the day. It is for its sake, more particularly, that avarice is so insatiate, for its sake that luxury is so refined, for its sake that men voyage to the shores even off the faces, for its sake that the very depths of the ocean are ransacked. And yet, with all this, no one ever gives a thought how abject is the condition of this part of our body, how disgusting the results of its actions upon what it has received. No wonder, then, that the belly should have to be indebted to the aid of medicine in the very highest degree. Scordotus, fresh gathered and beaten up, in doses of one drachma, with wine, arrests flux of the bowels, an effect equally produced by a decoction of it taken in drink. Polymonia, too, is given in wine for dysentery, or two fingers' length of root of verbascum in water, seed of nymphia heraclea in wine, the upper root of ziphion in doses of one drachma in vinegar, seed of plantago beaten up in wine, plantago itself boiled in vinegar, or else a potage of alica mixed with the juice of the plant, plantago boiled with lentils, plantago dried and powdered, and sprinkled in drink with parched poppies pounded. Juice of plantago used as an injection or taken in drink, or betony taken in wine heated with a red-hot iron. For colic affections, betony is taken in astringent wine, or Iberus is applied topically, as already stated. For tenesmus, root of nymphia heraclea is taken in wine, or else psyllion in water, or a decoction of root of acheron. Juice of isoam arrests diarrhoea and dysentery, and expels round tapeworm. Root of symphotum taken in wine, arrests diarrhoea and dysentery, and docus has a similar effect. Leaves of isoam, beaten up in wine, and dried alcea, powdered and taken in wine, are curative of griping pains in the bowels. Chapter 29. The Astralgus. Six Remedies. Astralgus is the name of a plant which has long leaves with numerous incisions and running a slant near the root. The stems are three or four in number and covered with leaves. The flower is like that of the hyacinth, and the roots are red, hairy, matted, and extremely hard. It grows on stony localities, equally exposed to the sun and to falls of snow, those in the vicinity of Phineus, in Arcadia, for instance. Its properties are highly astringent. The root of it, taken in wine, arrests looseness of the bowels, having the additional effect of throwing downward the aqueous humours, and so acting as a diuretic, a property, in fact, which belongs to most substances which act astringently upon the bowels. 
bruised in red wine. This plant is curative of dysentery. It is only bruised, however, with the greatest difficulty. It is extremely useful also as a fomentation for gum boils. The end of autumn is the time for gathering it, after the leaves are off, it being then left to dry in the shade. Chapter 30. Ladanum. 18 Remedies. Diarrhea may be also arrested by the use of either kind of ladanum. The kind which is found in cornfields is pounded for this purpose and then passed through a sieve, being taken either in hydromel or in wine of the highest quality. Ladon is the name of the plant from which ladanum is obtained in Cyprus, it being found adhering to the beard of the goats there. The most esteemed, however, is that of Arabia. At the present day, it is prepared in Syria and Africa also, being known as toxicum, from the circumstance that, in gathering it, they pass over the plant a bow with the string stretched and covered with wool, to which the dew-like flocks of ladanum adhere. We have described it at further length when treating of the perfumes. This substance has a very powerful odour and is hard in the extreme, for in fact there is a considerable quantity of earth adhering to it. It is most esteemed when in a pure state, aromatic, soft, green and resinous. It is of an emollient, desiccative and ripening nature, and acts as a narcotic. It prevents the hair from falling off, and preserves its dark colour. In combination with hydromel or oil of roses, it is used as an injection for the ears. With the addition of salt, it is employed for the cure of furfuraceous eruptions of the skin and for running ulcers. Taken with storax, it is good for chronic cough. It is also extremely efficacious as a carminative. Chapter 31. Chondris or Pseudodictamnon. One remedy. Hyposisthus or Orobethron. Two varieties. Eight remedies. Chondrus too, or Pseudodictamnon, acts astringently on the bowels. Hyposisthus, by some known also as Orobethron, is similar to an unripe pomegranate in appearance. It grows, as already stated, beneath the cisthus, whence its name. Dried in the shade and taken in astringent red wine, these plants arrest diarrhoea, for there are two kinds of hyposisthus, it must be remembered, the white and the red. It is the juice of the plant that is used, being of an astringent, desiccative nature. That of the red kind, however, is the best for fluxes of the stomach. Taken in drink, in doses of three oboli, with amylum, it arrests spitting of blood. And employed either as a potion or as an injection, it is useful for dysentery. Vervain, too, is good for similar complaints, either taken in water or, when there are no symptoms of fever, in Ammonian wine, the proportion being five spoonfuls to three syathi of wine. Chapter 32. Laver or Scion. Two remedies. Laver, too, a plant which grows in streams, preserved and boiled, is curative of griping pains in the bowels. Chapter 33. Potamagiton. Eight remedies. The status, three remedies. Potamagiton, too, taken in wine, is useful for dysentery and colic affections. It is a plant similar to beet in the leaves, but smaller and more hairy, and rising but little above the surface of the water. It is the leaves that are used, being of a refreshing, astringent nature, and particularly good for diseases of the legs, and with honey or vinegar for corrosive ulcers. Castor has given a different description of this plant. According to him, it has a smaller leaf, like horsehair, with a long, smooth stem, and grows in watery localities. With the root of it, he used to treat scrofulous sores and indurations. Potamagiton neutralizes the effects of the bite of the crocodile. Hence it is that those who go in pursuit of that animal are in the habit of carrying it about them. Achillea also arrests looseness of the bowels, an effect equally produced by the status, a plant with seven heads, like those of the rose, upon as many stems. 
Chapter 34 The Seratia Two Remedies Leontopodion Luceron Doripetron or Thoribethron Lagopus Three Remedies The Seratia is a plant with a single leaf and a large knotted root. Taken with the food, it is curative of celiac affections and dysentery. Leontopodion a plant known also as Luceron, Doripetron, or Thoribethron, has a root which acts astringently upon the bowels and carries off bile, being taken in doses of two denarii in hydromel. It grows in Champagne localities with a poor soil. The seed, taken in drink, produces nightmare, it is said, in the sleep. Lagopus arrests diarrhoea, taken in wine, or if there are symptoms of fever, in water. This plant is attached to the groin, for tumours in that part of the body. It grows in cornfields. Many persons recommend, in preference to anything else, for desperate cases of dysentery, a decoction of roots of sink foil in milk, or else aristolochia, in the proportion of one victoriatus to three cyathi of wine. In the case of the preparations above mentioned, which are recommended to be taken warm, it will be the best plan to heat them with a red-hot iron. On the other hand, again, the juice of the smaller centauri acts as a purgative upon the bowels, and carries off bile, taken in doses of one drachma, in one hemina of water, with a little salt and vinegar. The greater centauri is curative of griping pains in the bowels. Betony also has a laxative effect, taken in the proportion of four drachmae to nine cyathi of hydromel. The same too with euphorbia, or agaric, taken in doses of two drachmae with a little salt in water, or else in three oboli of honeyed wine. Cyclaminos also is a purgative, either taken in water or used as a suppository. The same too with camesisos, employed as a suppository. A handful of hyssop boiled down to one-third with salt, or beaten up with oxymel and salt, and applied to the abdomen, promotes pituitous evacuations, and expels intestinal worms. Root also of pusidanum carries off pituitous humours and bile. Chapter 35. Epithemon, or Hippophios. Eight Remedies. The two kinds of anagallis, taken in hydromel, are purgative. The same too with epithemon, which is the blossom of a sort of thyme similar to savoury. The only difference being that the flower of this plant is nearer grass green, while that of the other thyme is white. Some persons call it hippophius. This plant is by no means wholesome to the stomach, as it is apt to cause vomiting, but at the same time, it disperses flatulency and gripings of the bowels. It is taken also in the form of an electuary for affections of the chest with honey, or in some cases with iris. Taken in doses of from four to six drachmae with honey and a little salt and vinegar, it relaxes the bowels. Some persons, again, give a different description of epithemon. According to them, it is a plant without a root, diminutive and bearing a flower resembling a small hood and of a red colour. They tell us too that it is dried in the shade and taken in water in doses of half an acetabulum and that it has a slightly laxative effect upon the bowels and carries off the pituitous humours and bile. Nymphia is taken for similar purposes in astringent wine. Chapter 36 Pycnocomon Four Remedies Pycnocomon, too, is a purgative. It is a plant with leaves like those of rocket, only thicker and more acrid. The root is round, of a yellow colour, and with an earthy smell. The stem is quadrangular, of a moderate length, thin, and surmounted with a flower like that of osimum. It is found growing in rough, stony soils. The root, taken in doses of two denarii in hydromel, acts as a purgative upon the bowels and effectually carries off bile and pituitous humours. The seed, taken in doses of one drachma in wine, is productive of dreams and restlessness. 
Capnos too carries off bile by the urine. Chapter 37. Polypodion. Three remedies. Polypodion, known to us by the name of Felicula, bears some resemblance to fern. The root of it is used medicinally. Being fibrous and of a grass-green colour within, about the thickness of the little finger, and covered with cavernous suckers like those on the arms of the polypus. This plant is of a sweetish taste and is found growing among rocks and under trees. The root is steeped in water and the juice extracted. Sometimes, too, it is cut in small pieces and sprinkled upon cabbage, beet, mallows, or salt meat, or else it is boiled with pap as a gentle aperient for the bowels, in cases of fever even. It carries off bile also, and the pituitous humours, but acts injuriously upon the stomach. Dried and powdered, and applied to the nostrils, it cauterizes polypus of the nose. It has neither seed nor flower. Chapter 38. Scamony. Eight Remedies. Scamony also is productive of derangement of the stomach. It carries off bile, and acts strongly as a purgative upon the bowels unless indeed aloes are added in the proportion of two drachma of aloes to two oboli of scamony. The drug thus called is the juice of a plant that is branchy from the root and has unctuous white triangular leaves with a solid moist root of a nauseous flavour. It grows in rich white soils. About the period of the rising of the dog star, an excavation is made about the root to let the juice collect which done, it is dried in the sun and divided into tablets. The root itself, too, or the outer coat of it, is sometimes dried. The scamony most esteemed is that of colophon, missia, and prienne. In appearance it ought to be smooth and shiny, and as much like bull glue as possible. It should present a fungus surface also, covered with minute holes, should melt with the greatest rapidity, have a powerful smell, and be sticky like gum. When touched with the tongue, it should give out a white milky liquid. It ought also to be extremely light, and to turn white when melted. This last feature is recognised in the spurious scamony also, a compound of meal of fitches and juice of marine tithimulus, which is mostly imported from Judea, and is very apt to choke those who use it. The difference may be easily detected, however, by the taste, as Tithimulus imparts a burning sensation to the tongue. To be fully efficacious, scamony should be two years old. Before or after that age, it is useless. It has been prescribed to be taken by itself also in doses of four oboli with hydromel and salt. But the most advantageous mode of using it is in combination with aloes, care being taken to drink honeyed wine the moment it begins to operate. The root, too, is boiled down in vinegar to the consistency of honey, and the decoction used as a liniment for leprosy. The head is also rubbed with this decoction, mixed with oil, for headache. Chapter 39. The Tithimulus Haracaius The Tithimulus is called by our people the milk plant, and by some persons, the goat lettuce. They say that if characters are traced upon the body with the milky juice of this plant and powdered with ashes, when dry the letters will be perfectly visible, an expedient which has been adopted before now by intriguers for the purpose of communicating with their mistresses in preference to a correspondence by letter. There are numerous varieties of this plant. The first kind has the additional name of Haracaius, and is generally looked upon as the male plant. Its branches are about a finger in thickness, red and full of juice, five or six in number, and a cubit in length. The leaves near the root are almost exactly those of the olive, and the extremity of the stem is surmounted with a tuft like that of the bulrush. It is found growing in rugged localities near the seashore. The seed is gathered in autumn together with the tufts, and after being dried in the sun, is beaten out and put by for keeping. As to the juice, 
The moment the down begins to appear upon the fruit, the branches are broken off, and the juice of them is received upon either meal of fitches, or else figs, and left to dry therewith. Five drops are as much as each fig ought to receive, and the story is that if a dropsical patient eats one of these figs, he will have as many motions as the fig has received drops. While the juice is being collected, due care must be taken not to let it touch the eyes. From the leaves pounded, a juice is also extracted, but not of so useful a nature as the other kind. A decoction, too, is made from the branches. The seed also is used, being boiled with honey and made up into purgative pills. These seeds are sometimes inserted in hollow teeth with wax. The teeth are rinsed, too, with a decoction of the root in wine or oil. The juice is used externally for lichens, and is taken internally both as an emetic and to promote alvine evacuation. In other respects, it is prejudicial to the stomach. Taken in drink, with the addition of salt, it carries off pituitous humours, and in combination with saltpetre, removes bile. In cases where it is desirable that it should purge by stool, it is taken with oxycrate, but where it is wanted to act as an emetic, with raisin wine or hydromel, three oboli being a middling dose. The best method, however, of using it is to eat the prepared figs above mentioned just after taking food. In taste, it is slightly burning to the throat. Indeed, it is of so heating a nature that applied externally by itself, it raises blisters on the flesh, like those caused by the action of fire. Hence it is that it is sometimes employed as a cautery. Chapter 40. The Tithymalus Myrtites, or Caryites. 21 Remedies. A second kind of Tithymalus is called Myrtites, by some persons, and Caryites by others. It has leaves like those of myrtle, pointed and prickly, but with a softer surface, and grows, like the one already mentioned, in rugged soils. The tufted heads of it are gathered just as barley is beginning to swell in the ear, and after being left for nine days in the shade, are thoroughly dried in the sun. The fruit does not ripen all at once, some indeed not till the ensuing year. The name given to this fruit is the nut, whence the Greek appellation caryites. It is gathered at harvest and is washed and dried, being given with twice the quantity of black poppy in doses of one acetabulum in all. As an emetic, this kind is not so efficacious as the preceding one, and indeed the same may be said of all the others. Some physicians recommend the leaf to be taken in the manner already mentioned, but say that the nut should either be taken in honeyed wine or raisin wine, or else with sesame. It carries off pituitous humours and bile by stool, and is curative of ulcerations of the mouth. For corrosive sores of the mouth, the leaf is eaten with honey. Chapter 41 the Tithymalos Paralios, or Tithymalis, Four Remedies A third kind of Tithymalus is known by the additional name of Paralios, or else as Tithymalis. The leaf is round, the stem a palm in height, the branches red, and the seed white. This seed is gathered just as the grape is beginning to form, and is dried and pounded being taken as a purgative in doses of one acetabulum. Chapter 42. The Tithymalus Helioscopios. 18 Remedies. A fourth kind of Tithymalus is known by the additional name of Helioscopios. It has leaves like those of purslane, and some four or five small branches standing out from the root, of a red colour, half a foot in height, and full of juice. This plant grows in the vicinity of towns. The seed is white, and pigeons are remarkably fond of it. It receives its additional name of Helioscopios from the fact that the heads of it turn with the sun. Taken in doses of half an acetabulum in oxymel, it carries off bile by stool. In other respects, it has the same properties as the Paracaeus above mentioned. Chapter 43 the Tithymalus Cyparisias, 18 Remedies. 
In the fifth place, we have the Tithimulus known as Cypericeus, from the resemblance of its leaves to those of the cypress. It has a double or triple stem and grows in Champagne localities. Its properties are exactly similar to those of the Helioscopios and Caracaeus. Chapter 44. The Tithimulus Platyphylus, Corymbites, or Amygdalites. Three Remedies. The sixth kind is called Platyphylus by some, and Corymbites or Amygdalites by others, from its resemblance to the almond tree. The leaves of this kind are the largest of all. It has a fatal effect upon fish. An infusion of the root or leaves or the juice, taken in doses of four drachme in honeyed wine or hydromel, acts as a purgative. It is particularly useful also for carrying off the aqueous humours. Chapter 45. The Tithimulus dendroidus, cobios or leptophilus. Eighteen remedies. The seventh kind has the additional name of dendroidus and is known by some persons as cobios and by others as leptophilus. It grows among rocks and is by far the most shrubby of all the varieties of the Tithimulus. The stems of it are small and red and the seed is remarkably abundant. Its properties are the same as those of the Caracaeus. Chapter 46 The Apios Ischas or Raphanos Agria Two remedies. The Apias Ischas, or Raphanos Agria, throws out two or three rush like branches of a red colour, creeping upon the ground and bearing leaves like those of rue. The root resembles that of an onion, only that it is larger, for which reason some have called it the wild radish. The interior of this root is composed of a mamose substance containing a white juice. The outer coat is black. It grows in rugged, mountainous spots, and sometimes in pasture lands. It is taken up in spring, and pounded and put into an earthen vessel, that portion of it being removed which floats upon the surface. The part which remains acts purgatively, taken in doses of an obolus and a half in hydromel, both as an emetic and by stool. This juice is administered also in doses of one acetabulum for dropsy. The root of this plant is dried and powdered and taken in drink. The upper part of it, they say, carries off bile by acting as an emetic, the lower part by promoting alvine evacuation. Chapter 47. Remedies for griping pains in the bowels. Every kind of panaceas is curative of gripings in the bowels, as also betony, except in those cases where they arise from indigestion. Juice of Pusidanum is good for flatulency, acting powerfully as a carminative. The same is the case also with root of Acheron and with Docus, eaten like lettuce as a salad. Ladanum of Cyprus, taken in drink, is curative of intestinal affections, and a similar effect is produced by powdered gentian, taken in warm water, in quantities about as large as a bean. For the same purpose, Plantago is taken in the morning, in doses of two spoonfuls with one spoonful of poppy in four cyathi of wine, due care being taken that it is not old wine. It is given too at the last moment before going to sleep, and with the addition of nitre or polenta, if a considerable time has elapsed since the last meal. For colic, an injection of the juice is used, one hemina at a time, even in cases where fever has supervened. Chapter 48. Remedies for Diseases of the Spleen Agaric, taken in doses of three oboli and one cyathus of old wine, is curative of diseases of the spleen. The same too with the root of every kind of panaces, taken in honeyed wine. Tucrea also is particularly useful for the same purpose, taken in a dry state, or boiled down in the proportion of one handful to three hymenae of vinegar. Tucrea too is applied with vinegar to wounds of the spleen, or if the patient cannot bear the application of vinegar with figs or water. Polymonia is taken in wine, and betony in doses of one drachma in three cyathi of oxymel. 
Aristolochia, too, is used in the same manner as for injuries inflicted by serpents. Argimonia, it is said, taken with the food for seven consecutive days, diminishes the volume of the spleen, and a similar effect is attributed to agaric, taken in doses of two oboli in oxymel. Root two of nymphaea heraclea, taken in wine or by itself, diminishes the spleen. Cisanthemos, taken twice a day, in doses of one drachma in two cyathi of white wine, for forty consecutive days, gradually carries off the spleen, it is said, by urine. Hyssop, boiled with figs, is very useful for the same purpose. Root of longhitis also, boiled before it has shed its seed. A decoction of root of pusidanum is good for the spleen and kidneys. Acheron, taken in drink, diminishes the spleen and the roots of it are very beneficial for the viscera and iliac regions. For similar purposes, seed of Clemenus is taken for 30 consecutive days in doses of one denarius in white wine. Powdered betony is also used, taken in a potion with honey and squill vinegar. Root 2 of lonchitis is taken in water. Trucrium is used externally for diseases of the spleen. Scordium also, in combination with wax, and agaric, mixed with powdered fenugreek. End of section 2。section 3 of the Natural History, volume 6。this is a LibriVox recording. all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 3, Book 26, Chapters 49 to 70. Chapter 49, Remedies for Calculi and Diseases of the Bladder. For Diseases of the Bladder and Calculi, affections which as already observed produce the most excruciating torments polemonia is highly efficacious taken in wine agaric also in leaves or root of plantago taken in raisin wine Batoni too is very good as already observed when speaking of diseases of the liver this last plant is used also for hernia applied topically or taken in drink it is remarkably efficacious too for strangury for calculi some persons recommend betony vervain and milfoil in equal proportions in water as a sovereign remedy it is universally agreed that titany is curative of strangury and that the same is the case with sanfoil boiled down to one-third in wine this last plant is very useful too taken internally and applied topically for rupture of the groin the upper part of the root of ziphion has a diuretic effect upon infants it is administered also in water for rupture of the groin and is applied topically for diseases of the bladder juice of pusidanum is employed for hernia in infants and Cilion is used as an application in cases of umbilical hernia the two kinds of anagallus are diuretic and a similar effect is produced by a decoction of root of acheron or the plant itself bruised and taken in drink this last is good too for all affections of the bladder both the stem and root of cotyledon are used for the cure of calculi and for all inflammations of the genitals myrrh is mixed in equal proportions with the stem and seed the more tender leaves of ebulum beaten up and taken with wine expel calculi of the bladder and an application of them is curative of diseases of the testes a rigoron with powdered frankincense and sweet wine is curative of inflammation of the testes and root of symphytum applied topically reduces rupture of the groin the white hypo 
kiss the securative of corroding ulcers of the genitals artemisia is prescribed also in sweet wine for the cure of calculi and of strangury and root of nymphia heraclea taken in wine allays pains in the bladder chapter fifty crethmos eleven remedies catchery a similar property belongs also to crethmos a plant highly praised by hippocrates this is one of the wild plants that are commonly eaten at all events we find callimachus mentioning it as one of the viands set on table by the peasant hakael it is a species of garden battis with a stem a palm in height and a hot seed odoriferous like that of libanotis and round when dried the seed bursts asunder and discloses in the interior a white kernel known as catchery to some the leaf is unctuous and of a whitish colour like that of the olive only thicker and of a saltish taste the roots are three or four in number and about a finger in thickness the plant grows in rocky localities upon the seashore it is eaten raw or else boiled with cabbage and has a pleasant aromatic flavour it is preserved also in brine this plant is particularly useful for strangury the leaves stem or root being taken in wine it improves the complexion of the skin also but if taken in excess is very apt to produce flatulency used in the form of a decoction it relaxes the bowels has a diuretic effect and carries off the humours from the kidneys the same is the case also with alkia dried and powdered and taken in wine it removes strangury and with the addition of daucus is still more efficacious it is good too for the spleen and is taken in drink as an antidote to the venom of serpents mixed with their barley it is remarkably beneficial for beasts of burden when suffering from pituitous deflections or strangury chapter fifty one the anthilion two remedies the anthilus two remedies the anthilion is a plant very like the lentil taken in wine it is remedial for diseases of the bladder and arrests hemorrhage another variety of it is the anthilus a plant resembling the camipitus with a purple flower a powerful smell and a root like that of endive chapter fifty two capia one remedy the plant known as capia is even more efficacious it resembles purslane in appearance but has a darker root that is never used it grows upon the sands of the seashore and has a bitter taste taken in wine with root of asparagus it is remarkably useful for diseases of the bladder chapter fifty three hypericon chamapitus or corison nine remedies hypericon otherwise known as the chamipitus or corison is possessed of similar properties it is a plant with a stem like that of a garden vegetable thin red and a cubit in length the leaf is similar to that of rue and has an acrid smell the seed is enclosed in a swarthy pod and ripens at the same time as barley this seed is of an astringent nature arrests diarrhoea and acts as a diuretic it is taken also for diseases of the bladder in wine chapter fifty four keros or hypericon ten remedies there is another hypericon also known as keros by some the leaves of it resemble those of the tamarics beneath which it grows but are more unctuous and not so red it is an odoriferous plant somewhat more than a palm in height of a sweet flavour and slightly pungent the seed is of a warming nature and is consequently productive of eructations it is not however injurious to the stomach this plant is particularly useful for strangury provided the bladder be not ulcerated taken in wine it is curative a pleurisy also chapter fifty five the calithrix one remedy the perpressa one remedy the chrysanthemum one remedy the anthemus one remedy calithrix beaten up with cumin seed and administered in white wine is useful also for diseases of the bladder leaves of vervain boiled down to one-third or root of vervain in warm honeyed wine expel calculi of the bladder 
per pressa a plant which grows in the vicinity of aretium and in illyricum is boiled down to one-third in three hemini of water and the decoction taken in drink the same too with trefoil which is administered in wine and the same with the chrysanthemum the anthemus also is an expellent of calculi it is a plant with five small leaves running from the root two long stems and a flower like a rose the roots of it are pounded and administered alone in the same way as raw laver chapter fifty six Sileus, one remedy Sileus is a plant which grows in running streams with a gravelly bed it bears some resemblance to parsley and is a cubit in height it is cooked in the same manner as the acid vegetables and is of great utility for affections of the bladder in cases where that organ is affected with eruptions it is used in combination with root of panaces a plant which is otherwise bad for the bladder the erratic apple too is expellent of calculi for this purpose a pound of the root is boiled down to one-half in a congeus of wine and one hemina of the decoction is taken for three consecutive days the remainder being taken in wine with siam sea nettle is employed too for the same purpose daucus and seed of plantago in wine chapter fifty seven the plant of fulvius the plant of fulvius too so called from the first discoverer of it and well known to herbalists bruised in wine acts as a diuretic chapter fifty eight remedies for diseases of the testes and of the fundament scordian reduces swelling of the testes henbane is curative of diseases of the generative organs strangury is cured by juice of pusidanum taken with honey as also by the seed of that plant agaric is also used for the same purpose taken in doses of three oboli in one cayanthus of old wine root of trefoil in doses of two drachmae in wine and root or seed of daucus in doses of one drachma for the cure of sciatica the seed and leaves of erythrodanum are used pounded panaceas taken in drink polemonia employed as a friction and leaves of aristolochia in the form of decoction agaric taken in doses of three oboli in one cayanthus of old wine is curative of affections of the tendon known as platus and of pains in the shoulders sangfoil is either taken in drink or applied topically for the cure of sciatica a decoction of scammony is used also with barley meal and the seed of either kind of hypericon is taken in wine for diseases of the fundament and for excoriations plantago is remarkably efficacious for condolomata sanctfoil and for procadence of the rectum root of cyclaminos applied in vinegar the blue anagallis reduces procedence of the rectum while on the contrary that with a red flower has a tendency to bear it down cotyledon is a marvellous cure for condylomatous affections and piles and root of acheron boiled in wine and beaten up is a good application for swelling of the testes according to what cato says those who carry about them pontic wormwood will never experience chafing between the thighs nine some persons add pennyroyal to the number of these plants gathered fasting they say and attached to the hinder part of the body it will be an effectual preservative against all pains in the groin and will allay them in cases where they already exist chapter fifty nine inguinalis or argamo inguinalis again or as some persons call it argamo a plant commonly found growing in bushes and thickets needs only to be held in the hand to be productive of beneficial effects upon the groin chapter sixty remedies for inflamed tumours cryosipios one remedy panaceas applied with honey heals inflammatory tumours an effect which is equally produced by plantago applied with salt sanctfoil root of persilata used in the same way as for scrofula damasonian also and verbascan pounded with the root and then sprinkled with wine and wrapped in a leaf warmed upon ashes and applied hot persons of experience in these matters have asserted that it is of primary importance that the application should be made 
by a maiden as also that she must be naked at the time and fasting the patient must be fasting too and the damsel must say touching him with the back of her hand apollo forbids that a disease shall increase which a naked virgin restrains so saying she must withdraw her hand and repeat to the above effect three times both of them spitting upon the ground each time root too of mandragora is used for this purpose with water a decoction of root of scammony with honey sideritis beaten up with stale grease horehound with stale axle grease or chrysippus a plant which owes its name to its discoverer with pulpy figs chapter sixty one ten aphrodisiacs and antaphrodisiacs nymphia heraclea used as already stated acts most powerfully as an antaphrodisiac the same too if taken once every forty days in drink taken in drink fasting or eaten with the food it effectually prevents the recurrence of libidinous dreams the root too used in the form of a liniment and applied to the generative organs not only represses all prurient desires but arrests the seminal secretions as well for which reason it is said to have a tendency to make flesh and to improve the voice the upper part of the root of ziphion taken in wine acts as an aphrodisiac the same is the case too with the wild crethmos or agrios as it is called and with orminum beaten up with polenta chapter sixty two the orcus or serapius five medicinal properties satyrion but there are few plants of so marvellous a nature as the orcus or serapius a vegetable production with leaves like those of the leek a stem a palm in height a purple flower and a twofold root formed of the tuberosities which resemble the testes in appearance the larger of these tuberosities or as some say the harder of the two taken in water is provocative of lust while the smaller or in other words the softer one taken in goat's milk acts as an antaphrodisiac some persons describe this plant as having a leaf like that of the squill only smoother and softer and a prickly stem the roots heal ulcerations of the mouth and are curative of pituitous discharges from the chest taken in wine they act astringently upon the bowels satyrion is also a powerful stimulant there are two kinds of it the first has leaves like those of the olive but longer a stem four fingers in length a purple flower and a double root resembling the human testes in shape this root swells and increases in volume one year and resumes its original size the next the other kind is known as the satyrios orcus and is supposed to be the female plant it is distinguished from the former one by the distance between its joints and its more branchy and shrub-like form the root is employed in filters and it is mostly found growing near the sea beaten up and applied with polenta or by itself it heals tumours and various other affections of the generative organs the root of the first kind administered in the milk of a colony sheep causes tantigo taken in water it produces a contrary effect chapter sixty three satyrion three medicinal properties satyrion era three recon four medicinal properties the greeks give the name of satyrion to a plant with red leaves like those of the lily but smaller not more than three of them making their appearance above ground the stem they say is smooth and bare and a cubit in length and the root double the lower part which is also the larger promoting the conception of male issue the upper or smaller part that of female they distinguish also another kind of satyrion by the name of erythraecon it has seed like that of the vitex only larger smooth and hard the root they say is covered with a red rind and is white within and of a sweetish taste it is mostly found in mountainous districts the root we are told if only held in the hand acts as a powerful aphrodisiac and even more so if it is taken in rough astringent wine it is administered in drink they say to rams and he-goats when inactive and sluggish and the people of sarmatia are in the habit of giving it to their stallions when fatigued with covering a defect to which they give the name of prosedamum the effects of this plant are neutralized by the use of hydromel or lettuces the greeks however give the general name of satyrion to all substances of a stimulating tendency 
to the crategus for example the theligonum and the aranogonum plants the seed of which bears a resemblance to the testes persons who carry the pith of branches of tithomelos about them are rendered more amorous thereby it is said the statements are really incredible which theophrastus in most cases an author of high authority makes in relation to this subject thus for instance he says that by the contact only of a certain plant a man has been enabled in the sexual congress to repeat his embraces as many as seventy times even the name and genus however of this plant he has omitted to mention chapter sixty four remedies for the gout and diseases of the feet sideritis attached to the body as an amulet reduces varicose veins and effects a painless cure gout used to be an extremely rare disease not in the times of our fathers and grandfathers only but within my own memory even indeed it may justly be considered a foreign complaint for if it had been formerly known in italy it would surely have found a latin name it should however by no means be looked upon as an incurable malady for before now in many instances it has quitted the patient all at once and still more frequently a cure has been effected by proper treatment for the cure of gout roots of panaceas are used mixed with raisins juice of henbane or the seed combined with meal scordium taken in vinegar iberus as already mentioned vervain beaten up with axle grease or root of cyclaminos a decoction of which is good also for chilblains as cooling application for gout root of ziphion is used seed of psyllium hemlock with litharge or axle grease and at the first symptoms of red gout or in other words hot gout the plant isum for either kind of gout a rigoron with axle grease is very useful leaves of plantago beaten up with a little salt or argamonia pounded with honey an application of vervain is also a remedial and it is a good plan to soak the feet in a decoction of that plant in water chapter sixty five lapago or malugo one remedy asperugo one remedy lapago is employed also for this disease a plant similar to the anagallus were it not that it is more branchy bristling with a greater number of leaves covered with rugosities full of a more acrid juice and possessed of a powerful smell the kind that resembles anagallus most closely is known as malugo asperugo is a similar plant only with a more prickly leaf the juice of the first is taken daily in doses of one denarius into kyathi of wine chapter sixty six phycos thalassion or seaweed three varieties of it lapa bo aria but it is the phycos phalacian or seaweed more particularly that is so excellent a remedy for the gout it resembles the lettuce in appearance and is used as the basis in dyeing tissues with the purple of the murex used before it becomes dry it is efficacious as a topical application not only for gout but for all diseases of the joints there are three kinds of it one with a broad leaf another with a longer leaf of a reddish hue and a third with a crisp leaf and used in crete for dyeing clothes all these kinds have similar properties and we find nicander prescribing them in wine as an antidote to the venom of serpents even the seed also of the plant which we have spoken of as cilion is useful for the cure of gout it is first steeped in water and one hemina of the seed is then mixed with two spoonfuls of resin of colophon and one spoonful of frankincense leaves of mandragora too are highly esteemed for this purpose beaten up with polenta eleven for swellings of the ankles slime kneaded up with oil is wonderfully useful and for swellings of the joints the juice of the smaller centauri this last being remarkably good also for diseases of the sinews centaurus too is very useful and for pains in the sinews of the shoulder blades shoulders vertebrae and loins an infusion of batoni is taken in drink in the same way as for diseases of the liver sanfoil is applied topically to the joints and a similar use is made of the leaves of mandragora mixed with polenta or else the root beaten up fresh with wild cucumber or boiled in water for chaps upon the toes root of polypodion is used and for diseases of the joints juice of henbane with axle grease amomum with a decoction of the plant centaculus boiled or fresh moss steeped in water 
and attached to the part till it is quite dry the root too of lapa boaria taken in wine is productive of similar effects a decoction of cyclaminos in water is curative of chilblains and all other affections resulting from cold for chilblains cotyledon is also employed with axle grease leaves of bactrachion and juice of epithymum latinum mixed with castorium and vervain applied with wine extract corns from the feet chapter sixty seven maladies which attack the whole of the body having now finished the detail of the diseases which are perceptible in individual parts of the body we shall proceed to speak of those which attack the whole of the body the following i find mentioned as general remedies in preference to anything else an infusion of dodecathios a plant already described should be taken in drink and then the roots of the several kinds of panaceas in maladies of long-standing more particularly seed too of panaceas should be used for intestinal complaints for all painful affections of the body we find juice of scordium recommended as also that of betony this last taken in a potion is particularly excellent for removing a wan and leaden hue of the skin and for improving its general appearance chapter sixty eight the geranion murus or myrtis three varieties of it six remedies the plant geranion has the additional names of myrus and myrtus it is similar to hemlock in appearance but has a smaller leaf and a shorter stem rounded and of a pleasant taste and odour such at all events is the description given of it by our herbalists but the greeks speak of it as bearing leaves a little whiter than those of the mallow thin downy stems and branches at intervals some two palms in length with small heads at their extremities in the midst of the leaves resembling the bill of a crane there is also another variety of this plant with leaves like those of the anemone but with deeper incisions and a root rounded like an apple sweet and extremely useful and refreshing for invalids when recovering their strength this last would almost seem to be the true geranium for phthisis this plant is taken in the proportion of one drachma to three chiothi of wine twice a day as also for flatulency eaten raw it is productive of similar effects the juice of the root is remedial for diseases of the ear and for opisthotomy the seed is taken in drink in doses of four drachmae with pepper and myrrh juice of plantago taken in drink is curative of phthisis and a decoction of it is equally good for the purpose plantago taken as a food with oil and salt immediately after rising in the morning is extremely refreshing it is prescribed too in cases of atrophy on alternate days petoni is given with honey in the form of an electuary for phthisis in pieces the size of a bean agaric too is taken in doses of two oboli in raisin wine or else daucus with the greater centauri in wine for the cure of phagadina a uh, name given in common to bulimia and to a corrosive kind of ulcer tithamalus is taken in combination with sesame chapter sixty nine the onotherus or oniar three remedies among the various evils by which the whole of the body in common is afflicted that of wakefulness is the most common among the remedies for it we find panaceas mentioned cliamenus and aristolochia the odour of the plant being inhaled and the head rubbed with it i zoom or house leek is beneficial wrapped in black cloth and placed beneath the pillow without the patient being aware of it the onotherus too or oniar taken in wine has certain exhilarating properties it has leaves like those of the almond tree a rose-coloured flower numerous branches and a long root with a vinous smell when dried an infusion of this root has a soothing effect upon wild beasts even for fits of indigestion attended with nausea petoni is taken in drink used similarly after the evening meal it facilitates the digestion taken in the proportion of one drachma to three chiothi or oximal it dispels crapulence the same is the case too with agaric taken in warm water after eating petoni is curative of paralysis it is said the same too with iberus as already stated this last is good too for numbness of the limbs the same being the case with argamonia a plant which disperses those affections which might otherwise necessitate the application of the knife chapter seventy 
remedies for epilepsy epilepsy is cured by the root of the panaceas which we have spoken of as the heracline taken in drink with sea calf's rennet the proportions being three parts of panaceas and one of rennet for the same purpose an infusion of plantago is taken or else betony or agaric with oxymel the former in doses of one drachma the latter in doses of three oboli leaves of sanctifoil are taken also in water arca zostis is also curative of epilepsy but it must be taken constantly for a year root of bacar too dried and powdered and taken in warm water in the proportion of three kyathi to one kyathus or coriander centuculus also bruised in vinegar warm water or honey vervain taken in wine hyssop berries three in number pounded and taken in water for sixteen days consecutively possidanum taken in drink with sea calf's rennet in equal proportions leaves of sanctifor bruised in wine and taken for thirty days powdered betony in doses of three denarii with one cyanthus of squill vinegar and an ounce of attic honey as also scamony in the proportion of two oboli to four drachmae of castorium end of section three Section 4 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sarah Mobley. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 4, Book 26, Chapters 71 to 93. Chapter 71 Remedies for Fevers. Agaric taken in warm water alleviates cold fevers. Sideritis in combination with oil is good for tertian fevers. Bruised latinum also, which is found in cornfields. Plantago taken in doses of two drachmae in hydromel a couple of hours before the paroxysms come on juice of the root of plantago made warm or subjected to pressure or else in the root itself beaten up in water made warm with a hot iron some medical men prescribed three roots of plantago in three scythi of water and in a similar manner four roots for quartan fevers when buglasose is beginning to wither if a person takes the pith out of the stem and says while so doing that it is for the cure of such and such a person suffering from fever and then attaches seven leaves to the patient just before the paroxysms come on he will experience a cure they say fevers too those which are attended with recurrent cold shiverings more particularly are cured by administering one drachma of betony or else agaric in three scythi of hydromel some medical men recommend three leaves of sink foil for tertian four for quartan and an increased number for other fevers while others again prescribe in all cases three oboli of sink foil with pepper and hydromel vervain administered in water is curative of fever and beasts of burden even but care must be taken in cases of tertian fever to cut the plant at the third joint and of quartan fever at the fourth the seed of either kind of hypericon is taken also for quartan fevers and cold shiverings powdered betony modifies these fits and panaceas is of so warming a nature that persons when about to travel amid the snow are recommended to drink an infusion of it and to rub the body all over with the plant aristolochia also arrests shivering produced by cold chapter seventy two remedies for phrenitis lethargy and carbuncles phrenitis is cured by sleep induced by the agency of an infusion of bucadinum in vinegar poured on the head or else by the juice of either kind of anagallis on the other hand when patients are suffering from lethargy it is with the great difficulty that they are aroused a result which may be effected they say by touching the nostrils with juice of bucadinum in vinegar for the cure of insanity betony is administered in drink 
Panaceas brings carbuncles to a head and makes them break, and they are equally cured by powdered betony applied in water, or else cabbage leaves mixed with frankincense in warm water and taken in considerable quantities. For a similar purpose, a red-hot coal is extinguished in the patient's presence, and the ashes are taken up with the finger and applied to the sore. Bruce plantago is also used for the cure of carbuncles. Chapter 73 Remedies for Dropsy, Acute or Ebulum, Chimaecti. For the cure of dropsy, Tithy Malus Caraceus is employed, Panaceas also. Plantago, used as a diet, dry bread being eaten first, without any drink, betony taken in doses of two drachmae and two scythi of ordinary wine or honeyed wine, agaric or seed of lonchitis in doses of two spoonfuls in water, Cilion taken in wine, juice of either anagallus, root of cotyledon and honeyed wine, root of ebulum, fresh gathered, with the mold shaken off, but not washed in water, a pinch and two fingers being taken in one hemina of old wine mold, root of trefoil taken in doses of two drachmae in wine, tithymalos, known as platyphilos, seed of the hypericon, otherwise known as caros, the plant called acti, the same thing as ebulum, according to some, the root of it being pounded in three scythi of wine if there are no symptoms of fever, or the seed of it being administered in red wine, a good handful of vervain also, boiled down in water to one half. But all of the remedies for this disease, juice of chimaecti, is looked upon as by far the most efficacious. Morbid or pituitous eruptions are cured by the agency of plantago or else the root of cyclaminos with honey. Leaves of ebulum, bruised in old wine and applied topically, are curative of the disease called boa, which makes its appearance in the form of red pimples. Juice of strictness applied as a liniment is curative of perigo. Chapter 74. Remedies for erysiplias. For the cure of erysiplias, Isoum is used, or else pounded leaves of hemlock, or root of mandragora, this last being cut into round slices like cucumber and suspended over must, after which it is hung up in the smoke and then pounded in wine or vinegar. It is a good plan to use some fermentations with myrtle wine. Two ounces of mint beaten up in vinegar with one ounce of live sulfur form a mixture sometimes employed, as also soot mixed with vinegar. There are several kinds of erysiplias. One in particular, which attacks the middle of the body and is known as zoster, should it entirely surround the body, its effects are fatal. For this disease, plantago is remedial, mixed with camolian chalk, vervain used by itself, or root of persolata. For other kinds of erysiplias of spreading nature, root of cotyledon is used, mixed with honeyed wine. Isoum also, or juice of linozostis in combination with vinegar. Chapter 75, Remedies for Sprains. For the cure of sprains, root of polypodion is used in the form of a liniment. The pain and swelling are modified also by seed of psyllion. Leaves of plantago beaten up with a little salt, seed of verbascum boiled in wine and pounded, or hemlock with axle grease. Leaves of ephemeron are applied topically to tumors and tuberosities, so long as they are capable of being dispersed. Chapter 76 Remedies for Jaundice It is upon the eyes in particular that jaundice is productive of so remarkable an effect. The bile penetrating between the membranes, so extremely delicate as they are and so closely united. Hippocrates tells us that the appearance of jaundice on or after the seventh day in fevers is a fatal symptom. But I am acquainted with some instances in which the patient survived after having been reduced to this apparently hopeless state. We may remark also that jaundice sometimes comes on without fever superventing. It is combated by taking the greater centauri, as already mentioned, in drink, agaric in doses of three oboli in old wine, or leaves of vervain in doses of three oboli, taken for four consecutive days in one hemina of mulled wine. But the most speedy cure of all is effected by using juice of sinkfoil in doses of three scythi with salt and honey. 
Root of cyclaminos is also taken in drink in doses of three drachmae, the patient sitting in a warm room free from all cold and draughts, the infusion expelling the bile by its action as a sudorific. Leaves of the tussilago are also used in water for this purpose. The seed of either kind of linozostis sprinkled in the drink or made into a decoction with chickpeas or wormwood. Hyssop berries taken in water. The plant lichen, all other vegetables being carefully abstained from while it is being used. Polythrix taken in wine. And struthian in honeyed wine. Chapter 77, Remedies for Boils. There are boils, also known as furnunculi, which make their appearance indiscriminately on all parts of the body, and are productive of the greatest inconvenience. Sometimes, indeed, when the constitution is exhausted, they are fatal in their effects. For their cure, leaves of picna common are employed, beaten up with polenta, if the boil has not come to a head. They are dispersed also by an application of leaves of ephedrine. Chapter 78, Remedies for Fistula. Fistulas, too, insidiously attack all parts of the body, owing to unskillfulness on the part of medical men in the use of the knife. The smaller centauri is used for the cure with the addition of lotions and boiled honey. Juice of plantago is also employed as an injection. Sink foil mixed with salt and honey. Latinum combined with castorium. Cotyledon applied hot with stag's marrow. Pith of the root of verbascum reduced to a liquid state in the shape of a lotion and injected. Root of aristolachia or juice of tithymalos. Chapter 79, Remedies for Abscesses and Hard Tumors. Abscesses and inflammations are cured by an application of leaves of argamonia. For indurations and gatherings of all descriptions, a decoction of vervain or sink foil in vinegar is used. Leaves are root of verbascum, a liniment made of wine and hyssop, root of a coron, a decoction of it being used as a fermentation, or else isoum. Contusions also, hard tumors, and fistulous abscesses are treated with illocabra. All kinds of foreign substances which have pierced the flesh are extracted by using leaves of tussilago, docus, or seed of leontopodium, pounded in water with polenta. To separations, leaves of pycnocommon are applied, beaten up with polenta, or else the seed of that plant, or orchis. An application of root of sateron is said to be a most efficacious remedy for deep-seated diseases of the bones. Corrosive ulcers and all kinds of gatherings are treated with seaweed, used before it has dried. Root 2 of alcima disperses gatherings. Chapter 80, Remedies for Burns Burns are cured by the agency of plantago or of arction, so effectually indeed as to leave no scar. The leaves of this last plant are boiled in water, beaten up, and applied to the sore. Roots of cyclaminos are used in combination with isoam, the kind of hypericon also which we have mentioned being called chorisum. Chapter 81, Remedies for Diseases of the Sinews and Joints For diseases of the sinews and joints, plantago, beaten up with salt, is a very powerful remedy, or else argamonia, pounded with honey. Patients affected with spasms or tetanus are rubbed with juice of pucadium. For indurations of the sinews, juice of agalops is employed. And for pains in those parts of the body, origeron or epithymum used as a liniment with vinegar. In cases of spasms and opus thetoni, it is an excellent plan to rub the part affected with seed of the hypericon, known as caros, and to take the seed and drink. Phrynion, it is said, will effect a cure even when the sinews have been severed, if applied instantaneously, bruised or chewed. For spasmodic affections, fits of trembling, in opus thetoni, root of alcima is administered in hydromel. Used in this manner, it has a warming effect when the limbs are benumbed with cold. Chapter 82, Remedies for Hemorrhage The red seed of the plant called paeonia arrests hemorrhage. The root is also possessed of similar properties, but it is clemenous that should be employed when there are discharges of blood at the mouth or nostrils, from the bowels or from the uterus. 
In such cases, lysimachia, also taken in drink, applied topically or introduced into the nostrils, or else seed of plantago or sinkfoil is taken in drink or employed in the form of a liniment. Hemlock seed is introduced into the nostrils for discharges of blood there, or else it is pounded and applied in water. Isome also in root of astragalus. Isahemon and Achillea likewise arrest hemorrhage. Chapter 83 Hippurus, otherwise called ephedrin, anabasis or aquisitum, three kinds of it, 18 remedies. Aquisitum, a plant called Hippurus by the Greeks, and which we have mentioned in terms of condemnation when treating of meadowlands, it being, in fact, a sort of hair of the earth, similar in appearance to horse hair, is used by runners for the purpose of diminishing the spleen. For this purpose, it is boiled down in a new earthen vessel to one-third, the vessel being filled to the brim, and the decoction taken in doses of one hemina for three successive days. It is strictly forbidden, however, to eat any food of a greasy nature the day before taking it. Among the Greeks, there are various opinions in relation to this plant. According to some who give it the name of Hippurus, it has leaves like those of the pine tree and of a swarthy hue. And, if we are to believe them, it is possessed of the virtues of such a marvelous nature that if touched by the patient only, it will arrest hemorrhage. Some authorities call it Hippurus, others again ephedrine, and others anabasis. And they tell us that it grows near trees, the trunks of which it ascends, and hangs down therefrom in numerous tufts of black, rush-like hair, much like a horse's tail in appearance. The branches, we are told, are thin and articulated, and the leaves few in number, small and thin, the seed round and similar to coriander in appearance, and the root ligneous. It grows, they say, in plantations more particularly. This plant is possessed of astringent properties. The juice of it, kept in the nostrils, arrests bleeding therefrom, and it acts astringently upon the bowels. Taken in doses of three sciathy in sweet wine, it is a cure for dysentery, is an efficient diuretic, and is curative of cough, hardness of breathing, ruptures, and serpigneous affections. For diseases of the intestines and bladder, the leaves are taken in drink. It has the property also of reducing ruptures of the groin. The Greek writers describe another hippurus, also with shorter tufts, softer and wider. This last, they say, is remarkably good for sciatica, and applied with vinegar for wounds, it having the property of stanching the blood. Bruise nymphia is also applied to wounds. Pucatinum is taken in drink with cypress seed for discharges of blood at the mouth or by the lower passages. Cideritis is possessed of such remarkable virtues that applied to the wound of a gladiator just inflicted, it will stop the flow of blood, an effect which is equally produced by an application of charred fennel giant, or of the ashes of that plant. For a similar purpose, also the fungus that is found growing near the root of the fennel giant is still more efficacious. Chapter 84. Stephanomalus for bleeding at the nostrils, seed of hemlock pounded in water is considered efficacious, as also stephanomalus applied with water. Powdered betony, taken with goat's milk or bruised plantago, arrests discharges of blood from the mammalia. Juice of plantago is administered to patients when vomiting blood. For local discharges of blood, an application of root of persilata with stale axle grease is highly spoken of. Chapter 85, Remedies for Ruptures and Convulsions, Erisothales, One Remedy. For ruptures, convulsions, and falls with violence, the greater centauri is used. Root of gentian, pounded or boiled, juice of betony, this last being employed also for ruptures produced by straining the vocal organs or sides, panaceas, scordium, or aristolochia taken in drink. For contusions and falls, agaric is taken in doses of two oboli and three sciathy of honeyed wine, or if there are symptoms of fever, hydromel, the verbascum also with a golden flower, root of a corn, the several varieties of aeosium, the juice of the larger kind being particularly efficacious, juice of symphytum, or a decoction of the root of that plant, docus, unboiled, Erisothales, a plant with a yellow flower and a leaf like that of the acanthus, taken in wine. 
Camerops, Erio, taken in pottage, Plantago, taken anyway, as also. Chapter 86, Remedies for Thoriasis. Thoriasis is a disease which proved fatal to the dictator Scylla, and which develops itself by the production of insects in the blood, which ultimately consume the body. It is combated by using the juice of Timinian grapes or of hellebore, the body being rubbed all over with it in combination with oil. A decoction of Timinian grapes and vinegar has the effect also of ridding the clothes of these vermin. Chapter 87 Remedies for Ulcers and Wounds Of ulcers, there are numerous kinds, which are treated in various ways. The root of all the varieties of panaceas is used as an application for running ulcers in warm wine. That which we have spoken of as the coronian is particularly good as a desiccative. Bruised with honey, it opens tumors and is useful for serpiginous ulcers, the cure of which appears more than doubtful in which case it is amalgamated with flour of copper tempered with wine, either the seed, flour, or root be employed for the purpose. Mixed with polenta, it is good for old wounds. The following are also good detergents for wounds. Heraclean, Sidurian, Apollinaris, Cilion, Tragacantha, and Scordotus mixed with honey. Powdered Scordotus applied by itself consumes fleshy excrescences on the body. Polomonia is a curative of the malignant ulcer known as cocoethes. The greater centauri, sprinkled in powder or applied in the form of a liniment, or the leaves of the smaller centauri, boiled or pounded, act as a detergent upon inveterate ulcers and effect a cure. To recent wounds, the follicles of the climenus are applied. Gentian is applied to superneous ulcers, the root being bruised or else boiled down in water to the consistency of honey. The juice also of the plant is employed. For wounds, a kind of lycium is prepared from gentian. Lysimachia is curative of recent wounds and plantago of all kinds of ulcerations, those on females, infants, and aged persons more particularly. This plant, when softened by the action of fire, is better still. In combination with curry, it acts as a detergent upon ulcers with indurated edges and arrests the progress of corrosive sores. When applied bruised, it should be covered with its own leaves. Caledonia also acts as a desiccative upon suppurations, abscesses, and fistulous ulcers. Indeed, it is so remarkably useful for the cure of wounds as to be employed as a substitute for spodium even. In cases where the cure is almost hopeless, it is applied with axle grease. Dittany, taken internally, causes arrows to fall from the flesh. Used as a liniment, it has the effect of extracting other kinds of pointed weapons. The leaves are taken in the proportion of one obolus to one scythus of water. Nearly equal in its efficacy is a pseudodicnamnon. They are both of them useful also for dispersing separations. Aristolochia cauterizes putrid sores and, applied with honey, acts as a detergent upon sordid ulcers. At the same time also, it removes maggots and extracts hard cores and all foreign bodies adhering to the flesh, arrows more particularly, and, applied with resin, splintered bones. Used by itself, it fills the cavities made by ulcers with new flesh, and employed with iris in vinegar, it closes recent wounds. Vervain, or sink foil with salt and honey, is remedial for ulcers of long standing. Roots of persilata are applied to recent wounds inflicted with iron, but for old wounds, it is the leaves that are employed. In both cases, in combination with axle grease, the sore being then covered with the leaves of the plant. Damasconium is used for wounds the same way as for scorfula, and leaves of verbascum are employed with vinegar and wine. Vervain is useful for all kinds of callosities or putrid sores. Root of Nymphaea heraclea is curative of running ulcers, and the same is the case with root of cyclaminos, either used by itself or in combination with vinegar or honey. This last root is useful also for the cure of steatomatous tumors and hyssop for that of running ulcers. 
an effect equally produced by pucatinum, a plant which exercises so powerful an influence upon fresh wounds as to cause exfoliation even of the bones. The two varieties of anagallus are possessed of similar properties, and act as a check upon the corrosive sores known as nome, and upon deflections. They are useful also in cases of recent wounds, those of aged people in particular. Fresh leaves of mandragora, applied with carotene, are curative of apostomies and sordid ulcers. The root, too, is used with honey or oil for wounds. Hemlock, incorporated with flour of winter wheat by the agency of wine, as also the plant isoam, is curative of herpetic eruptions and corrosive or putrid sores. Origera is employed for ulcers which breed maggots. Root of astrologus is used for the cure of recent wounds or of ulcers of long standing, and upon these last, either kind of hypothesis acts as a detergent. Seed of Leontopodium, bruised in water and applied with polenta, extracts pointed weapons from the flesh, a result equally produced by using seed of Pycnicomen. The Tithymalus caracias supplies its juice for the cure of gangrenes, phagodanic sores, and putrid ulcers, or else a decoction is made of the branches with polenta and oil. Roots of Orcus have a similar effect in addition to which applied with either dry or fresh gathered, with honey and vinegar, they are curative of the ulcer known as cacoethes. Onothera also, used by itself, is curative of ulcers when rapidly gaining head. The people of Scythia employ Scythus for the treatment of wounds. For carcinoma, argamonia applied with honey is extremely efficacious. For sores that have prematurely closed, Root of asphodel is boiled, in manner already stated, and then beaten up with polenta and applied. For all kinds of wounds, Apollinaris is very useful. Root of astrologus, reduced to powder, is good for running ulcers. The same, too, with calithrix, boiled in water. For blisters, more particularly when caused by the shoes, mervain is used, as also pounded lysimachia or nymphaea, dried and powdered, but when they have assumed the form of inveterate ulcers, polythrix will be found more serviceable. Chapter 88, Polynemon, One Remedy. Polynemon is a plant which resembles Cunilla bubula. It has a seed like that of pennyroyal, a ligneous stem with numerous articulations, and odoriferous umbels with a pleasant though pungent smell. This plant is chewed and applied to wounds inflicted with iron, the application being removed at the end of four days. Symphidin causes sores to cicatrize with the greatest rapidity. The same too with cideritis, which is applied in combination with honey. The seed and leaves of verbascum, boiled in wine and pounded, are used for the extraction of all foreign substances adhering to the body, and a similar use is made of the leaves of mandagora mixed with polenta and roots of cyclaminos with honey. Leaves of trixago, bruised in oil, are used for ulcers of serpigneous nature more particularly, as also seaweed bruised with honey. Betony, with the addition of salt, is employed for the cure of carcinomatous sores and inveterate blisters on the neck. Chapter 89, Remedies for Warts and Applications for the Removal of Scars Argamonia with vinegar or root of batrachian removes warts, this last having the effect of also bringing off malformed nails. The juice or the leaves applied topically of either kind of linozostis remove warts. All the varieties of tithymalos are efficacious for the removal of every kind of wart, as also of hangnails and wens. Latinum imparts a fresh color and seemly appearance to scars. The traveler who carries Artemisia attached to his person, or Elalus Facus, will never be sensible of lassitude, it is said. Chapter 90 Remedies for Female Diseases one great remedy for all female diseases in common is the black seed of the herbaceous plant Paeonia, taken in hydromel. The root also is an effectual amenagogue. Seed of panaceas mixed with wormwood acts as an amenagogue and a sudorific. The same too with scordotus, taken internally or applied topically. Betony, in doses of one drachma to three scythe of wine, is taken for various affections of the uterus, as also directly after childbirth. Excessive menstruation is arrested by a pessary of Achille, or else a sitting bath composed of a decoction of that plant. 
Seed of henbane and wine is used as the liniment for diseases of the mammalia, and the root is employed in the form of a plaster for uterine affections. Caledonia, too, is applied to the mammalia. Roots of panaceas, applied as a pessary, bring away the afterbirth and the dead fetus, and the plant itself, taken in wine, are used as a pessary with honey, acts as a detergent upon the uterus. Polomonia, taken in wine, brings away the afterbirth. Used as a fumigation, it is good for suffocations of the uterus. Juice of the smaller centauri, taken in drink, or employed as a fermentation, acts as an emagogue. The root also of the larger centauri, similarly used, is good for pains in the uterus. Scraped and used as a pessary, it expels the dead fetus. For pains of the uterus, plantago is applied as a pessary in wool, and for hysterical suffocations, it is taken in drink. But it is dittany that is of the greatest efficacy in cases of this description. It acts as an amenagogue and is an expellent of the fetus when dead or lying transversely in the uterus. In these cases, the leaves of it are taken in doses of one obolus in water. Indeed, so active is it in its effects that ordinarily it is forbidden to be introduced into the chamber of a woman lying in. Not only is it thus efficacious when taken in drink, but even when applied topically or used as a fumigation. Pseudodictamnum possesses pretty nearly the same virtues, but it acts as an amenagogue also. Boiled in doses of one denarius in unmixed wine. Aristolochia, however, is employed for a greater number of purposes. In combination with myrrh and pepper, either taken in drink or used as a pessary, it acts as a powerful amenagogue and brings away the dead fetus in the afterbirth. This plant, the smaller kind in particular, used either as a fomentation, fumigation, or pessary, acts as a preventative of procedence of the uterus. Hysterical suffocations and irregularities of the catamenia are treated with agaric, taken in doses of three oboli and one scythus of old wine. Vervain is used also in similar cases as a pessary with fresh hog's lard, or else antirhinum with rose oil and honey. Root of Thessalian nymphaea used as a pessary is curative of pains in the uterus. Taken in red wine, it arrests uterine discharges. Root of cyclaminos, on the other hand, taken in drink and employed as a pessary, acts as an amenagogue. A decoction of it, used as a sitting bath, cures affections of the bladder. Cisanthamos, taken in drink, brings away the afterbirth and is curative of diseases of the uterus. The upper part of the root Xiphian, taken in doses of one drachma in vinegar, promotes menstruation. A fumigation of burnt pucatinum has a soothing effect in cases of hysterical suffocation. Cilian, taken in the proportion of one drachma to three scythi of hydromel, is particularly good for promoting the lochial discharge. Seed of mandagora, taken in drink, acts as a detergent upon the uterus. The juice, employed in a pessary, promotes menstruation and expels the dead fetus. The seed of this plant, used with live sulfur, arrests menstruation when in excess, while batrachian, on the other hand, acts as an amenagogue. This last plant is either used as an article of food or is taken in drink. In a raw state, as already stated, it has a burning flavor. But when cooked, the taste of it is greatly improved by the addition of salt, oil, and cumin. Dacus, taken in drink, promotes the catamenia and is an expellent of the afterbirth in a very high degree. Latinum, used as a fumigation, acts as a corrective upon the uterus and is employed topically for pains and ulcerations of that organ. Scamony, taken in drink or used as a pessary, is an expellent of the dead fetus. Either kind of hypericon, used as a pessary, promotes menstruation, but for this purpose, it is crethmos. According to Hippocrates, that is the most efficacious, the seed or root of it being taken in wine. Of the outer coat brings away the afterbirth. This plant, taken in water, is good for hysterical suffocations. Root of Guranian also, which is particularly useful for the afterbirth and for inflation of the uterus. Hippurus, taken in drink or applied as a pessary, acts as a detergent upon the uterus. Polygonos, taken in drink, promotes menstruation, and the same with root of alchema. Leaves of plantago and agaric and hydromel have a similar effect. 
Artemisia, bruised and applied as a pessary, with oil, virus, figs, or myrrh, is curative of diseases of the uterus. The root, too, of this plant, taken in drink, is so strongly purgative as to expel the dead fetus even. A decoction of the branches, used as a sitting bath, promotes menstruation and brings away the afterbirth. The same, too, with the leaves, taken in doses of one drachma in drink. The leaves, if applied to the lower regions of the abdomen with barley meal, will prove equally efficacious. A coron is very useful for internal complaints of females, as also the two varieties of coniza and crethmos. Either kind of anthelus, taken in wine, is remarkably good for uterine affections, gripping pains in that organ and retardations of the afterbirth. Calithrix, applied as a fomentation, is curative of affections of the vagina. It removes scaly eruptions also of the head and, beaten up in oil, it stains the hair. Geranian, taken in white wine or hyposithus in red, arrests all uterine discharges. Hyssop modifies hysterical suffocations. Root of vervain, taken in water, is a most excellent remedy for all accidents incident to or consequent upon delivery. Some persons mix bruised cypress seed with pucatinum in red wine. Seed, too, of psyllion, boiled in water and taken warm, has a soothing effect upon all defluxions of the uterus. Symphidin, bruised in wine, promotes menstruation. Juice of scordotus in the proportion of one drachma to four scythe of hydromel accelerates delivery. Leaves of dittany are given for the same purpose, in water, with remarkable success. It is a well-known fact, too, that these leaves, to the extent of a single obolus even, will bring away the fetus instantaneously, even when dead, without the slightest inconvenience to the patient. Pseudodictamnum is productive of a somewhat similar effect, but not in so marked a degree. Cyclaminos, too, attached as an amulet, sesanthemos, taken in drink, and powdered betony in hydromel. Chapter 91 Arsenogonin, one medical property. Thaligonin, one medical property. Arsenogonin and thaligonin are plants, both of them with clusters resembling the blossoms of the olive, but paler and a white sea like that of the poppy. By taking thaligonin in drink, they say, a conception of the female issue is ensured. Arsenogonin differs from it in the seed, which resembles that of the olive, but in no other respect. By taking this last plant and drink, male issue may be ensured, that is, if we choose to believe it. Some persons, however, assert that both plants resemble osimum, but that the seed of arsenogonon is double and resembles the testes in appearance. Chapter 92. Mastus. One Remedy. Isoam, which we have spoken of under the name of digitellus, is the great specific for diseases of the mammalia. The milk is increased by taking origeron in raisin wine, or else soncos boiled with spelt. The plant known as mastos, applied topically, removes the hairs from the mammalia, which make their appearance after childbirth. It has the effect also of dispersing scaly crusts upon the face and other cutaneous affections. Gentian also, Nymphaea heraclea employed in a liniment and root of cyclaminos, removes all blemishes of the skin. Seeds of cacalia, mixed with melted wax, plump out the skin of the face and make wrinkles disappear. Root of a coron also removes all spots upon the skin. Chapter 93. Applications for the Hair. Lysomachia ophrys. Lysomachia imparts a blonde tint to the hair, and the hypericon, otherwise called coricin, makes it black. The same too with ophrys. A plant with indentations, which resembles the cabbage, but has only two leaves. Polamonia, too, boiled in oil, imparts blackness to the hair. As for depilatories, I reckon them in the number of cosmetics, fit for women only, though men use them nowadays. For this purpose, Archizostis is looked upon as highly efficacious, as also the juice of tiffy mallows, applied with oil every now and then in the sun or after pulling out the hairs. Hyssop, applied with oil, heals itch scab and beasts, and cideritis is particularly useful for quinsy and swine. But let us now turn to the remaining plants of which we have to speak. Summary. Remedies, Narratives, and Observations, 1019. Roman authors quoted. 
M. Varro, C. Valgius, Pompeius Linnaeus, Sextius Niger, who wrote in Greek, Julius Bassus, who wrote in Greek, Antonius Castor, Cornelius Celsus. Foreign authors quoted Theophrastus, Democritus, Juba, Orpheus, Pythagoras, Mago, Menander, who wrote the Biocresta, Nicander, Homer, Hesiod, Musaeus, Sophocles, Xanthus, Anaxilus. Medical authors quoted Nesithius, Callimachus, Phanias the physician, Timaristus, Simus, Hippocrates, Chrysippus, Diocles, Ophelion, Heraclides, Hecesius, Dionysius, Apollodorus of Sidium, Apollodorus of Tarentum, Praxagoras, Plistonicus, Medius, Diuches, Cleophantus, Philistian, Asclepiades, Craduus, Petronius Diodotus, Aeolus, Aristristatus, Diagoras, Andreas, Nisides, Epicarmus, Damian, Tlopolemus, Metrodorus, Solo, Lycus, Olympias of Thebes, Philonus, Patricus, Micton, Glossius, Xenocrates. End of section 4. Section 5 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostock and henry thomas riley section five book twenty seven chapters one to twenty three chapter one one researches of the ancients upon this subject the further i proceed in this work the more i am impressed with admiration of the ancients and the greater the number of plants that remain to be described the more i am induced to venerate the zeal displayed by the men of former times in their researches and the kindly spirit manifested by them in transmitting to us the results thereof indeed their bounteousness in this respect would almost seem to have surpassed the munificent disposition even of nature herself if our knowledge of plants had depended solely upon man's spirit of discovery but as it is it is evident beyond all doubt that this knowledge has emanated from the gods themselves or at all events has been the result of divine inspiration even in those cases where man has been instrumental in communicating it to us in other words if we must confess the truth a marvel surpassed by nothing in our daily experience nature herself that common parent of all things has at once produced them and has discovered to us their properties wondrous indeed is it that a scythian plant should be brought from the shores of the palace meotis and the euphubia from mount atlas and the regions beyond the pillars of hercules localities where the operations of nature have reached their utmost limit that in another direction the plant britannica should be conveyed to us from isles of the ocean situate beyond the confines of the earth that the ethiopus should reach us from a climate scorched by the luminaries of heaven and then in addition to all this that there should be a perpetual interchange going on between all parts of the earth of production so instrumental to the welfare of mankind results all of them ensured to us by the peace that reigns under the majestic sway of the roman power a peace which brings in presence of each other not individuals only belonging to lands and nations far separate but mountains even and heights 
towering above the clouds their plants and their various productions that this great bounteousness of the gods may know no end is my prayer a bounteousness which seemed to have granted the roman sway as a second luminary for the benefit of mankind chapter two to aconite otherwise called the lefonin cameron par de Lyakis, or scorpio for remedies but who i say can sufficiently venerate the zeal and spirit of research displayed by the ancients it is they who have shown us that aconite is the most prompt of all poisons in its effects so much so indeed that female animals if the sexual parts are but touched with it will not survive a single day with this poison it was that m caecilius accused calpurnius bestia of killing his wives in their sleep and this it was that gave rise to that fearful peroration of his denouncing the murderous finger of the accused according to the fables of mythology this plant was originally produced from the foam of the dog cerberus when dragged by hercules from the infernal regions for which reason it is said it is still so remarkably abundant in the vicinity of heraclea in pontus a spot where the entrance is still pointed out to the shades below and yet noxious as it is the ancients have shown us how to employ aconite for the benefit of mankind and have taught us as the result of their experience that taken in mulled wine it neutralizes the venom of the scorpion indeed such is the nature of this deadly plant that it kills man unless it can find in man something else to kill when such is the case as though it had discovered in the body a fit rival to contend with that substance is the sole object of its attack finding another poison in the viscera to it alone it confines its onslaught and thus a truly marvellous thing two poisons each of them of a deadly nature destroy one another within the body and the man survives even more than this the ancients have handed down to us remedies employed by the animals themselves and have shown how that venomous creatures even effect their own cure by the contact of aconite the scorpion is struck with torpor is quite benumbed assumes a pallid hue and so confesses itself vanquished when this is the case white hellebore is its great auxiliary the very touch of it dispels its torpor and the aconite is forced to yield before two foes its own enemy and the common enemy of all now after this if any one should be of opinion that man could by any chance or possibility make such discoveries as these he must surely be guilty of ingratitude in thus appreciating the beneficence of the gods in countries frequented by the panther they rub meat with aconite and if one of those animals should but taste it its effects are fatal indeed were not these means adopted the country would soon be overrun by them it is for this reason too that some persons have given to hellebore the name of par de Leoncus. it has been well ascertained however that the panther instantaneously recovers if it can find the opportunity of eating human ordure so far as these animals are concerned who can entertain a doubt that it was chance only that first led them to this discovery and that as often as this happens the discovery is only a mere repetition of the accident there being neither reason nor an appreciation of experience to ensure its transmission among them three it is chance yes it is chance that is the deity who has made to us these numerous revelations for our practical benefit always understanding that under this name we mean nature that great parent and mistress of all things and this is evident whether we come to the conclusion that these wild beasts make the discovery from day to day or that they are gifted from the first with these powers of perception regarded in another point of view it really is a disgrace that all animated beings should have an exact knowledge of what is beneficial to them with the exception of man the ancients openly professing their belief that there is no evil without some admixture of good 
have asserted that aconite is a remarkably useful ingredient in the compositions for the eyes it may therefore be permitted me though i have hitherto omitted a description of the poisonous plants to point out the characteristics of aconite if only that it may be the more easily detected aconite has leaves like those of cyclaminus or of the cucumber never more than four in number slightly hairy and rising from near the root this root which is moderate size resembles the sea-fish known as the camaras a circumstance owing to which the plant has received the name of camon from some while others for the reason already mentioned have called it telephonon the root is slightly curved like a scorpion's tail for which reason some persons have given it the name of scorpio others again have preferred giving it the name of my oak tonin from the fact that the odour of it kills mice at a considerable distance even this plant is found growing upon the naked rocks known as acony and hence it is according to some authorities that it is called aconitum there being not so much as dust even about it to conduce to its nutriment such is the reason given for its name by some but according to others it receives this appellation from the fact that it fatally exercises the same effects upon the body that the whetstone does upon the edge of iron being no sooner employed than its effects are felt chapter three four ethiopus four remedies ethiopus is a plant with leaves resembling those of vlamus large numerous hairy and springing from the root the stem is square rough similar to that of arction in appearance and with numerous axillary concavities the seed resembles that of the fitch being white and twofold the roots are several in number long fleshy soft and of a viscous taste when dry they turn black and hard and might easily be taken for horns in addition to ethiopia this plant grows upon mount ida in troas and in messenia the roots are gathered in autumn and left to dry for some days in the sun to prevent them from turning mouldy taken in white wine they are curative of affections of the uterus and a decoction of them is administered for sciatica pleurisy and eruptions of the throat the kind however which comes from ethiopia is by far the best and gives instantaneous relief chapter four agariton four remedies agariton is a ferulaceous plant a couple of palms in height similar to origanum in appearance and bearing flowers like balls of gold used as a fumigation this plant acts as a diuretic and as a detergent upon the uterus when used in a sitting bath more particularly its name has been given to it from the circumstance that it keeps a very long time without fading chapter five the aloe twenty nine remedies the aloe bears a resemblance to the squill except that it is larger and has more substantial leaves with streaks running obliquely the stem is tender red in the middle and not unlike that of the anthericus it has a single root which runs straight downwards like a stake driven into the ground its smell is powerful and it has a bitter taste the most esteemed aloes are those imported from india but it grows in the asiatic provinces as well this last kind however is never used except that the leaves are applied fresh to wounds indeed these leaves as well as the juice are glutinous to a marvellous degree and it is for this property that it has grown in vessels of a conical form in the same way as the greater i zoom some persons make incisions in the stem to obtain the juice before the seed is ripe while others again make them in the leaves as well tear-like drops are also found adhering to it which exude spontaneously hence it is that some recommend that the place should be paved where it is grown to prevent this juice from being absorbed some authors have stated that there is found in judea beyond hiero solima a mineral alloy but that is it is inferior to the other kinds being of a darker colour and more humid than any of the rest aloes of the finest quality should be unctuous and shining of a red colour brittle compact like the substance of liver and easily liquefied that which is hard and black should be rejected the same too when it is mixed with sand or adulterated with gum and acacia a fraud which may be easily detected by the taste this plant is of an astringent 
nature binding and slightly calorific it is employed for numerous purposes but principally as a purgative it being almost the only one of all the medicaments which produce that effect that is at the same time a good stomachic and does not exercise the slightest noxious influence upon the stomach it is taken in doses of one drachma and in cases of derangement of the stomach it is administered two or three times a day in the proportion of one spoonful to two kayathi of warm or cold water at intervals according to the nature of the emergency as a purgative it is mostly taken in doses of three drachmae and it operates still more efficaciously if food is eaten directly afterwards used with astringent wine it prevents the hair from falling off the head being rubbed with it the contrary way of the hair in the sun applied to the temples and forehead with rose oil and vinegar or used as an infusion in a more diluted form it allays headache it is generally agreed that it is remedial for all diseases of the eyes but more particularly for prurigo and scaly eruptions of the eyelids as also for marks and bruises applied in combination with honey pontic honey in particular it is employed also for affections of the tonsillary glands and gums for all ulcerations of the mouth and for spitting of blood if not in excess the proper dose being one drachma taken in water or else vinegar used by itself or in combination with vinegar it arrests hemorrhage whether proceeding from wounds or from other causes in addition to these properties it is extremely efficacious for the cure of wounds producing cicatrization very rapidly it is sprinkled also upon the ulcerations of the male organs and is applied to condolomata and chaps of the fundament either in common wine raisin wine or by itself in a dry state according as a mollifying or restrictive treatment is required it has the effect also of gently arresting hemorrhoidal bleeding when in excess in cases of dysentery it is used as an injection where the digestion is imperfect it is taken shortly after the evening meal for jaundice it is administered in doses of three oboli in water as a purgative for the bowels it is taken in pills with boiled honey or turpentine it is good also for the removal of hangnails when employed in ophthalmic preparations it is first washed that the more gravelly portions of it may subside or else it is put over the fire in a pipkin and stirred with a feather from time to time that the whole of it may be equally warm chapter six alcea one remedy alcea is a plant with leaves resembling those of vervain known also as persterion some three or four stems covered with leaves a flower like that of the rose and white roots at most six in number a cubit in length and running obliquely it grows in a soil that is rich without being dry the root is given in wine or water for dysentery diarrhoea ruptures and convulsions chapter seven the alipon one remedy the alipon has a small stem with a soft head and is not unlike beet in appearance it has an acrid viscous taste extremely pungent and burning taken in hydromel with a little salt it acts as a purgative the smallest dose is two drachmae a moderate dose four and the largest six when used as a purgative it is taken in chicken broth chapter eight alcyne a plant used for the same purposes as helcyne five remedies alcyne a plant known as myosotin to some grows in the woods to which in fact it is indebted for its name of alcyne it begins to make its appearance at midwinter and withers in the middle of summer when it first puts forth the leaves bear a strong resemblance to the ears of mice we shall have occasion however to speak of another plant which may with much more justice be called myosotis as for alcyne it would be the same thing as helcyne were it not that it is smaller and not so hairy it grows in gardens and upon walls more particularly when rubbed it emits a smell like that of cucumber it is used for abscesses inflammations and all those purposes for which helcyne is employed its properties however are not so active it is applied topically also to defluxions of the eyes and to sores upon the generative organs and ulcerations with barley meal the juice is used as an injection for the ears chapter nine the androsauces six remedies the androsauces is a white plant bitter without leaves and bearing arms surmounted with follicules 
containing the sea it grows in the maritime parts of syria more particularly this plant is administered for dropsy in doses of two drachmae pounded or boiled in either water wine or vinegar it acts most powerfully as a diuretic it is used also for gout either taken internally or used as a liniment the seed is possessed of similar properties chapter ten androsemen or ascyrin six remedies androsemen or as some persons call it ascyrin is not unlike hypericon a plant of which we have spoken already the stems however are larger redder and lie more closely together the leaves are of a white colour and like those of rue in shape the seed resembles that of the black poppy and the upper branches when bruised emit a red juice the colour of blood these branches have also a resinous smell this plant grows in vineyards and it is usually in the middle of autumn that it is taken up and hung to dry used as a purgative it is bruised with the seed and taken in the morning or just after the evening meal in doses of two drachmae in hydromel wine or pure water the draught amounting to one sextarius in all it carries off bile and is particularly good for sciatica but in this last case caper root must be taken with resin the day after the dose being one drachma to be repeated every four days after being purged it is the practice for the patient if in robust health to take wine but if in a weak state of body water it is employed topically also for gout burns and wounds as it tends to arrest the flow of blood chapter eleven ambrosia botrys or artemisia three remedies ambrosia is a vague name which has fluctuated between various plants there is one however which has been more particularly designated by this appellation a branchy shrub-like plant with a thin stem some three palms in height the root of it is one-third shorter and the leaves towards the lower part of the stem resemble those of rue its diminutive branches bear a seed which hangs down in clusters and has a vinous smell hence it is that by some persons the plant is called botrys while to others it is known as artemisia the people of cappadocia use it for garlands it is employed in medicine as a resolvent chapter twelve the anonis or ononis five remedies the anonis by some called anonis in preference is a branchy plant and similar to fenugreek in appearance except that it is more shrub-like and more hairy it has an agreeable smell and becomes prickly after spring it is pickled in brine for eating applied fresh to ulcers it cauterizes the margins of them for the cure of toothache the root is boiled in oxycrate taken in drink with honey the root expels urinary calculi for epilepsy it is administered in oxymel boiled down to one half chapter thirteen the anagoras or acupon three remedies the anagoras known to some by the name of acupon is a shrub-like plant with an offensive smell and a blossom like that of the cabbage the seed grows in small horn-like pods of considerable length and resembles a kidney in shape it hardens about the time of harvest the leaves of this plant are applied to gatherings and are attached to the person in cases of difficult parturition care being taken to remove them the moment after delivery in cases where the extraction of the dead fetus is attended with difficulty or where the afterbirth or catamenia are retarded the leaves are taken in doses of one drachma in raisin wine the leaves are administered in the same manner for asthma they are prescribed also in old wine for injuries inflicted by the phalangium the root is employed medicinally as a resolvent and maturative the seed chewed acts as an emetic chapter fourteen the anonymous two remedies the anonymous through not having a name has at last found one it is brought from scythia and has been highly extolled by high cassius a physician of no small repute as also by aristogeiton bruised in water and applied it is remarkably useful for wounds and taken in drink it is good for blows upon the chest or mammalie as also for spitting of blood it has been thought too that it might be advantageously taken in a potion for wounds i am of opinion that the additional statement to the effect that burnt fresh it acts as a solder to iron or copper is wholly fabulous chapter fifteen five aperine omphalocarpus or phylanthropus three remedies 
upper rhine otherwise called omphalocarpus or phalanthropus is a ramose hairy plant with five or six leaves at regular intervals arranged circularly around the branches the seed is round hard concave and of a sweetish taste it grows in cornfields gardens and meadows and by the aid of its prickly points adheres to the clothes the seed is employed to neutralize the venom of serpents being taken in doses of one drachma in wine it is useful also for the bite of the phalangium the leaves applied topically arrest hemorrhage from wounds the juice is used as an injection for the ears chapter sixteen the arction or arcturum five remedies the arction is by some called arcturum in preference the leaves of it are like those of verbascum except that they are more hairy the stem is long and soft and the seed resembles that of cumin it grows in rocky localities and has a tender root white and sweet a decoction of it is made with wine for toothache being retained for that purpose in the mouth the plant is taken in drink for sciatica and strangury and is applied with wine to burns and chilblains which are fomented also with the root and seed bruised in wine chapter seventeen the asplanon or hemionion two remedies some persons call the asplanon by the name of hermionion it has numerous leaves a third of a foot in length and a slimy root pierced with holes like that of fern white and hairy it is destitute of stem flower and seed and is found growing upon rocks or sheltered damp walls the most approved kind is that of crete a decoction of the leaves in vinegar taken in drink for a period of thirty days will consume the spleen it is said the leaves being applied simultaneously the leaves give relief also in hiccup this plant should never be given to females being productive of sterility chapter eighteen the asclepius two remedies the asclepius has leaves like those of ivy long branches and numerous roots thin and odoriferous the flower has a strong offensive smell and the seed is like that of securidaca it is found growing in mountainous districts the roots are used for the cure of griping pains in the bowels and of stings inflicted by serpents either taken in drink or applied topically chapter nineteen the aster or bubanian three remedies the aster is called bubanian by some from the circumstance of its being a sovereign remedy for diseases of the groin it has a diminutive stem with oblong leaves two or three in number and at the summit it is surmounted with small radiated heads like stars this plant is taken also in drink as an antidote to the venom of serpents but if required for the cure of inguinal complaints it is recommended that it should be gathered with the left hand and attached to the body near the girdle it is of great service also worn as an amulet for sciatica chapter twenty ascyron and ascyroides three remedies ascyron and ascyroides are plants similar to one another and to hypericon as well except that the plant known as ascyroides has larger branches ferulaceous red all over and bearing small yellow heads the seed enclosed in small calices is diminutive black and resinous the tops of the branches when bruised stain like blood for which reason some persons have given it the name of androsemen the seed is used for the cure of sciatica being taken in doses of two drachmae in one sectarius of hydromel it relaxes the bowels and carries off bile it is applied also to burns chapter twenty one the alfaca three remedies the alfaca has remarkably diminutive leaves it is but little taller than the lentil the pods are of a larger size and enclose some three or four seeds of a darker colour moister and more diminutive than those of the lentil it grows in cultivated fields it is naturally more astringent than the lentil but in other respects is applied to much the same purposes the seed used in a decoction arrests fluxes of the stomach and bowels chapter twenty two alcibium one remedy i have not found it stated by authors what kind of plant alcibium is but the root i find and the leaves are pounded and employed both externally and internally for injuries inflicted by serpents when the leaves are used a handful of them is bruised in three kaiathi of undiluted wine the root is employed in the proportion of three drachmae to the same quantity of wine chapter twenty three alectoroslophus or christa two remedies alectoroslophus 
or crista as we call it has numerous leaves resembling a cock's comb a thin stem and a black seed enclosed in pods boiled with broken beans and honey it is useful for cough and for films upon the eyes the seed too is sprinkled whole into the eyes and so far is it from injuring them that it attracts and collects the filmy matter when thus used it changes colour and from black becomes white gradually swells and comes out of itself end of section five section six of the natural history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the natural history volume six by pliny the elder translated by john bostock and henry thomas riley section six book twenty seven chapters twenty four to fifty six chapter twenty four six alum also called symphiton patrion fourteen remedies the plant which we call alum and which is known to the greeks as symphiton petrian is similar to canilla bubula in appearance having a diminutive leaf and three or four branches springing from the root with tops like those of thyme it is a ligneous plant odoriferous of a sweet flavour and provocative of saliva the root of it is long and red it grows upon rocks to which circumstance it is indebted for its additional name of petrion and is extremely useful for affections of the sides and kidneys griping pains in the bowels diseases of the chest and lungs spitting of blood and eruptions of the fauces the root is pounded and taken in drink or else a decoction is made of it in wine sometimes also it is applied externally chewed it allays thirst and is particularly refreshing to the pulmonary organs it is employed topically for sprains and contusions and has a soothing effect upon the intestines cooked upon hot ashes with the follicules removed and then beaten up with nine peppercorns and taken in water it acts astringently upon the bowels for the cure of wounds it is remarkably efficacious being possessed of agglutinating properties to such a remarkable degree as to solder pieces of meat together with which it is boiled to which in fact it is indebted for its greek name it is used also for the cure of fractured bones chapter twenty five seven alga rufa or red seaweed one remedy red seaweed is useful as an application for the sting of the scorpion chapter twenty six actea one remedy actea has leaves with a powerful smell rough knotted stems a black seed like that of ivy and soft berries it grows in umbrageous rugged watery localities and is used in doses of one full acetabulum for female complaints chapter twenty seven the ampelus agria or wild vine four remedies ampelus agria or wild vine is the name of a plant with leaves of an ashy colour as already stated in our description of the cultivated plants and long tough twigs of a red hue like that of the flower which we have mentioned when speaking of violets under the name of flame of jove it bears a seed which resembles the grains of a pomegranate the root boiled in three kayathi of water with the addition of two kayathi of cohen wine is slightly laxative to the bowels and is consequently given for dropsy it is curative also of uterine affections and of spots upon the face and females it is found a good plant for patients afflicted with sciatica to use the juice of this plant bruised applied topically with the leaves chapter twenty eight absinthium or wormwood four varieties forty eight remedies there are numerous kinds of absinthium the santonic for instance so called from a city in gaul and the pontic which comes from pontus where the cattle are fattened upon it a diet which causes them to be destitute of gaul 
the pontic wormwood we may remark is of the finest quality superior to that of italy and much more bitter the pith however of the pontic wormwood is sweet as to its general utility a plant so commonly found and applied to such numerous uses people are universally agreed but with the romans more particularly it has been always held in the highest esteem from the fact of its being employed in their religious ceremonials thus for instance upon the latin festival it is the custom to have a race of four horsed chariots in the capital and for the conqueror to be presented with a draught of wormwood from the circumstance no doubt that our forefathers were of opinion that good health was the most valuable reward they could bestow upon his skill this plant is very strengthening to the stomach and hence it is that wines are flavoured with it as already stated a decoction of it in water is also taken the following being the method employed in preparing it six drachmae of the leaves are boiled with the branches and three sextarii of rain water and the preparation is then left to cool in the open air a day and a night salt too should be added to it when old it is utterly useless a dilution of wormwood steeped in water is also used such being the name given to this method of preparing it this dilution is made by leaving the vessel covered up for three days any kind of water being used pounded wormwood is but rarely employed and the same with the extracted juice of the seed in cases however where it is extracted the seed is subjected to pressure as soon as it begins to swell after which it is soaked for three days in water if used fresh and seven if dry it is then boiled in a copper vessel in the proportion of ten hamini to forty-five sextarii of water after which it is strained off and boiled gently to the consistency of honey in the same way as the juice is extracted from the smaller centauri the juice however of wormwood thus extracted is bad for the head and stomach whereas the decoction on the other hand is wholesome in the highest degree as it acts astringently upon the stomach carries off bile is a powerful diuretic has a soothing effect upon the bowels and assuages pains in the intestines with the addition of sile gallic nard and a little vinegar it dispels nausea and flatulency and expels intestinal worms it removes squamishness promotes the digestion and with the addition of rue pepper and salt disperses crudities of the stomach the ancients were in the habit of giving wormwood as a purgative the dose being six drachmae of the seed with three of salt and one cayanthus of honey in one sectarius of sea-water kept for some time this preparation however is rendered more efficacious by doubling the proportion of salt the seed too must be bruised with the greatest care as there is considerable difficulty in pounding it some authorities have prescribed the dose above mentioned to be given in polenta with the addition of pennyroyal while others recommend the leaves to be given to children in a dried fig to disguise their bitterness taken with iris wormwood acts as a detergent upon the thoracic organs for jaundice it is used raw with parsley or adiantum in cases of flatulency it is sipped every now and then warmed in water for liver complaints it is taken with gallic nard and for diseases of the spleen with vinegar pap or figs taken in vinegar it neutralizes the bad effects of fungi and of viscous in wine it is an antidote to the poison of hemlock and to the bite of the shrew mouse and is curative of wounds inflicted by the sea dragon and the scorpion it contributes also very greatly to the improvement of the sight and is used as an external application with raisin wine for deflections of the eyes and with honey for bruises the stream of decoction of wormwood is curative of affections of the ears and when they are attacked with running sores a liniment of wormwood bruised with honey is applied three or four sprigs of wormwood with one root of gallic nard taken in six kyathi of water act as a diuretic and as an amenagog indeed if taken with honey or employed as a passeri with wool it has a special virtue as, as an amenagog in combination with honey and nitre it is useful for quinsy and an infusion of it in water is good for epinitus a topical application is made of it for recent wounds provided always they have not been touched with water it is employed also for ulcers upon the head in combination with cyprian wax or figs 
it is highly recommended as a plaster for the iliac regions it is curative also of prurigo but it must never be administered in fevers taken in drink it is a preventive of sea-sickness and worn attached to the body beneath an apron it arrests inguinal swellings the smell of it induces sleep a similar effect being produced by placing it under the pillow unknown to the party kept among clothes it preserves them from worms and used as a liniment with oil or burnt as a fumigation it has the effect of driving away gnats writing ink mixed with an infusion of wormwood effectually protects the writings from the attacks of mice ashes of wormwood mixed with rose unguent stain the hair black chapter twenty nine absinthium marinum or seraphim there is a sea wormwood also known as the seraphim by some the most esteemed being that of taposiris in egypt those initiated in the mysteries of isis carry a branch of it in the hand it has a narrower leaf than the preceding plant and is not so bitter it is injurious to the stomach has a laxative effect upon the bowels and expels intestinal worms it is taken in drink with oil and salt or else an infusion of it is taken in a pottage made of meal of three-month wheat when employed as a decoction a handful is used to one sextarius of water the mixture being boiled down to one half chapter thirty eight the ballots melamprasian or black leek three remedies the greeks give to the balas the other name of melamprasian meaning black leek it is a branchy plant with black angular stems covered with hairy leaves larger and darker than those of the leek and possessed of a powerful smell the leaves bruised and applied with salt are highly efficacious for bites inflicted by dogs cooked upon hot ashes and applied in a cabbage leaf they are curative of conda lamata mixed with honey this plant acts as a detergent upon sordid ulcers chapter thirty one botrys ambrosia or artemisia one remedy botrys is a shrub-like plant which has small yellow branches with the seed growing all round them and leaves resembling those of endive it is found upon the banks of running streams and is used for the cure of hardness of breathing the people of cappadocia call this plant ambrosia others again artemisia chapter thirty two the brabola one remedy the brabola is possessed of astringent properties like those of the quince but beyond this authors give no particulars relative to it chapter thirty three byron maritimum five remedies c brian is plant no doubt with leaves like those of the lettuce of a wrinkled pursed appearance and destitute of stem the leaves arising from a single root it grows upon rocks more particularly and shells sunk in the sand it has desiccative and astringent qualities in a very high degree properties which render it useful for reducing all kinds of abscesses and inflammations those attendant upon gout in particular it is good also for all affections which stand in need of cooling applications chapter thirty four the boo pleuron one remedy i find it stated that the seed of boo pleuron is given for injuries inflicted by serpents and that the wound is fomented with a decoction of the plant in combination with leaves of the mulberry or of origanum chapter thirty five the catenance one observation upon it the cimos one observation upon it the catenance is a thessalian plant which it would be a mere loss of time to describe seeing that it is only used as an ingredient in filters in order however to expose the follies of the magical art it may not be out of place to remark that this plant has been selected for the above-named purpose from the fact that as it withers it gradually contracts and assumes the shape of the claws of a dead kite for a similar reason we shall give no description of the plant called cimos chapter thirty six the calyx three remedies of the calyx there are two kinds one of these resembles arum and is found growing in ploughed soils the proper time for gathering it being before it begins to wither it is employed for the same purposes as arum and an infusion of the root is taken as a purgative and as an amenagogue the stalks boiled with the leaves and some pulse are curative of tenismus chapter thirty seven the calyx known also as ancusa or anoclea two remedies the other kind of calyx is known by some persons as ancusa and by others as anoclea the leaves are like those of the lettuce but longer and with a downy surface 
the root is red and is employed topically in combination with fine polenta for the cure of erysipelas taken internally with white wine it is good for affections of the liver chapter thirty eight the circhia three remedies the circhia resembles the cultivated trichnon in appearance it has a small swarthy flower a diminutive seed like millet growing in small horn-shaped pods and a root half a foot in length generally triple or full-fold white odoriferous and hot in the mouth it is found growing upon rocks exposed to the sun an infusion of it is prepared with wine and administered for pains and affections of the uterus to make it three ounces of the pounded root should be steeped in three sextarii of wine a day and a night this potion is effectual also for bringing away the afterbirth the seed of this plant taken in wine or hydromel diminishes the milk in nursing women chapter thirty nine the Sirzian. one remedy the Sirzian is a plant consisting of a diminutive and delicate stem two cubits in height of a triangular form and covered with prickly leaves the prickles on the leaves are downy and the leaves themselves resemble those of buglosus in shape but are smaller and of a whitish colour at the summit of the plant there are small purple heads which fall off in the shape of down this plant or the root of it worn as an amulet it is said is curative of the pains attendant upon varicose veins chapter forty the cratiganon two kinds of it eight remedies the cratiganon is similar to an ear of corn in appearance it is formed of numerous shoots springing from a single root and full of joints it grows in umbrageous localities and has a seed like that of millet with a remarkably acrid taste if a man and woman before the evening meal take three oboli of this seed in three kaiathi of water for forty days consecutively before the conception of their issue it will be sure to be of the male sex they say there is another critiganon known also as philigonos and distinguished from the last mentioned plant by the mildness of the taste some persons assert that females if they take the blossom of this plant in drink will be sure to conceive before the end of forty days these plants used in combination with honey are curative of black ulcers of a chronic nature they also fill the concavities made by fistulous ulcers with new flesh and restore such parts of the body as are wasted by atrophy they act as a detergent upon purulent sores disperse inflammatory tumours and alleviate gout and all kind of abscess as those of the mammalae in particular under the name of crategus or crategon theophrastus speaks of the tree known in italy as the aquifolia chapter forty one the crocodilion two remedies the crocodilion resembles the black chameleon in shape the root is long of an uniform thickness and possessed of a pungent smell it is found growing in sandy soils taken in drink it causes a copious discharge of coagulated blood at the nostrils and in this way it is said diminishes the volume of the spleen chapter forty two the cynosorcus or orcus four remedies the cynosorcus by some called orcus has leaves like those of the olive soft three in number half a foot in length and lying upon the ground the root is bulbous oblong and divided into two portions the upper one hard and the lower one soft these roots are eaten boiled like bulbs and are mostly found growing in vineyards if males eat the upper part they will be parents of male issue they say and females if they eat the lower part of female in thessaly the men take the soft portion of goat's milk as an aphrodisiac and the hard part as an antiphrodisiac of these parts the one if actually neutralizes the action of the other chapter forty three the chrysolacanum two varieties of it three remedies coagulum terri two remedies the chrysolacanum grows in pine plantations and is similar to the lettuce in appearance it heals wounds of the sinews if applied without delay there is another kind of chrysolacanum mentioned with a golden flower and a leaf like that of the cabbage it is boiled and eaten as a laxative vegetable this plant worn as an amulet by a patient suffering from jaundice provided it be always kept in sight as a cure for that disease it is said i am not certain whether this is all that might be said about the chrysolacanum but at all events it is all that i have found respecting it for it is a very general fault on the part of our more recent herbalists to confine their account of plants to the mere name with a very meagre description of the peculiar features of the plant 
just as though forsooth they were universally known thus they tell us for instance that a plant known as coagulum terry acts astringently upon the bowels and that it dispels strangury taken in water or in wine chapter forty four the, the cucubalus strumus or strychnon six remedies the leaves of the cucubalus they tell us bruised with vinegar are curative of the stings of serpents and of scorpions some persons call this plant by the name of strumus while others give it the greek name of strychnon its berries are black the juice of these berries administered in doses of one chianthus and two chianthi of honeyed wine is curative of lumbago an infusion of them with rose oil is used for headache and they are employed as an application for scrofulous sores chapter forty five the conferva two remedies the conferva is peculiar to running streams those of the alpine regions more particularly receiving its name from conferumina to solder together properly speaking it is rather a fresh-water sponge than a moss or a plant being a dense porous mass of filaments i know an instance where a man who fell to the ground while lopping a tree of considerable height and broke nearly every bone of his body was cured by the agency of this plant the patient's body was covered all over with conferva the application being continually sprinkled with water the moment it began to dry and only removed for the purpose of changing it when the plant gave signs of losing its virtues he is hardly credible with that what rapidity he recovered chapter forty six nine the coccus canidus or grain of canidus two remedies the canidian grain has just the colour of the kermes berry it is larger than a peppercorn and has very heating properties hence it is that wit used it is taken in crumb of bread that it may not burn the throat in passing downwards it is a sovereign remedy for hemlock and arrests looseness of the bowels chapter forty seven the dipsacos two remedies the dipsacos has leaves like those of the lettuce with prickly tubercles on the middle of the back the stem of it two cubits in length is bristling all over with prickles of a similar nature the joints of the stem are closely covered with two leaves which form a concave axle in which a saltish dew-like liquid collects at the summit of the stem there are small heads covered with prickles it grows in watery localities this plant is used for the cure of chaps of the fundament and of fistula in which latter case the root is boiled down in wine to the consistency of wax to allow of its being introduced into the fistula in the form of a salve it is employed too for the cure of all kinds of warts as a liniment for which the juice collected in the axles as above mentioned is also used by some chapter forty eight the dryopterus two remedies the dryopterus which resembles fern in appearance is found growing upon trees the leaves are of a somewhat sweetish flavour and marked with slight indentations and the root is hairy this plant is possessed of caustic properties and hence the root is pounded and used as a depilatory in using it the skin is rubbed with it till perspiration is excited the operation being repeated a second and a third time care being taken not to remove the perspiration chapter forty nine the dryophanon the dryophanon is a similar plant with thin stems a cubit in length and surrounded on either side with leaves about as large as the thumb and like those of the oxa myrcene in appearance only whiter and softer the blossom is white and similar to that of the elder the shoots of it are eaten boiled and the seed is used as a substitute for pepper chapter fifty the elatine two remedies the elatine has leaves like those of, of the helxine diminutives round and hairy its branches are small half a foot in length five or six in number and covered with leaves from the root upwards it grows in cornfields and has a rough flavour hence it is found very useful for deflections of the eyes the leaves being beaten up and applied with polenta in a linen pledget a decoction of this plant with linseed taken in pottage is good for dysentery chapter fifty one m petros by our people called calcifraga four remedies m petros by the people of our country called calcifraga grows on mountains near the sea and is generally found upon rocks the nearer it grows to the sea the salter it is acting as an evacuant of bile and pituitous secretions that on the other hand which grows at a greater distance and more inland is of a more bitter flavour it carries off the aqueous humours of the body being taken for that purpose in broth of some kind or else hydromel when old it loses its strength but used fresh either boiled in water or pounded it acts as a diuretic 
and disperses urinary calculi authorities who wish full credence to be given to this asserted property assure us that pebbles boiled with it will split asunder chapter fifty two the epipactus or elaborine two remedies the epipactus called elaborine by some is a diminutive plant with small leaves taken in drink it is extremely useful for diseases of the liver and as an antidote to poisons chapter fifty three the epimedian three remedies the epimedian consists of a stem of moderate size with ten or twelve leaves like those of ivy it never flowers and has a thin black root with a powerful smell it grows in humid soils this plant also has certain astringent and cooling properties but females must be on their guard against it the leaves beaten up in wine prevent the bosom from growing too large in young girls chapter fifty four the enna eophyllin two remedies the enna philin has nine long leaves and is of a caustic nature it is employed topically but when used it is wrapped in wool to prevent it from cauterizing further than desirable for it blisters immediately for lumbago and sciatica it is of the greatest utility chapter fifty five two varieties of philix of fern known to the greeks as pteris or blacknen and as fella pteris or nymphi pteris eleven remedies of fern there are two varieties equally destitute of blossom and of seed the greeks give the name of pteris and sometimes blacknon to the kind in which numerous shoots take their rise from a single root exceeding two cubits even in length and with a not unpleasant smell this plant is thought to be the male fern the other kind is known to the greeks as the lipteris and sometimes nymphia pteris it has a single stem only with comparatively few branches is shorter softer and more tufted than the other and has channeled leaves growing near the root swine are fattened upon the roots of either kind the leaves of both kinds are arranged on either side in the form of wings whence the greek name pteris the roots are long run obliquely and are of a swarthy colour more particularly when dried when wanted for use they should be dried in the sun these plants are found growing everywhere but in cold soils more particularly they should be taken up to at the setting of the virgilii the root is only used at the end of three years neither before that period nor after they act as an expellent of intestinal worms for tapeworm honey is taken with them but in other cases sweet wine for three days they are both of them extremely detrimental to the stomach but are laxative to the bowels carrying off first the bile and then the aqueous humours of the body when used for tapeworm it is the best plan to take scamony with them in equal proportions for rheumatic deflections the root is taken in doses of two oboli in water after a day's abstinence from food a little honey being taken first neither kind must ever be given to females for in pregnancy they are productive of abortion and in other cases entail sterility powdered fern is sprinkled upon sordid ulcers as also upon the necks of beasts of burden when chafed fern leaves kill bugs and serpents will never harbour among them hence it is a good plan to strew them in places where the presence of those reptiles is suspected the very smell too of burnt fern will put serpents to flight medical men have made this distinction as to ferns that of macedonia they say is the best and that of cassiope the next chapter fifty six femur bobulum or ox thigh the name of femur bobulum is given to a plant which is good for the sinews applied fresh and beaten up with salt and vinegar End of section six section seven of the natural history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by maria james the natural history volume six by pliny the elder translated by john bostock and henry thomas riley section seven book twenty seven chapters fifty seven to ninety two chapter fifty seven galeopsis galeodolin or galen six remedies galeopsis or as some call it galeobdolin or gallion is a plant with a stem and leaves like those of the nettle only smaller and which when bruised emit a powerful smell the flower is purple and the plant is found growing everywhere about hedges and footpaths the leaves and stems bruised in vinegar and applied topically 
are curative of indurations, carcinomata, and scrofulous sores. They disperse also inflammatory tumors in posthumes of the parotid glands, and it is found a useful plan to foment the parts affected with a decoction of them. Applied with salt, this plant is curative of putrid ulcers and gangrenous sores. Chapter 58. The Glocks, One Remedy. The Glocks was known in ancient times as the Eugalatin. In the leaves, it resembles the cytisus and the lentil, only that they are whiter beneath. The branches, five or six in number, are extremely thin and, springing from the root, creep upon the ground with small purple blossoms upon them. This plant is found in localities near the sea. It is boiled in a pottage made of similago to increase the milk. Females, however, after taking it, must immediately use the bath. Chapter 59. Glossian. Three remedies. Diaglossia. Two remedies. Glossian grows in Syria and Parthia. It is a plant of stunted growth and thickly covered with leaves, like those of the poppy in appearance, only smaller and of a more repulsive aspect. It has an offensive smell and a bitter astringent taste. The seed, which is of a saffron color, is put into a vessel coated with potter's clay and heated in an oven. When taken out, a juice is extracted, which is known by the same name as the plant. This juice and the leaves, bruised, are used for defluxions of the eyes, which disappear in an instant under this treatment. An eye salve, too, is prepared from the juice known as diaglossia to medical men. The milk, when the secretion of it is stopped, is restored by the agency of this plant, for which purpose it is taken in water. Chapter 60. The Glycysid, Paeonia or Pentorobus, 20 Remedies. The Glycysid, by some called Paeonia, or Pentorobus, has a stem two cubits in length, accompanied by two or three others, and of a reddish color with a bark like that of the laurel. The leaves are similar to those of Isatus, but more unctuous, rounder, and more diminutive. The seed is enclosed in capsules, some being red and some black, there being two varieties of the plant, the female plant is generally thought to be the one to the root of which some six or eight bulbs are attached, of an elongated form, those of the male plant being more in number, as it throws out more roots than one, a palm in length, and of a white color. It has also an astringent taste. The leaves of the female plant smell like myrrh and lie closer together than those of the male. Both plants grow in the woods, and they should always be taken up at night, it is said, as it would be dangerous to do so in the daytime, the woodpecker of Mars being sure to attack the eyes of the person so engaged. It is stated also that the person, while taking up the root, runs great risk of being attacked with proceedings of the anus. All this, however, I take to be so much fiction, most frivolously invented to puff off their supposed marvelous properties. Both plants are used for various purposes. The red seed, taken in red wine, about fifteen in number, rest menstruation, while the black seed, taken in the same proportion, in either raisin nor other wine, are curative of diseases of the uterus. The root, taken in wine, allays all kinds of pains in the bowels, and acts as a purgative. It cures opisthotony also, jaundice, nephritic diseases, and afflictions of the bladder. Boiled in wine, it is used for diseases of the trachea and stomach, and acts astringently upon the bowels. It is eaten also by beasts of burden, but when wanted for remedial purposes for drachmae, are sufficient. The black seed is useful as a preventative of nightmare, being taken in wine in number above stated. It is very good, too, to eat this seed, 
and to apply it externally for gnawing pains of the stomach. Superations are also dispersed when recent with the black seed, and when of long standing with the red. Both kinds are very useful too for wounds inflicted by serpents, and in cases where children are troubled by calculi, being employed at the crisis when strangury first makes its appearance. Chapter 61. Nephalium, or Camazolum. Six Remedies. Nephalium is called Camazolum by some. Its white, soft leaves are used as flock, and indeed there is no perceptible difference. This plant is administered in astringent wine for dysentery. It arrests looseness of the bowels and the catamenia, and is used as an injection for tenesmus. It is employed topically for putrid sores. Chapter 62. The Galidraga. One Remedy. Xenocrates gives the name of Galidraga to a plant which resembles the Leucacanthus and grows in the marshes. It is a prickly plant with a tall, ferulaceous stem surmounted with a head somewhat similar to an egg in appearance. When this head is growing in summer, small worms, he says, are generated, which are put away in a box for keeping, and are attached as an amulet with bread to the arm on the side on which toothache is felt. Indeed, it is quite wonderful, he says, how soon the pain is removed. These worms, however, are of no use after the end of a year, or in cases where they have been allowed to touch the ground. Chapter 63. Hulcus or Aristus. Hulcus is a plant that grows in arid, stony spots. It has an ear at the end of a fine stem, and looks like barley that has put forth again when cut. Attached to the head or around the arm, it extracts spikes of corn adhering to the flesh, for which reason some persons give it the name of Aristus. Chapter 64. Hyoceros, One Remedy. Hyoceros resembles Andive in appearance, but is a smaller plant and rougher to the touch. Pounded and applied to wounds, it heals them with remarkable rapidity. Chapter 65. The Holostian, Three Remedies. The Holostian, so called by the Greeks by way of antiphrasis, in the same way that they give the name of sweet to the gall, is a plant destitute of all hardness, of such extreme fineness as to resemble hairs in appearance, four fingers in length, and very similar to hay grass. The leaves of it are narrow, and it has a rough flavor. It grows upon elevated spots composed of humus. Taken in wine, it is used for ruptures and convulsions. It has the property, also, of closing wounds. Indeed, if applied to pieces of meat, it will solder them together. Chapter 66. The Hippophaston, Right Remedies. The Hippophaston is one of those prickly plants which fullers use in their coppers. It has neither stem nor flower, but only diminutive empty heads, numerous leaves of a grass-green color and small soft white roots. From these roots, a juice is extracted in summer, which, taken in doses of three oboli, acts as a purgative, being used for this purpose in cases of epilepsy, fits of trembling, dropsy, vertigo, hardness of breathing, and incipient paralysis. Chapter 67, 11. The Hypoglossa, One Remedy. The hypoglossa is a plant with leaves like those of the wild myrtle, of a concave form, prickly, and presenting another small leaf within, resembling a tongue in shape. A wreath made of these leaves, placed upon the head, alleviates headache. Chapter 68. Hypocoon. Hypocoon is a plant found growing in cornfields, with leaves like those of rue. Its properties are similar to those of juice of poppies. Chapter 69. The Idea Herba, or Plant of Ida. Four Remedies. 
the Idean plant has leaves like those of the oxymersine, to which leaves a sort of tendril adheres that bears a flower. This plant arrests diarrhea, the catamenia, when in excess, and all kinds of hemorrhage. It is of an astringent and repercussive nature. Chapter 70 The Isopyron, or Phaseolin Two Remedies The Isopyron is called Phaseolin by some, from the circumstance that the leaf of it, which resembles that of anise, assumes a spiral form like the tendrils of the Phaseolus. At the summit of the stem, it bears small heads full of a seed like that of melanthium. These heads, taken with honey or hydromel, are good for cough and other affections of the chest. They are extremely useful also for liver complaints. Chapter 71 The Lathyrus Two Remedies The Lathyrus has numerous leaves like those of the lettuce, with numbers of small buds in which the seed is contained, enclosed in envelopes like that of the caper. When these buds are dry, the seeds, about the size of a peppercorn, are taken out. They are white, sweet, and easily cleansed from the husk. Twenty of them, taken in pure water or in hydromel, are curative of dropsy and carry off bile. Persons who require a stronger purgative take them with the husks on. They are apt, however, to be injurious to the stomach, for which reason a plan has been adopted of taking them with fish or else chicken broth. Chapter 72 The Leontoptalin or Pardalion Two Remedies The Leontoptalin is called Pardalion by some, it has a leaf like that of the cabbage, and a stem half a foot in length, with numerous lateral branches, and a seed at the extremities of them, enclosed in pods like those of the chickpea. The root resembles that of rape, and is large and black. It grows in plowlands. The root taken in wine neutralizes the venom of all kinds of serpents. Indeed, there is nothing known that is more speedily efficacious for that purpose. It is given also for sciatica. Chapter 73. The Lycopsis. Two Remedies. The Lycopsis has longer and thicker leaves than those of lettuce, and a long, hairy stem, with numerous offshoots, a cubit in length. The flower is diminutive and of a purple color. It grows in champagne localities. In combination with barley meal, it is used as an application for a rhizopelis. The juice of it, mixed with warm water, is employed as a sudorific in fevers. Chapter 74 The Lithospermum Exonychon Diospyron or Heraclios Two Remedies among all the plants, however, there is none of a more marvelous nature than the lithospermum, sometimes called exonychin, diospyron, or heraclios. It is about five inches in height, with leaves twice the size of those of rue, and small ligneous branches about the thickness of a rush. It bears close to the leaves a sort of fine beard or spike standing by itself, on the extremity of which there are small white stones as round as a pearl, about the size of a chickpea, and as hard as a pebble. These stones, at the part where they adhere to the stalk, have a small cavity and contain a seed within. This plant is found in Italy, no doubt, but that of Crete is the most esteemed. Among all the plants, there is none that I ever contemplated with greater admiration than this. So beauteous is the conformation, that it might be fancied that the hand of an artist had arranged a row of lustrous pearls alternately among the leaves. So exquisite, too, the nicety in thus making a stone to grow upon a plant. The authorities say that this is a creeping plant, and that it lies upon the ground, but for my own part, I have only seen it when plucked, and not when growing. 
it is well known that these small stones taken in doses of one drachma in white wine break and expel urinary calculi and are curative of strangury indeed there is no plant that so instantaneously proclaims at the mere sight of it the medicinal purposes for which it was originally intended the appearance of it too is such that it can be immediately recognized without the necessity of having recourse to any botanical authority chapter seventy five lapidus muscus or stone moss one remedy there grows near running streams a dry white moss upon ordinary stones one of these stones with the addition of human saliva is rubbed against another after which the first stone is used for touching impetigo the party so doing uttering these words cantharides be gone a wild wolf seeks your blood chapter seventy six the limium one remedy limium is the name given by the gauls to a plant in a preparation of which known to them as deer's poison they dip their arrows when hunting to three modi of salivating mixture they put as much of the plant as is used for poisoning a single arrow and a mess of it is passed down the throat in cases where oxen are suffering from the disease due care being taken to keep them fastened to the manger till they have been purged as they are generally rendered frantic by the dose in case perspiration supervenes they are drenched all over with cold water chapter seventy seven the loose mesolucon or lucus three remedies loose a plant resembling mercurialis has received its name from the circumstance that a white line runs through the middle of the leaf for which reason also some give it the name of mesolucon the juice of this plant is curative of fistula and the plant itself bruised is good for carcinomata it is probably the same plant as that called lucus so remarkably efficacious for the venom of all kinds of marine animals authors have not given a description of it beyond telling us that the wild lucus has larger leaves than the other and has properties more strongly developed they state also that the seed of the cultivated kind is the more acrid of the two chapter seventy eight the leucographus five remedies i have not found a description given by any writer of the leucographus a thing i am the more surprised at as they tell us that it is good for the cure of spitting of blood taken in doses of three oboli with saffron as also that it is useful for celiac affections applied beaten up in water and in cases of excessive menstruation they state also that it enters into the composition of ophthalmic preparations and that it fills up ulcers on the more tender parts of the body with new flesh chapter seventy nine twelve the median three remedies the median has leaves like those of the cultivated cirrus a stem three feet in length and a large round purple flower at its extremity the seed is diminutive and the root half a foot in length it grows upon umbrageous sheltered rocks the root taken in doses of two drachma with honey arrests the catamania the electuary being used for some days the seed too is administered in wine for a similar purpose chapter eighty the myosota or myosotis three remedies the myosota or myosotis is a smooth plant throwing out from a single root numerous hollowed stems of a somewhat reddish color and bearing at the lower extremities swarthy narrow oblong leaves sharp on the back arranged in pairs at regular distances and springing from delicate branches attached with axials to the main stems the flowers blue and the root a finger in length 
is provided with numerous filaments-like hairs. This plant possesses certain septic and ulcerating properties and hence is used for the cure of fistula of the eye. The Egyptians say that if upon the morning of the 28th day of their month Thoth, a day which generally falls in our month of August, a person rubs himself with the juice of this plant before speaking to anyone, he will be sure to have no diseases of the eyes all that year. Chapter 81 the Myagras, one remedy. The Myagras is a ferulaceous plant with leaves like those of matter. The seed is of an oily nature. Indeed, an oil is extracted from it. Ulcerations of the mouth are cured by rubbing them with the juice of this plant. Chapter 82. The Nema, one remedy. The plant called Nema bears three long leaves like those of Andive. Applied to scars, it restores the skin to its natural color. Chapter 83. The Natrix. One remedy. Natrix is the name of a plant, the root of which, when taken out of the ground, has just the rank smell of the he-goat. It is used in Picenum for the purpose of keeping away from females what, with a singular credulity, they call by the name of fatui. For my own part, however, I should think that persons requiring to be treated with such medicaments as these must be laboring under a sort of mental hallucination. Chapter 84. Odontitis. One remedy. Odontitis is a sort of hay grass which throws out from a single root numerous small jointed stems of a triangular form and of a swarthy hue. At the joints there are small leaves, somewhat longer than those of the polygonus, and in the axils formed by these leaves is the seed, similar to barley in appearance. It has a purple diminutive flower and is found growing in meadows. A handful of the stems, boiled in astringent wine, is used for the cure of toothache, the decoction being retained for some time in the mouth. Chapter 85. The Athana one remedy. The Athana is a Syrian plant, resembling rocket in appearance. Its leaves are pierced with numerous holes, and its flower resembles that of saffron, for which reason some persons have given it the name of anemone. The juice of this plant is employed in ophthalmic preparations. It is slightly pungent, of a warming nature, and astringent as it dries. It acts as a detergent upon cicatrizations, films on the eyes, and all impediments of the sight. Some say that the plant is washed and dried, and then divided into lozenges. Chapter 86. The Anosma. One property. The Anosma has leaves some four fingers in length, lying upon the ground, and indented, like those of the Anchusa. It has neither stem, blossom, nor seed. A pregnant woman, they say, if she eats of this plant, or even walks over it, will be sure to miscarry. Chapter 87. The Anoporin, Five Remedies. The Anoporin, it is said, has strongly carminative effects upon asses when they eat of it. It acts as a diuretic and as an amenagogue, arrests diarrhea, and disperses abscesses and separations. Chapter 88. The Osiris. Four Remedies. The Osiris bears small, swarthy, flexible branches covered with dark leaves like those of flax. The seed, which grows upon the branches, is black at first, but afterwards changes its color and turns red. Cosmetics for females are prepared from these branches. A decoction of the roots taken in drink is curative of jaundice. The roots, cut in pieces before the seed ripens and dried in the sun, act astringently upon the bowels. Gathered after the seed has ripened and boiled in pottage, they are curative of defluxions of the abdomen. They are taken also by themselves, bruised in rainwater. Chapter 89. The Oxys. Two Remedies. The Oxys is a plant with three leaves. It is given for derangement of the stomach, and patients eat it who are suffering from intestinal hernia. 
Chapter 90, The Polyanthemum or Batrachion, Three Remedies. The polyanthemum, by some persons called Batrachion, by virtue of its caustic properties, has an excoriating effect upon scars and restores the skin to its proper color. It heals white morphew also. Chapter 91, The Polygonus, Polygonatos, Tuthalus, Carcinethron, Clima, or Myrtopetalos, otherwise known as Sanguinaria or Orios, four varieties of it, forty remedies. The Greeks give the name of Polygonus to the plant known to us as Sanguinaria. It is but little elevated above the ground, has leaves like those of rue, and resembles grass in appearance. The juice of it, injected into the nostrils, arrests hemorrhage. Taken with wine, it has a similar effect upon bleeding at any other part of the body, as also spitting of blood. Those who distinguish several kinds of polygonus make this to be the male plant, and say that it is so called from the large number of seeds, or else from its numerous branches. Some call it polygonatos, from the number of its joints, others again tuthalus, and others carcinethron, clima, or myrtopetalos. There are some authorities to be found, however, who say that this is the female plant, and that the male is more diminutive, less swarthy, and more jointed, with a seed protruding beneath all the leaves. However this may be, these plants are of an astringent, cooling nature. The seed is laxative, and, taken in large doses, acts as a diuretic, and arrests defluxions. Indeed, if there is no defluxion, it is of no use taking it. For burning heats of the stomach, the leaves are applied topically, and they are used in the form of a liniment for pains in the bladder, and for erysipelas. The juice is used as an injection for separations of the ears, and by itself for pains in the eyes. It is administered also in fevers, tertian and quartan fevers more particularly, in doses of two sciathi, just before the paroxysms come on, as also in cases of cholera, dysentery, and derangement of the stomach. There is a third kind which grows on the mountains, and is known as orias, similar to a delicate reed in appearance, and having but a single stem, with numerous joints running into one another. The leaves of it are similar to those of the pitch tree, and the root is never used. This variety, however, is not so efficacious as those already mentioned, and indeed is used exclusively for sciatica. A fourth kind is known as the wild polygonus, it is a shrub, almost a tree in fact, with a ligneous root, a red trunk like that of the cedar, and branches resembling those of spartum, a couple of palms in length, and with three or four dark-colored knotted joints. This kind also is of an astringent nature, and has a flavor like that of the quince. It is either boiled down in water to one-third, or else dried and powdered for sprinkling upon ulcerations of the mouth and excoriations. It is chewed also for affections of the gums. It arrests the progress of corrosive ulcers, and of all sores of a serpiginous nature, or which cicatrice with difficulty, and is particularly useful for ulcerations caused by snow. Herbalists employ it also for quinsy, and use it as a chaplet for headache. For defluxions of the eyes, they put it around the neck. In cases of tertian fever, some persons pull it up with the left hand and attach it as an amulet to the body. The same, too, in cases of hemorrhage. There is no plant that is more generally kept by them in a dry state than the polygonus. End of section 7. Section 8 
of the natural history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the natural history volume six by pliny the elder translated by john bostock and henry thomas riley section eight book twenty seven chapters ninety three to one hundred and twenty chapter ninety three the peplus sisi meconium or mecon aphrodes three remedies the peplus known by the various names of sisi meconium and mecon aphrodes is a shrub-like plant springing from a single diminutive root the leaves of it resemble those of rue but are a little larger the seed which lies beneath the leaves is round and smaller than that of the white poppy it is ordinarily gathered in vineyards at harvest time and is dried with the seed on receivers being placed beneath to catch it as it falls this seed taken in drink purges the bowels and carries off bile and pituitous secretions one acetabulum taken in three hemeni of hydromel is a middling dose it is sprinkled also upon meat and other articles of food as a laxative medicine chapter ninety four the periclimenos five remedies the periclimenos is also a shrub-like plant with two whitish soft leaves arranged at intervals at the extremity among the leaves is the seed hard and very difficult to pluck it grows in ploughed fields and hedges entwining around every object from which it can gain support the seed is dried in the shade pounded and divided into lozenges these lozenges are left to dissolve in three chiathi of white wine for a period of thirty days and are given for diseases of the spleen the volume of which is gradually diminished either by discharges of bloody urine or else by alvine evacuation the effects of the medicament being perceptible at the end of ten days the leaves boiled act as a diuretic and are useful for hardness of breathing taken in drink in manner above mentioned they facilitate delivery and bring away the afterbirth chapter ninety five polecanon one remedy we have already spoken of polecanon as growing in cornfields a plant which throws out a number of shoots from thin stems and has leaves like those of the chickpea the seed which is contained in pods of a curved shape like diminutive horns and three or four in number is similar to gith in appearance bitter and an excellent stomachic it is used as an ingredient in antidotes chapter ninety six polygala one remedy polygala is a palm in height with leaves like those of the lentil at the extremity of the stem it has an astringent taste taken in drink it increases the milk in nursing women chapter ninety seven poterion furnion or nurus four remedies poterion or as some call it furnion or nurus throws out numerous branches is shrivelled and prickly and covered with a thick down the leaves of it are small and round the branch is long soft thin and flexible and the blossom elongated and of a grass green colour the seed is never used but it has a pungent flavour and a powerful smell the plant is found growing upon moist watery elevations the roots are two or three in number some two cubits in length sinewy white and firm it is dug up in autumn and the stem yields a juice like gum when cut the root is said to be of wonderful efficacy as an application for the cure of wounds more particularly of the sinews even when severed a decoction of it is also taken with honey for relaxations of the sinews or for weakness or wounds of those parts chapter ninety eight the phalangitis phalangion or leucacantha four remedies the phalangitis is by some called phalangion and by others leucanthemum or as i find it written in some copies leucacantha its branches are diminutive never less than two in number and running in contrary directions the blossom is white and similar to the flower of the red lily the seed dark and broad 
resembling the half of a lentil but much thinner and the roots slender and of a grass-green colour the leaves blossoms or seed of this plant are employed for the cure of wounds inflicted by scorpions serpents and the phalangium and for the removal of griping pains in the bowels chapter ninety nine the phytuma one property as for the phytuma i think it is a mere loss of time to describe it it being only used as an ingredient in filters chapter one hundred the phalan one property the greeks give the name of phalan to a plant which grows among the rocks in mountainous spots the female plant is of more grass-green colour than the other with a thin stem a diminutive root and a round seed like that of the poppy this last kind ensures the conception of issue of the same sex while the male plant differing only in the seed which resembles the olive at its first appearance ensures the conception of male issue they are both taken in wine chapter one hundred and one the philandrion two remedies the philandrion grows in marshy spots and has a leaf like that of parsley the seed of it is taken in drink for calculi and affections of the bladder chapter one hundred and two the phalaris two remedies the phalaris has a long thin stem like a reed with a drooping flower at the extremity the seed is like that of sesame this plant too taken with milk and honey in wine or vinegar breaks urinary calculi and is curative of diseases of the bladder chapter one hundred and three the polyrizin five remedies the polyrizin has leaves like those of myrtle and numerous roots these roots are pounded and administered in wine for injuries inflicted by serpents they are useful also for cattle chapter one hundred and four the proserpinaca five remedies the proserpinaca a common plant enough is an excellent remedy for the sting of the scorpion powdered and mixed with brine and oil in which the mina has been preserved it is an excellent cure they say for quinsy it is also stated that however fatigued a person may be to the extent even of losing his voice he will be sure to be refreshed by putting this plant beneath his tongue and that if it is eaten a vomit will be the result productive of good effects chapter one hundred and five rachoma thirty six remedies rachoma is imported from the regions situate beyond pontus the root of it is similar to black costus but smaller and somewhat redder inodorous and of a hot astringent flavour when pounded it yields a colour like that of wine but inclining to saffron applied topically it reduces abscesses and inflammations and heals wounds used with raisin wine it allays deflections of the eyes with honey echimosis and with vinegar livid marks upon the skin reduced to powder it is sprinkled upon malignant ulcers and is given internally for spitting of blood in doses of one drachma in water for dysentery and chelyac affections if unattended with fever it is administered in wine but if there is fever in water it is pounded more easily when it has been steeped in water the night before a decoction of it is given in doses of two drachmae for ruptures convulsions contusions and falls with violence in cases of pains in the chest a little pepper and myrrh is added when the stomach is deranged it is taken in cold water and the same in cases of chronic cough purulent expectorations liver complaint affections of the spleen sciatica diseases of the kidneys asthma and hardness of breathing pounded and taken in doses of three oboli in raisin wine or used in the form of a decoction it cures irritations of the trachea applied with vinegar it acts as a detergent upon lichens it is taken in drink also for flatulency cold shiverings chilly fevers hiccup gripings of the bowels herpetic ulcerations oppressions of the head vertigo attended with melancholy lassitude accompanied with pain and convulsions chapter one hundred and six the recetta two remedies in the vicinity of ariminum there is a well-known plant called recetta it disperses abscesses and all kinds of inflammations those who employ it for these purposes add the following words recetta allay this disease knowest thou not knowest thou not what chick it is that has torn up these roots let it have nor head nor feet this formula is repeated thrice the party spitting on the ground each time chapter one hundred and seven the stichus 
free remedies the stekus grows only in the islands of that name it is an odoriferous plant which leaves like those of hyssop and of a bitter taste taken in drink it promotes menstruation and allays pains in the chest it forms an ingredient also in antidotes chapter one hundred and eight the solanum by the greeks called sterknon two remedial properties the solanum according to cornelius celsus is called strychnon by the greeks it is possessed of repercussive and refrigerative properties chapter one hundred and nine smyrnion thirty-two remedies sinon two remedies smyrnion has a stem like that of parsley but larger leaves and growing principally about the young shoots which are numerous from the midst of these shoots the leaves make their appearance unctuous and bending towards the ground this plant has a medicinal smell penetrating to a certain degree and agreeable the colour of it is a pale yellow and the stems bear rounded umbels like those of dill with a round black seed which dries at the beginning of summer the root also is odoriferous of an acrid pungent flavour soft and juicy black on the outer coat and pale within the smell of it partakes very much of the nature of that of myrrh to which in fact it owes its name it grows in localities of a stony nature or covered with hummus its medicinal properties are warming and resolvent the leaves and root are used as a diuretic and as an amenagogue the seed arrests diarrhoea and the root applied topically disperses abscesses and suppurations provided they are not inveterate and reduces indurated tumours it is useful also for injuries inflicted by the phalangium and by serpents taken in wine with the addition of cacris polyum or melissophalum the dose however must be taken a little at a time only for otherwise it acts as an emetic a reason for which it is sometimes administered with rue the seed or root is curative of cough hardness of breathing and diseases of the thoracic organs spleen kidneys and bladder the root too is used for ruptures and convulsions this plant facilitates delivery and brings away the afterbirth it is also given in combination with crethmas in wine for sciatica it acts as a sudorific and carminative for which reason it is used to disperse flatulency of the stomach it promotes also the cicatrization of wounds a juice is extracted from the root which is very useful for female complaints and for affections of the thoracic organs and viscera possessing as it does certain calorific digestive and detergent properties the seed in particular is given in drink for dropsy external applications being made of the juice and emollient poultices applied of the dried rind of the root it is used also as a seasoning for food boiled meat in particular with the addition of honeyed wine oil and garum sinon a plant with a flavour very like that of pepper promotes the digestion and is highly efficacious for pains in the stomach chapter one hundred and ten telephion four remedies telephion resembles purslane in the stem and leaves from the root of it there spring seven or eight small branches covered with thick fleshy leaves it grows in cultivated spots and among vines in particular it is used as an application for freckles being removed as soon as dry it is employed also for white morphew being applied some six hours each night or day and the treatment continued for about three months after removing it barley meal should be applied telephion is healing also for wounds and fistulas chapter one hundred and eleven trichomanes five remedies the trichomanes is a plant that resembles the andiantum except that it is more slender and of a darker colour the leaves of it which are similar to those of the lentil lie close together on opposite sides and have a bitter taste a decoction of this plant taken in white wine with the addition of wild cumin is curative of stranguary bruised and applied to the head it prevents the hair from falling off and where it has come off restores it pounded and applied with oil it effects the cure of allopathy the mere taste of it is provocative of sneezing chapter one hundred and twelve the philictrum one remedy the philictrum has leaves like those of coriander only somewhat more unctuous and a stem resembling that of the poppy it is found growing everywhere in champagne localities more particularly the leaves applied with honey heal ulcers chapter one hundred and thirteen philaspi and persicon nappi four remedies of philaspi there are two kinds the first of which has narrow leaves about a finger in length and breadth turned toward 
the ground and divided at the point it has a slender stem half a foot in length and not wholly destitute of branches the seed enclosed in a crescent-shaped capsule is similar to a lentil in shape except that it has a jagged appearance to which in fact it owes its name the flower is white and the plant is found near footpaths and in hedges the seed which has an acrid flavour carries off bile and pituitous secretions by vomit and by alvine evacuation the proper dose being one acetabulum it is used also for sciatica in the form of an injection this treatment being persevered in until it has induced a discharge of blood it acts also as an emmenagogue but is fatal to the fetus the other the last speed known by some as persicon nappy has broad leaves and large roots and is also very useful as an injection for sciatica both plants are very serviceable for inquinal complaints it being recommended that the person who gathers them should mention that he has taken them for diseases of the groin for abscesses of all kinds and for wounds and that he should pluck them with one hand only chapter one hundred and fourteen the trachinia one property what sort of plant the trachinia is the authorities do not state i think that the assurance given by democritus must be false for it would be nothing less than a prodigy for a plant attached as an amulet to consume the spleen in so short a time as three days chapter one hundred and fifteen the trigonus or tragion four remedies the trigonus or tragion grows nowhere but in the maritime districts of the isle of crete it resembles the juniper in the seed leaf and branches its milky juice which thickens in the form of a gum or its seed taken in drink expels pointed weapons from the flesh the plant too is pounded fresh and applied as a liniment with wine or dried and powdered with honey it increases the milk in nursing women and is a sovereign remedy for diseases of the mammillae chapter one hundred and sixteen the tragos or scorpion four remedies there is another plant also called tragos or scorpion by some half a foot in height branchy destitute of leaves and bearing diminutive red clusters with a seed like that of wheat but pointed at the extremity this too grows in maritime localities ten or twelve tops of the branches bruised and taken in wine are remedial in cases of keliac affections dysentery spitting of blood and excessive menstruation chapter one hundred and seventeen the tragopogon or come there is the tragopogon also by some called come a plant with a small stem leaves like those of saffron and elongated sweet root and a large swarthy calyx at the extremity of the stem it grows in rugged soils and is never used chapter one hundred and eighteen the ages of plants such then is all that i have hitherto been enabled to learn or discover worthy of mention relative to plants at the close of this subject it seems to me that it will not be out of place to remind the reader that the properties of plants vary according to their age it is elaterium as already stated that preserves its properties the longest of all the black chameleon retains its virtues forty years sanctuary not more than twelve pusidonum and aristolochia six in the wild vine one year that is to say if they are kept in the shade i would remark also that beyond those animals which breed within the plants there are none that attack the roots of any of those which have been mentioned by me with the exception indeed of the sphondyle a kind of creeping insect which infests them all chapter one hundred and nineteen how the greatest efficacy in plants may be ensured it is also an undoubted truth that the virtues and properties of all roots are more feebly developed when the fruit has been allowed to ripen and that it is the same with the seed when incisions have been previously made in the root for the extraction of the juice the efficacy too of all plants is impaired by making habitual use of them and these substances if employed daily lose equally their good or bad properties when required to be effectual all plants too have more powerful properties when grown in soils that are cold and exposed to the northeastern blasts or in dry localities chapter one hundred and twenty maladies peculiar to various nations there are certain differences also by no means inconsiderable in the predispositions of the various nations of the earth i have been informed for instance that the people of egypt arabia syria and calicia are subject to tapeworm and mawworm while those of thracia and phrygia on the other hand are totally exempt from them 
this however is less surprising than the fact that although attica and boeotia are adjoining territories the thebans are troubled with these inflictions while among the people of athens they are unknown considerations of this description lead me now to turn my attention to the nature of the animated beings themselves and the medicinal properties which are inborn in them the most assured remedies perhaps for all diseases for nature in fact that parent of all things has produced no animated being for the purpose solely of eating she has willed that it should be born to satisfy the wants of others and in its very vitals has implanted medicaments conducive to health while she has implanted them in mute and inanimate objects even she has equally willed that these the most invaluable aids of life should be also derived from the life of another a subject for contemplation marvellous in the highest degree summary remedies narratives and observations six hundred and two roman authors quoted caius walgius pompeius linnaeus sextius niger who wrote in greek julius bassus who wrote in greek antonius castor cornelius celsus foreign authors quoted theophrastus apollodorus democritus aristogeiton orpheus pythagoras mago menander who wrote the biocresta nicander medical authors quoted menesitheus timaristus simus hippocrates chrysippus diocles ophelion heraclides hycasius dionysius apollodorus of cydium apollodorus of tarentum praxagoras plystonicus medius diuches cleophantus philistion esculapiades cretuus protonius diodotus iolus erasistratus diagoras andreas eminacides epicarmus damian telepolemus metrodorus solo lycus olympius of thebes philinus patricus micton glaucius xenocrates end of section eight Section 9 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Olivia. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 9, Book 28, Chapters 1 to 7. Remedies Derived from Living Creatures Chapter 1. Introduction We should have now concluded our description of the various things that are produced between the heavens and the earth, and it would have only remained for us to speak of the substances that are dug out of the ground itself, did not our exposition of the remedies derived from plants and shrubs necessarily lead us into a digression upon the medicinal properties which have been discovered, to a still greater extent, in those living creatures themselves, which are thus indebted to other objects for the cure of their respective maladies. For ought we, after describing the plants, the forms of the various flowers, and so many objects rare and difficult to be found, ought we to pass in silence the resources which exist in man himself for the benefit of man, and the other remedies to be derived from the creatures that live among us? And this more particularly, seeing that life itself is nothing short of a punishment unless it is exempt from pains and maladies? Assuredly not, and even though I may incur the risk of being tedious, I shall exert all my energies on the subject, it being my fixed determination to pay less regard to what may be amusing than to what may prove practically useful to mankind. Nay, even more than this, my researches will extend to the usages of foreign countries and to the customs of barbarous nations, subjects upon which I shall have to appeal to the good faith of other authors, though at the same time I have made it my object to select no facts but such as are established by pretty nearly uniform testimony, and to pay more attention to scrupulous exactness than to copiousness of diction. It is highly necessary, however, to advertise the reader, 
that whereas I have already described the natures of the various animals, and the discoveries due to them respectively, for, in fact, they have been no less serviceable in former times in discovering remedies than they are at the present day in providing us with them. It is my present intention to confine myself to the remedial properties which are found in the animal world, a subject which has not been altogether lost sight of in the former portion of this work. These additional details, therefore, though of a different nature, must still be read in connection with those which precede. Chapter 2. Remedies Derived from Man We will begin then with man, and our first inquiries will be into the resources which he provides for himself, a subject replete with boundless difficulties at the very outset. Epileptic patients are in the habit of drinking the blood even of gladiators, draughts teeming with life, as it were, a thing that, when we see it done by the wild beasts even, upon the same arena, inspires us with horror at the spectacle. And yet these persons, forsooth, consider it a most effectual cure for their disease to quaff the warm, breathing blood from man himself, and as they apply their mouth to the wound, to draw forth his very life. And this, though it is regarded as an act of impiety to apply the human lips to the wound even of a wild beast. Others there are, again, who make the marrow of the leg bones and the brains of infants the objects of their research. Among the Greek writers, too, there are not a few who have enlarged upon the distinctive flavors of each one of the viscera and members of the human body, pursuing their researches to the very parings of the nails, as though, forsooth, it could possibly be accounted the pursuit of health for man to make himself a wild beast, and so deserve to contract disease from the very remedies he adopts for avoiding it. Most righteously by Hercules, if such attempts are all in vain, is he disappointed of his cure. To examine human entrails is deemed an act of impiety. What then must it be to devour them? Say, Ostendes, who it was who first devised these practices, for it is thee that I accuse, thou uprooter of all human laws, thou inventor of these monstrosities, devised, no doubt, with the view that mankind might not forget thy name. Who was it that first thought of devouring each member of the human body? By what conjectural motives was he induced? What can possibly have been the origin of such a system of medicine as this? Who was it that thus made the very poisons less baneful than the antidotes prescribed for them? Granted that barbarous and outlandish tribes first devised such practices, must the men of Greece, too, adopt these as arts of their own? We read, for instance, in the memoirs of Democritus, still extant, that for some diseases the skull of a malefactor is most efficacious, while for the treatment of others that of one who has been a friend or guest is required. Apollonius, again, informs us in his writings that the most effectual remedy for toothache is to scarify the gums with the tooth of a man who has died a violent death. And, according to Melitus, human gall is a cure for cataract. For epilepsy, Ardemon has prescribed water drawn from the spring in the night and drunk from the skull of a man who has been slain and whose body remains unburnt. From the skull, too, of a man who has been hanged, Antaeus made pills that were to be an antidote to the bite of a mad dog. Even more than this, man has resorted to similar remedies for the cure of four-footed beasts even. For tympanitis in oxen, for instance, the horns have been perforated and human bones inserted, and when swine have been found to be diseased, fine wheat has been given them which has lain for a night in the spot where a human being has been slain or burnt. Far from us, far too from our writings, be such prescriptions as these, it will be for us to describe remedies only, and not abominations. Cases, for instance, in which the milk of a nursing woman may have a curative effect, cases where the human spittle may be useful, or the contact of the human body, and other instances of a similar nature. We do not look upon life as so essentially desirable that it must be prolonged at any cost, be it what it may. And you, who are of that opinion, be assured, whoever you may be, that you will die none the less, even though you shall have lived in the midst of obscenities or abominations. Let each then reckon this as one great solace in his mind, 
that of the blessings which nature has bestowed upon man there is none greater than the death which comes at a seasonable hour and that the very best feature in connection with it is that every person has it in his own power to procure it for himself chapter three whether words are possessed of any healing effect in reference to the remedies derived from man there arises first of all one question of the greatest importance and always attended with the same uncertainty whether words charms and incantations are of any efficacy or not for if such is the case it will be only proper to ascribe this efficacy to man himself though the wisest of our fellow-men i should remark taken individually refuse to place the slightest faith in these opinions and yet in our everyday life we practically show each passing hour that we do entertain this belief though at the moment we are not sensible of it thus for instance it is a general belief that without a certain form of prayer it would be useless to immolate a victim and that with such an informality the gods would be consulted to little purpose and then besides there are different forms of address to the deities one form for entreating another form for averting their ire and another for commendation we see too how that our supreme magistrates use certain formula for their prayers and not a single word may be omitted or pronounced out of its place it is the duty of one person to precede the dignitary by reading the formula before him from a written ritual of another to keep watch upon every word and of a third to see that silence is not ominously broken while a musician in the meantime is performing on the flute to prevent any other words being heard indeed there are memorable instances recorded in our annals of cases where either the sacrifice has been interrupted or so blemished by imprecations or a mistake has been made in the utterance of the prayer the result has been that the lobe of the liver or the heart has disappeared in a moment or has been doubled while the victim stood before the altar there is still in existence a most remarkable testimony in the formula which the deci father and son pronounced on occasions when they devoted themselves there is also preserved the prayer uttered by the vestal tucha when upon being accused of incest she carried water in a sieve an event which took place in the year of the city 609 our own age even has seen a man and a woman buried alive in the ox market greeks by birth or else natives of some other country with which we were at war at the time the prayer used upon the occasion of this ceremonial and which is usually pronounced first by the master of the college of the quindesmaviri if read by a person most assuredly force him to admit the potency of formula when it is recollected that it has been proved to be effectual by the experience of eight hundred and thirty years at the present day too it is the general belief that our vestal virgins have the power by uttering a certain prayer to arrest the flight of runaway slaves and to rivet them to the spot provided they have not gone beyond the precincts of the city if then these opinions be once received as truth and if it be admitted that the gods do listen to certain prayers or are influenced by set forms of words we are bound to conclude in the affirmative upon the whole question our ancestors no doubt always entertained such a belief and have even assured us a thing by far the most difficult of all that it is possible by such means to bring down lightning from heaven as already mentioned on a more appropriate occasion chapter four that prodigies and portents may be confirmed or made of no effect lucius piso informs us in the first book of his annals that king tullus hostilius while attempting in accordance with the books of numa to summon jupiter from heaven by means of a sacrifice similar to that employed by him was struck by lightning in consequence of his omission to follow certain forms with due exactness many other authors too have attested that by the power of words a change has been effected in destinies and portents of the greatest importance while they were digging on the tarpeian hill for the foundations of a temple a human head was found upon which deputies were sent to olius callianus the most celebrated diviner of etruria he foreseeing the glory and success which attached to such a presage as this attempted by putting a question to them to transfer the benefit of it to his own nation first describing on the ground before him the outline of a temple with his staff is it so romans as you say said he here then must be the temple of jupiter all good and powerful it is here that we have found the head and the constant aversion by the annals is that the destiny of the roman empire would have been assuredly transferred to etruria had not the deputies forewarned by the son of the diviner 
made the answer, No, not here exactly, but at Rome, we say, the head was found. It is related also that the same was the case when a certain four-horse chariot, made of clay and intended for the roof of the same temple, had considerably increased while in the furnace, and that on this occasion, in a similar manner, the destinies of Rome were saved. Let these instances suffice then to show that the virtues of presages lie in our own hands, and that they are valuable in each instance according as they are received. In all events, it is a principle in the doctrine of the augurs that neither imprecations nor auspices of any kind have any effect upon those who, when entering upon an undertaking, declare that they will pay no attention whatever to them. A greater instance than which, of the indulgent disposition of the gods toward us, cannot be found. And then besides, in the laws themselves for the twelve tables, do we not read the following words? Whoever shall have enchanted the harvest, and, in another place, whosoever shall have used pernicious incantations. Various Floxius cites authors whom he deems worthy of credit, to show that on the occasion of a siege, it was the usage, the first thing of all, for the Roman priest to summon forth the tutelary divinity of that particular town, and to promise him the same rites, or even a more extended worship, at Rome. And at the present day even, this ritual still forms part of the discipline of our pontiffs. Hence it is, no doubt, that the name of the tutelary deity of Rome has been so strictly kept concealed, lest any of our enemies should act in a similar manner. There is no one, too, who does not dread being spellbound by means of evil imprecations, and hence the practice, after eating eggs or snails, of immediately breaking the shells or piercing them with the spoon. Hence, too, those love-sick imitations of enchantments which we find inscribed by Theocritus among the Greeks and by Catullus, and more recently Virgil, among our own writers. Many persons are fully persuaded that articles of pottery may be broken by a similar agency, and not a few are of the opinion even that serpents can counteract incantations, and that this is the only kind of intelligence they possess. So much so, in fact, that by the agency of the magic spells of the Marcy, they may be attracted to one spot, even when asleep in the middle of the night. Some people go so far, too, as to write certain words on the walls of houses, deprecatory of accident by fire. But it's not easy to say whether the outlandish and unpronounceable words that are thus employed, or the Latin expressions that are used at random, and which must appear ridiculous to our judgment, tend the most strongly to stagger our belief, seeing that the human imagination is always conceiving something of the infinite, something deserving of the notice of the divinity, or indeed, to speak more correctly, something that must command his intervention perforce. Homer tells us that Ulysses arrested the flow of blood from a wound in the thigh by repeating a charm, and Theophrastus says that sciatica may be cured by similar means. Cato has preserved a formula for the cure of sprains, and Marcus Varro for that of gout. The dictator Caesar, they say, having on one occasion accidentally had a fall from his chariot, was always in the habit, immediately upon taking his seat, of thrice repeating a certain formula, with the view of ensuring safety upon the journey, a thing that, to my knowledge, is done by many persons at the present day. Chapter 5. A Description of Various Usages. I would appeal, to, for the confirmation on this subject, to the intimate experience of each individual. Why, in fact, upon the first day of the new year, do we accost one another with prayers for good fortune, and, for luck's sake, wish each other a happy new year? Why, too, upon the occasion of public lustrations, do we select persons with lucky names to lead the victims? Why, to counteract fascinations, do we Romans observe a peculiar form of adoration in invoking the nemesis of the Greeks, whose statue, for this reason, has been placed in the capital at Rome, although the goddess herself possesses no Latin name? Why, when we make mention of the dead, do we protest that we have no wish to impeach their good name? Why is it that we entertain the belief that for every purpose odd numbers are the most effectual, a thing that is particularly observed with reference to the critical days in fevers? Why is it that, when gathering the earliest fruit, apples or pears, as the case may be, we make a point of saying, This fruit is old, may other fruit be sent to us that is new? Why is it that we salute a person when he sneezes, an observance which Tiberius Caesar, they say, the most unsociable of men, as we know, used to exact when riding in his chariot even. Some there are, too, who think it a point religiously to be observed, to mention the name as well of the person whom they salute. And then besides, it is a notion universally received, 
that absent persons have warning that others are speaking of them by the tingling of the ears. Attalus assures us that if a person, the moment he sees a scorpion, says, Duo, the reptile will stop short and forbear to sting. And now that I am speaking of the scorpion, I recall to mind that in Africa, no one ever undertakes any matter without prefacing with the word Africa, while in other countries, before an enterprise is commenced, it is the practice to adjure the gods that they will manifest their goodwill. In addition to this, it is very clear that there are some religious observances, unaccompanied by speech, which are considered to be productive of certain effects. Thus, when we are at table, for instance, it is the universal practice we see to take the ring off from the finger. Another person, again, will take some spittle from his mouth and place it with his finger behind the ear to propitiate and modify disquietude of mind. When we wish to signify applause, we have a proverb, even, which tells us we should press the thumbs. When paying out oration, we kiss the right hand and turn the whole body to the right, while the people of the Gallic provinces, on the contrary, turn to the left and believe they show more devoutness by doing so. To salute summer lightning with the clapping of the hands is a universal practice with all nations. If, when eating, we happen to make mention of a fire that has happened, we avert the inauspicious omen by pouring water beneath the table. To sweep the floor at the moment that a person is rising from table, or to remove the table or tray, as the case may be, while a guest is drinking, is looked upon as the most unfortunate presage. There is a treatise, written by Servius Sulpicius, a man of the highest rank, in which reasons are given why we should never leave the table we are eating at, for in his day it was not yet the practice to reckon more tables than guests at the entertainment. Where a person has sneezed, it is considered highly ominous for the dish or table to be brought back again, and not a taste thereof to be taken after doing so. The same, too, where a person at table eats nothing at all. These usages have been established by persons who entertained a belief that the gods are ever-present in all our affairs and at all hours, and who have, therefore, found the means of appeasing them by our vices, even. It has been remarked, too, that there is never a dead silence on a sudden among the guests at table, except when there is an even number present. When this happens, too, it is a sign that the good name and repute of every individual present is in peril. In former times, when food fell from the hand of a guest, it was the custom to return it by placing it on the table, and it was forbidden to blow upon it for the purpose of cleansing it. Auguries, too, have been derived from the words or thoughts of a person at the moment such an accident befalls him, and it is looked upon as one of the most dreadful of presages if this should happen to a pontiff while celebrating the feast of Dis. The proper expiation in such a case is to have the morsel replaced on the table and then burnt in honor of the lar. Medicines, it is said, will prove ineffectual if they happen to have been placed on the table before they are administered. It is religiously believed by many that it is ominous in a pecuniary point of view for a person to pare his nails without speaking on the market days at Rome or to begin at the forefinger in so doing. It is thought, too, to be a preventative of baldness and of headache to cut the hair on the seventeenth and twenty-ninth days of the moon. A rural law observed in most of the farms of Italy forbids women to twirl their distaffs or even to carry them uncovered while walking in the public roads, it being a thing so prejudicial to all hopes and anticipations, those of a good harvest in particular. It is not so long ago that Marcus Servilius Nonianus, the principal citizen at Rome, being apprehensive of ophthalmalia, had a paper with the two Greek letters, Rho and Alpha, written upon it, wrapped in linen and attached to his neck, before he would venture to name the malady, and before any other person had spoken to him about it. Mucianus, too, who was thrice consul, following a similar observance, carried about him a living fly, wrapped in a piece of white linen, and it was strongly asserted by both of them that to the use of these expedients they owed their preservation from ophthalmalia. There are in existence also certain charms against hailstorms, diseases of various kinds, and burns, some of which have been proved, by actual experience, to be effectual. But so great is the diversity of opinion upon them that I am precluded by a feeling of extreme diffidence from entering into further particulars, and must therefore leave each to form his own conclusions, as he may feel inclined. Chapter 6. 226 Observations on Remedies Derived from Man, 8 Remedies Derived from Children. We have already, when speaking of the singular peculiarities of various nations, made mention of certain men of monstrous nature, whose gaze is endowed with powers of fascination, 
and we have also described properties belonging to numerous animals, which it would be superfluous here to repeat. In some men, the whole of the body is endowed with remarkable properties, as in those families, for instance, which are a terror to serpents, it being in their power to cure persons when stung, either by the touch or by a slight suction of the wound. To this class belong the Sile, the Marsi, and the people called Aphogenes in the Isle of Cyprus. One Euagon, a member of this family, while attending upon a deputation at Rome, was thrown by way of experiment, by order of the consuls, into a large vessel filled with serpents, upon which, to the astonishment of all, they licked his body all over with their tongues. One peculiarity of this family, if indeed it is still in existence, is the strong offensive smell which proceeds from their body in the spring. Their sweat, too, no less than their spittle, was possessed of remedial virtues. The people who are born at Tentyris, an island on the river Nilus, are so formidable to the crocodiles there that their voice, even, is sufficient to put them to flight. The presence, even, it is well known, of all these different races, will suffice for the cure of injuries inflicted by the animals to which they respectively have an antipathy, just in the same way that wounds are irritated by the approach of persons who have been stung by a serpent at some former time, or bitten by a dog. Such persons, too, by their presence, will cause the eggs upon which a hen is sitting to be addled, and will make pregnant cattle cast their young and miscarry. For, in fact, so much of the venom remains in their body, that from being poisoned themselves, they become poisonous to other creatures. The proper remedy in such a case is first to make them wash their hands, and then to sprinkle with water the patient who is under medical treatment. When, again, persons have been once stung by a scorpion, they will never afterwards be attacked by hornets, wasps, or bees, a fact at which a person will be the less surprised when he learns that a garment which has been worn at a funeral will never be touched by moths, that it is hardly possible to draw serpents from their holes except by using the left hand, and that, of the discoveries made by Pythagoras, one of the most unerring is the fact that in the name given to infants, an odd number of vowels is portentous of lameness, loss of eyesight, or similar accidents, on the right side of the body, and an even number of vowels of the like infirmities on the left. It is said that if a person takes a stone or other missile which has slain three living creatures, a man, a boar, and a bear, at three blows, and throws it over the roof of a house in which there is a pregnant woman, her delivery, however difficult, will be instantly accelerated thereby. In such a case, too, a successful result will be rendered all the more probable if a light infantry lance is used, which has been drawn from a man's body without touching the earth. Indeed, if it is brought into the house, it will be productive of a similar result. In the same way, too, we find it stated in the writings of Orpheus and Archelaus that arrows drawn from a human body without being allowed to touch the ground and placed beneath the bed will have all the effect of a filter, and, what is even more than this, that it is the cure for epilepsy if the patient eats the flesh of a wild beast killed with an iron weapon with which a human being has also been slain. Some individuals, too, are possessed of medicinal properties in certain parts of the body. The thumb of King Pyrrhus, for instance, as already mentioned. At Ellis, there used to be shown one of the ribs of Pelopes, which, it was generally asserted, was made of ivory. At the present day, even, there are many persons who, from religious motives, will never clip the hair growing on a mole on the face. Chapter 7. Properties of the Human Spittle But it is the fasting spittle of a human being that is, as already stated by us, the sovereign preservative against the poison of serpents, while, at the same time, our daily experience may recognize its efficacy and utility in many other respects. We are in the habit of spitting, for instance, as a preservative from epilepsy, or, in other words, we repel contagion thereby. In a similar manner, too, we repel fascinations and the evil presages attendant upon meeting a person who is lame in the right leg. We ask pardon of the gods by spitting in the lap or entertaining some too presumptuous hope or expectation. On the same principle, it is the practice in all cases where medicine is employed to spit three times on the ground and to conjure the malady as often the object being to aid the operation of the remedy employed. It is usual, too, to mark a boil when it first makes its appearance three times with fasting spittle. What we are going to say is marvelous, but it may easily be tested by experiment. If a person repents of a blow given to another, either by hand or with a missile, he has nothing to do but to spit at once into the palm of the hand which has inflicted the blow, 
and all feelings of resentment will be instantly alleviated in the person struck. This, too, is often verified in the case of a beast of burden when brought onto its haunches by blows, for upon this remedy being adopted, the animal will immediately step out and mend its pace. Some persons, however, before making an effort, spit into the hand in the matter above stated in order to make the blow more heavy. We may well believe, then, that lichens and leprous spots may be removed by a constant application of fasting spittle, that ophthalmalia may be cured by anointing, as it were, the eyes every morning with fasting spittle, that carcinomata may be effectually treated by kneading the root of the plant known as apple of the earth with human spittle, that crick in the neck may be got rid of by carrying fasting spittle to the right knee with the right hand and to the left knee with the left and that when an insect has gotten into the ear, it is quite sufficient to spit into that organ to make it come out. Among the counter-charms, too, are reckoned the practice of spitting into the urine the moment it is voided, of spitting into the shoe of the right foot before putting it on, and of spitting while a person is passing a place in which he has incurred any kind of peril. Marcion of Smyrna, who has written a work on the virtues of simples, informs us that the sea scolopendra will burst asunder if spit upon, and that the same is the case with bramble frogs and other kinds of frogs. Opilius says that serpents will do the same if a person spits into their open mouth, and Salpa tells us that when any part of the body is asleep, the numbness may be got rid of by the person spitting into his lap or touching the upper eyelid with his spittle. If we are ready to give faith to such statements as these, we must believe also in the efficacy of the following practices. Upon the entrance of a stranger, or when a person looks at an infant while asleep, it is usual for the nurse to spit three times upon the ground, and this, although infants are under the special guardianship of the god Fascinus, the protector not of infants only, but of generals as well, and a divinity whose worship is entrusted to the Vestal Virgins and forms a part of the Roman rites. It is the image of this divinity that is attached beneath the triumphant ear of the victorious general, protecting him, like some attendant physician, against the effects of envy, while at the same time, usually salutary, is the advice of the tongue which warns him to be wise in time, so that fortune may be prevailed upon by his prayers, not to follow, as the destroyer of his glory, close upon his back. End of section 9. Recording by Olivia. Section 10 of the Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 6 by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 10, Book 28, Chapters 8 to 23 chapter eight remedies derived from the wax of the human ear the human bite is also looked upon as one of the most dangerous of all the proper remedy for it is human ear wax a thing that we must not be surprised at seeing that if applied immediately it is a cure for the stings of scorpions even and serpents the best however for this purpose is that taken from the ears of the wounded person agnails too it is said may be cured in a similar manner a human tooth reduced to powder is a cure they say for the sting of a serpent chapter nine remedies derived from the human hair teeth etc the first hair it is said that is cut from an infant's head and in fact the hair of all persons that have not reached the age of puberty attached to the limbs will modify the attacks of gout a man's hair applied with vinegar is a cure for the bite of a dog and is used with oil or wine for wounds on the head it is said too if we choose to believe it that the hair of a man torn down from the cross is good for quartan fevers ashes too of burnt human hair are curative of carcinomata if a woman takes the first tooth that a child is shed provided it has not touched the ground and has it set in a bracelet and wears it constantly upon her arm it will preserve her from all pains in the uterus and adjacent parts if the great toe is tied fast to the one next to it it will reduce tumours in the groin and if the two middle fingers of the right hand 
are slightly bound together with a linen thread it will act as a preservative against catarrhs and ophthalmia a stone it is said that has been voided by a patient suffering from calculi if attached to the body above the pubes will alleviate the pains of others similarly afflicted as well as pains in the liver it will have the effect also of facilitating delivery granius adds however that for this last purpose the stone will be more efficacious if it has been extracted with the knife delivery when near at hand will be accelerated if the man by whom the woman has conceived unties his girdle and after tying it round her unties it adding at the same time this formula i have tied it and i will untie it and then taking his departure chapter ten remedies derived from the human blood the sexual congress etc the blood of the human body comes from what part it may is most efficacious according to orpheus and archelaus as an application for quinsy they say too that if it is applied to the mouth of a person who has fallen down in a fit of epilepsy he will come to himself immediately some say that for epilepsy the great toes should be pricked and the drops of blood that exude therefrom applied to the face or else that a virgin should touch the patient with her right thumb a circumstance that has led to the belief that persons suffering from epilepsy should eat the flesh of animals in a virgin state achinus of athens used to cure quinsy carcinoma and defections of the tonsillary glands and uvula with the ashes of burnt excrements a mendicament to which he gave the name of botryon there are many kinds of diseases which disappear entirely after the first sexual congress or in the case of females at the first appearance of menstruation indeed if such is not the case they are apt to become chronic epilepsy in particular even more than this a man it is said who has been stung by a serpent or scorpion experiences relief from the sexual congress but the woman on the other hand is sensible of detriment we are assured too that if persons when washing their feet touch the eyes three times with the water they will never be subject to ophthalmia or other diseases of the eyes chapter eleven remedies derived from the dead scrofula imposthumes of the parotid glands and throat diseases they say may be cured by the contact of the hand of a person who has been carried off by an early death indeed there are some who assert that any dead body will produce the same effect provided it is of the same sex as the patient and that the part affected is touched with the back of the left hand to bite off a piece from wood that has been struck by lightning the hands being held behind the back and then to apply it to the tooth is a sure remedy they say for toothache some persons recommend the tooth to be fumigated with the smoke of a burnt tooth which has belonged to another person of the same sex or else to attach to the person a dog tooth as it is called which has been extracted from a body before burial earth they say taken from out of a human skull acts as a depilatory to the eyelashes it is asserted also that any plant which may happen to have grown there if chewed will cause the teeth to come out and that if a circle is traced round an ulcer with a human bone it will be effectually prevented from spreading some persons again mix water in equal proportions from three different wells and after making a libation with part of it in a new earthen vessel administer the rest to patients suffering from tertian fever when the paroxysms come out so too in cases of quartan fever they take a fragment of a nail from a cross or else a piece of a halter that has been used for crucifixion and after wrapping it in wool attach it to the patient's neck taking care the moment he has recovered to conceal it in some hole to which the light of the sun cannot penetrate chapter twelve various reveries and devices of the magicians the following are some of the reveries of magic a whetstone upon which iron tools have been frequently sharpened if put without his being aware of it beneath the pillow of a person sinking under the effects of poison will make him give evidence and declare what poison has been administered and at what time and place though at the same time he will not disclose the author of the crime 
when a person has been struck by lightning if the body is turned upon the side which has sustained the injury he will instantly recover the power of speech that is quite certain for the cure of inguinal tumors some persons take the thrum of an old web and after tying seven or nine knots in it mentioning at each knot the name of some widow woman or other attach it to the part affected to assuage the pain of a wound they recommend the party to take a nail or any other substance that has been trodden under foot and to wear it attached to the body with the thrum of a web to get rid of warts some lie in a footpath with the face upwards when the moon is twenty days old at least and after fixing their gaze upon it extend their arms above the head and rub themselves with anything within their reach if a person is extracting a corn at the moment that a star shoots he will experience an immediate cure they say by pouring vinegar upon the hinges of a door a thick liniment is formed which applied to the forehead will alleviate headache in effect equally produced we are told by binding the temples with the halter with which a man has been hanged when a fishbone happens to stick in the throat it will go down immediately if the person plunges his feet into cold water but where the accident has happened with any other kind of bone the proper remedy is to apply to the head some fragments of bones taken from the same dish in cases where bread has stuck in the throat the best plan is to take some of the same bread and insert it in both ears chapter thirteen remedies derived from the human excretions in greece where everything is turned to account the owners of the gymnasia have introduced the very excretions even of the human body among the most efficient remedies so much so indeed that the scrapings from the bodies of the athletes are looked upon as possessed of certain properties of an emollient calorific resolvent and expletive nature resulting from the compound of human sweat and oil these scrapings are used in the form of a pessary for inflammations and contractions of the uterus similarly employed they act as an emmenagog and are useful for reducing condylomata and inflammations of the rectum as also for assuaging pains in the sinews sprains and nodicities of the joints the scrapings obtained from the baths are still more efficacious for these purposes and hence it is that they form an ingredient in maturative preparations such scrapings are as are impregnated with wrestler's oil used in combination with mud have a mollifying effect upon the joints and are more particularly efficacious as a calorific and resolvent but in other respects their properties are not so strongly developed the shameless and disgusting researches that have been made will quite transcend all belief when we find authors of the very highest repute proclaiming aloud that the male seminal fluid is a sovereign remedy for the sting of the scorpion in the case too of women afflicted with sterility they recommend the application of a pessary made of the first excrement that is voided by an infant at the moment of its birth the name they give it is meconium they have even gone so far too as to scrape the very filth from off the walls of the gymnasia and to assert that this is also possessed of certain calorific properties these scrapings are used as a resolvent for inflamed tumours and are applied topically to ulcers upon aged people and children and to excoriations and burns chapter fourteen remedies depending upon the human will it would be the less becoming then for me to omit all mention of the remedies which depend upon the human will total abstinence from food or drink or from wine only from flesh or from the use of the bath in cases where the health requires any of these expedients is looked upon as one of the most effectual modes of treating diseases to this class of remedies must be added bodily exercise exertion of the voice anointings and frictions according to a prescribed method for powerful friction it should be remembered has a binding effect upon the body while gentle friction on the other hand acts as a laxative so too repeated friction reduces the body while used in moderation it has a tendency to make flesh but the most beneficial practice of all is to take walking or carriage exercise this last being performed in various ways exercise on horseback is extremely good for affections of the stomach and hips a voyage for phthisis 
and a change of locality for diseases of long standing so too a cure may sometimes be effected by sleep by a recumbent position in bed or by the use of emetics in moderation to lie upon the back is beneficial to the sight to lie with the face downwards is good for a cough and to lie on the side is recommended for patients suffering from catarrh according to aristotle and fabianus it is towards spring and autumn that we are most apt to dream and they tell us that persons are most liable to do so when lying on the back but never when lying with the face downwards theophrastus assures us that the digestion is accelerated by lying on the right side while on the other hand it is retarded by lying with the face upwards the most powerful however of all remedies and one which is always at a person's own command is the sun violent friction too is useful by the agency of linen towels and body scrapers to pour warm water on the head before taking the vapour bath and cold water after it is looked upon as a most beneficial practice so too is the habit of taking cold water before food of drinking it every now and then while eating of taking it just before going to sleep and if practicable of waking every now and then and taking a draught it is worthy also of remark that there is no living creature but man that is fond of hot drinks a proof that they are contrary to nature it has been ascertained by experiment that it is a good plan to rinse the mouth with undiluted wine before going to sleep for the purpose of sweetening the breath to rinse the mouth with cold water an odd number of times every morning as a preservative against toothache and to wash the eyes with oxirate as a preventive of ophthalmia it has been remarked also that the general health is improved by a varying regimen subject to no fixed rules five hippocrates informs us that the viscera of persons who do not take the morning meal become prematurely aged and feeble but then he has pronounced this aphorism it must be remembered by way of suggesting a healthful regimen and not to promote gluttony for moderation in diet is after all the thing most conducive to health l lucullus gave charge to one of his slaves to overlook him in this respect and a thing that reflected the highest discredit on him when now an aged man and laden with triumphs he was feasting in the capital even his hand had to be removed from the dish to which he was about to help himself surely it was a disgrace for a man to be governed by his own slave more easily than by himself chapter fifteen six remedies derived from sneezing sneezing provoked by a feather relieves heaviness in the head it is said too that to touch the nostrils of a mule with the lips will arrest sneezing and hiccup for this last purpose varro recommends us to scratch the palm first of one hand and then of the other while many say that it is a good plan to shift the ring from off the left hand to the longest finger of the right and then to plunge the hands into hot water theophrastus says that aged persons sneeze with greater difficulty than others chapter sixteen remedies derived from the sexual congress democritus spoke in condemnation of the sexual congress as being merely an act through which one human being springs from another and really by hercules the more rarely it is used the better still however athletes we find when they become dull and heavy are re-established by it the voice too is restored by it when from being perfectly clear it is degenerated into hoarseness the congress of the sexes is a cure also for pains in the loins dimness of the eyesight alienation of the mental difficulties and melancholy chapter seventeen various other remedies to sit by a pregnant woman or by a person to whom any remedy is being administered with the fingers of one hand inserted between those of the other acts as a magic spell a discovery that was made it is said when alcmena was delivered of hercules if the fingers are thus joined clasping one or both knees or if the ham of one leg is first put upon the knee of the other and then changed about the omen is of still worse signification hence it is that in councils held by generals and persons in authority our ancestors forbade these postures as being an impediment to all business they have given a similar prohibition also with reference to sacrifices and the offering of public vows but as to the usage of uncovering the head in presence of the magistrates that has been enjoined varro says not as a mark of respect but with a view to health the head being strengthened by the practice of keeping it uncovered when anything is got into the eye it is a good plan to close the other and when water has got into the right ear 
the person should hop about on the left foot with the head reclining upon the right shoulder the reverse being done when the same has happened to the left ear if the secretion of the phlegm produces coughing the best way of stopping it is for another person to blow in the party's face when the uvula is relaxed another person should take the patient with his teeth by the crown and lift him from the ground well for pains in the neck the hams should be rubbed and for pains in the hams the neck if a person is seized in bed with cramp in the sinews of the legs or thighs he should set his feet upon the ground so too if he has cramp on the left side he should take hold of the great toe of the left foot with the right hand and if on the right angle the great toe of the right foot with the left hand for cold shiverings or for excessive bleeding at the nostrils the extremities of the body should be well rubbed with sheep's wool to arrest incontinence of urine the extremities of the generative organs should be tied with a thread of linen or papyrus and a binding passed round the middle of the thigh for derangement of the stomach it is a good plan to press the feet together or to plunge the hands into hot water in addition to all this in many cases it is found highly beneficial to speak but little thus for instance Messinus melissus we are told enjoined silence on himself for three years in consequence of spitting blood after a convulsive fit when a person is thrown from a carriage or when while mounting an elevation or line extended at full length he is menaced with any accident or if he receives a blow it is singularly beneficial to hold the breath a discovery for which we are indebted to an animal as already stated to thrust an iron nail into the spot where a person's head lay at the moment he was seized with a fit of epilepsy is said to have the effect of curing him of that disease for pains in the kidneys loins or bladder it is considered highly soothing to void the urine lying on the face at full length in a reclining bath it is quite surprising how much more speedily wounds will heal if they are bound up and tied with the hercules knot indeed it is said that if the girdle which we wear every day is tied with a knot of this description it will be productive of certain beneficial effects hercules having been the first to discover the fact demetrius in the treatise which he has compiled upon the number four alleges certain reasons why drink should never be taken in proportions of four chiathi or sextarii as a preventive of ophthalmia it is a good plan to rub the parts behind the ears and as a cure for watery eyes to rub the forehead as to the presages which are derived from man himself there is one to the effect that so long as a person is able to see himself reflected in the pupil of the patient's eye there need be no apprehension of a fatal termination to the malady chapter eighteen remedies derived from the urine the urine too has been the subject not only of numerous theories with authors but of various religious observances as well its properties being classified under several distinctive heads thus for instance the urine of eunuchs they say is highly beneficial as a promoter of fruitfulness in females but to turn to those remedies which we may be allowed to name without impropriety the urine of children who have not arrived at puberty is a sovereign remedy for the poisonous secretions of the asp known as the petias from the fact that it spits its venom into the eyes of human beings it is good too for the cure of albugo films and marks upon the eyes white specks upon the pupils and maladies of the eyelids in combination with meal of fitches it is used for the cure of burns and with a head of bulbed leek it is boiled down to one half in a new earthen vessel for the treatment of suppurations of the ears or the extermination of worms breeding in those organs the vapour too of this decoction acts as an amenagogue salpi recommends that the eyes should be fomented with it as a means of strengthening the sight and that it should be used as a liniment for sun scorches in combination with white of egg that of the ostrich being the most effectual the application being kept on for a couple of hours urine is also used for taking out ink spots male urine cures gout witness the fullers for instance who for this reason it is said are never troubled with that disease with stale urine some mix ashes of calcined oyster shells for the cure of eruptions on the bodies of infants and all kinds of running ulcers it is used too as a liniment for corrosive sores burns diseases of the rectum chaps upon the body and stings inflicted by scorpions 
the most celebrated midwives have pronounced that there is no lotion which removes itching sensations more effectually and with the addition of nitre they prescribe it for the cure of ulcers of the head parago and cancerous sores those of the generative organs in particular but the fact is and there is no impropriety in saying so that every person's own urine is the best for his own case do care being taken to apply it immediately and unmixed with anything else in such cases as the bite of a dog for instance or the quill of a hedgehog entering the flesh a sponge or some wool being the vehicle in which it is applied kneaded up with ashes it is good for the bite of a mad dog and for the cure of stings inflicted by serpents as to the bite of the scolopendra the effects of urine are said to be quite marvellous the person who has been injured has only to touch the crown of his head with a drop of his own urine and he will experience an instantaneous cure chapter nineteen indications of health derived from the urine certain indications of the health are furnished by the urine thus for example if it is white at first in the morning and afterwards high-coloured the first signifies that the digestion is going on the last that it is completed when the urine is red it is a bad sign but when it is swarthy it is the worst sign of all so too when it is thick or full of bubbles it is a bad sign and when a white sediment forms it is a symptom of pains in the region of the viscera or in the joints a green-coloured urine is indicative of disease of the viscera a pale urine of biliousness and a red urine of some distemper in the blood the urine is in a bad state too when certain objects form in it like bran or fine clouds in appearance a thin white urine also is in a diseased state but when it is thick and possessed of an offensive smell it is significant of approaching death so too when with children it is thin and watery the adepts in magic expressly forbid a person when about to make water to uncover the body in the face of the sun or moon or to sprinkle with his urine the shadow of any object whatsoever hesiod gives a precept recommending persons to make water against an object standing full before him that no divinity may be offended by their nakedness being uncovered osthenes maintains that every one who drops some urine upon his foot in the morning will be proof against all noxious medicaments chapter twenty seven forty one remedies derived from the female sex the remedies said to be derived from the bodies of females closely approach the marvellous nature of prodigies to say nothing of stillborn infants cut up limb by limb for the most abominable practices expiations made with the menstrual discharge and other devices which have been mentioned not only by midwives but by harlots even as well the smell of a woman's hair burnt will drive away serpents and hysterical suffocations it is said may be dispelled thereby the ashes of a woman's hair burnt in an earthen vessel or used in combination with litharge will cure eruptions and prurigo of the eyes used in combination with honey they will remove warts and ulcers upon infants with the addition of honey and frankincense they will heal wounds upon the head and fill up all concavities left by corrosive ulcers used with hog's lard they will cure inflammatory tumours and gout and applied topically to the part affected they will arrest erysipelas and hemorrhage and remove itching pimples on the body which resemble the stings of ants chapter twenty one remedies derived from woman's milk as to the uses to which woman's milk has been applied it is generally agreed that it is the sweetest and the most delicate of all and that it is the best of remedies for chronic fevers and chelic affections when the woman has just weaned her infant more particularly in cases too of sickness at stomach fevers and gnawing sensations as has been found by experience to be highly beneficial as also in combination with frankincense for abscesses of the mammillae when the eyes are bloodshot from the effects of a blow or affected with pain or defluxion it is a very good plan to inject woman's milk into them more particularly in combination with honey and juice of daffodil or else powdered frankincense in all cases however the milk of a woman who has been delivered of a male child is the most efficacious and still more so if she has had male twins provided always she abstains from wine and food of an acrid nature mixed with the white of an egg in a liquid state and applied to the forehead in wool it arrests defluxions of the eyes if a frog has spurted its secretions into the eye woman's milk is a most excellent remedy and for the bite of that reptile it is used both internally and externally 
it is asserted that if a person is rubbed at the same moment with the milk of both mother and daughter he will be proof for the rest of his life against all affections of the eyes mixed with a small quantity of oil woman's milk is a cure for diseases of the ears and if they are in pain from the effects of a blow it is applied warm with goose grease if the ears emit an offensive smell a thing that is mostly the case in diseases of long standing wool is introduced into those organs steeped in woman's milk and honey while symptoms of jaundice are still visible in the eyes woman's milk is injected in combination with elaterium taken as a drink it is productive of singularly good effects where the poison of the sea hare the buprestis or as aristotle tells us the plant dorycnium has been administered as a preventive also of the madness produced by taking henbane woman's milk also mixed with hemlock is recommended as a liniment for gout while some there are who employ it for the purpose in combination with wool grease or goose grease a form in which it is used as an application for pains in the uterus taken as a drink it arrests diarrhoea rabarius says and acts as an emenagog but where the woman has been delivered of a female child her milk is of use only for the cure of face diseases woman's milk is also a cure for affections of the lungs and mixed with the urine of a youth who has not arrived at puberty and added honey in the proportion of one spoonful of each it removes singing in the ears i find dogs which have once tasted the milk of a woman who has been delivered of a male child will never become mad they say chapter twenty two remedies derived from the spittle of females a woman's fasting spittle is generally considered highly efficacious for bloodshot eyes it is good also for deflections of those organs the inflamed corners of the eyes being moistened with it every now and then the result too is still more successful if the woman has abstained from food and wine the day before i find it stated that headache may be alleviated by tying a woman's fillet round the head chapter twenty three facts connected with the menstrual discharge over and above these particulars there is no limit to the marvellous powers attributed to females for in the first place hailstorms they say whirlwinds and lightning even will be scared away by a woman uncovering her body while her monthly courses are upon her the same too with all other kinds of tempestuous weather and out at sea a storm may be lulled by a woman uncovering her body merely even though not menstruating at the time as to the menstrual discharge itself a thing that in other respects as already stated on a more appropriate occasion is productive of the most monstrous effects there are some ravings about it of a most dreadful and unutterable nature of these particulars however i do not feel so much shocked at mentioning the following if the menstrual discharge coincides with an eclipse of the moon or sun the evils resulting from it are irremediable and no less so when it happens while the moon is in conjunction with the sun the congress with a woman at such a period being noxious and attended with fatal effects to the man at this period also the lustre of purple is tarnished by the touch of a woman so much more baneful is her influence at this time than at any other at any other time also if a woman strips herself naked while she is menstruating and walks round a field of wheat the caterpillars worms beetles and other vermin will fall from off the ears of corn metrodorus of skepsos tells us that the discovery was first made in cappadocia and that in consequence of such multitudes of catharides being found to breed there it is the practice for women to walk through the middle of the fields with their garments tucked up above the thighs in other places again it is the usage for women to go barefoot with the hair dishevelled and the girdle loose due precaution must be taken however that this is not done at sunrise for if so the crop will wither and dry up young vines too it is said are injured irremediably by the touch of a woman in this state and both rue and ivy plants possessed of highly medicinal virtues will die instantly upon being touched by her much as i have already stated on the virulent effects of this discharge i have to state in addition that bees for it is a well-known fact will forsake their hives if touched by a menstruous woman that linen boiling in the cauldron will turn black that the edge of a razor will become blunted and that copper vessels will contract a fetid smell and become covered with verdigris on coming in contact with her 
a mare big with foal if touched by a woman in this state will be sure to miscarry nay even more than this at the very sight of a woman though seen at a distance even she happened to be menstruating for the first time after the loss of her virginity or for the first time while in a state of virginity the bitumen that is found in judea will yield to nothing but the menstrual discharge its tenacity being overcome as already stated by the agency of a thread from a garment which has been brought in contact with this fluid fire itself even an element which triumphs over every other substance is unable to conquer this for if reduced to ashes and then sprinkled upon garments when about to be scoured it will change their purple tint and tarnish the brightness of the colours indeed so pernicious are its properties that women themselves the source from which it is derived are far from being proof against its effects a pregnant woman for instance if touched with it or indeed if she so much as steps over it will be liable to miscarry laius and elephantus have given statements quite at variance on the subject of abortives they mention the efficacy for the purpose of charcoal of cabbage root myrtle root or tamarisk root quenched in the menstrual discharge they say that she asses will be barren for as many years as they have eaten barley corns steeped in this fluid and they have enumerated various other monstrous and irreconcilable properties the one telling us for instance that fruitfulness may be ensured by the very same methods which according to the statement of the other are productive of barrenness to all which stories it is the best plan to refuse credit altogether Bithus of Durrechim informs us that a mirror which has been tarnished by the gaze of a menstruous female will recover its brightness if the same woman looks steadily upon the back of it he states also that all evil influences of this nature will be entirely neutralized if the woman carries the fish known as the sir mullet about her person on the other hand again many writers say that baneful as it is there are certain remedial properties in this fluid that it is a good plan for instance to use it as a topical application for gout and that women while menstruating can give relief by touching scrofulous sores and imposthumes of the parotid glands inflamed tumors erypsilis boils and defluxions of the eyes according to laius and salpi the bite of a mad dog as well as tertian or quartan fevers may be cured by putting some menstruous blood in the wool of a black ram and enclosing it in a silver bracelet and we learn from diotemus of thebes that the smallest portion will suffice of any kind of cloth that has been stained therewith a thread even if inserted and worn in a bracelet the midwife sotira informs us that the most efficient cure for tertian and quartan fevers is to rub the soles of the patient's feet therewith the result being still more successful if the operation is performed by the woman herself without the patient being aware of it she says too that this is an excellent method for reviving persons when attacked with epilepsy isotides the physician pledges his word that quartan fever may be cured by sexual intercourse provided the woman is just beginning to menstruate it is universally agreed too that when a person has been bitten by a dog and manifests a dread of water and of all kinds of drink it will be quite sufficient to put upon his cup a strip of cloth that has been dipped in this fluid the result being that the hydrophobia will immediately disappear this arises no doubt from that powerful sympathy which has been so much spoken of by the greeks and the existence of which is proved by the fact already mentioned that dogs become mad upon tasting this fluid it is a well-known fact too that the menstruous discharge reduced to ashes and applied with furnace soot and wax is a cure for ulcers upon all kinds of beasts of burden and that stains made upon a garment with it can only be removed by the agency of the urine of the same female equally certain it is too that this fluid reduced to ashes and mixed with oil of roses is very useful applied to the forehead for allaying headache in women more particularly as also that the nature of the discharge is most virulent in females whose virginity has been destroyed solely by the lapse of time another thing universally acknowledged and one which i am ready to believe with the greatest pleasure is the fact that if the door posts are only touched with the menstrual fluid all spells of the magicians will be neutralized a set of men the most lying in existence as any one may ascertain i will give an example of one of the most reasonable of their prescriptions take the parings of the toenails and fingernails of a sick person and mix them up with wax 
the party saying that he is seeking a remedy for a tertian quartan or quotidian fever as the case may be then stick this wax before sunrise upon the door of another person such is the prescription they give for these diseases what deceitful persons they must be if there is no truth in it and how highly criminal if they really do thus transfer diseases from one person to another some of them again whose practices are of a less guilty nature recommend that the parings of all the finger-nails should be thrown at the entrance of ant-holes the first ant to be taken which attempts to draw one into the hole this they say must be attached to the neck of the patient and he will experience a speedy cure End of section ten section seven of the natural history volume six this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by devin tatlow chapter twenty four section eight remedies derived from foreign animals the elephant eight remedies such then are the remedies from human beings which may with any degree of propriety be described and many of those only with the leave and good will of the reader the rest are of a most execrable and infamous nature such in fact as to make me hasten to close my description of the remedies derived from man we will therefore proceed to speak of the more remarkable animals and the effects produced by them the blood of the elephant the male in particular arrests all those defluxions known by the name of rheumatismi ivory shavings it is said in combination with attic honey are good for the removal of spots upon the face with the sawdust too of ivory hangnails are removed by the touch of an elephant's trunk headache is alleviated if the animal happens to sneeze at the time more particularly the right side of the trunk attached to the body with the red earth of lemnos acts powerfully as an aphrodisiac elephant's blood is good for consumption and the liver for epilepsy chapter twenty five ten remedies derived from the lion lion's fat mixed with the oil of roses protects the skin of the face from all kinds of spots and preserves the whiteness of the complexion it is remedial also for such parts of the body as have been frozen by snow and for swellings in the joints the frivolous lies of the magicians assert that persons who are anointed with lion's fat will more readily win favor with kings and peoples more particularly when the fat has been used that lies between the eyebrows of the animal a place in fact where there is no fat to be found the like effects they promise also from the possession of a lion's tooth one from the right side in particular as also the shaggy hairs that are found upon the lower jaw the gall used as an ointment in combination with water improves the eyesight and employed with the fat of the same animal is a cure for epilepsy but the slightest taste only must be taken of it and the patient must run immediately after swallowing it in order to digest it a lion's heart used as food is curative of quartan fevers and the fat taken with the oil of roses of quotidian fevers wild beasts will fly from persons anointed with lion's fat and it is thought to be a preservative even against treacherous practices chapter twenty six ten remedies derived from the camel a camel's brains dried and taken in vinegar are a cure they say for epilepsy the same too with the gall taken with honey which is a remedy also for quinsy a camel's tail dried it is said 
is productive of diarrhea, and ashes of burnt camel's dung mixed with oil make the hair curl. These ashes, applied topically, are very useful for dysentery, as also taken in drink, the proper dose being a pinch in three fingers at a time. They are curative also of epilepsy. Camel's urine, it is said, is very useful to fullers and is good for the cure of running sores. Barbarous nations, we are told, are in the habit of keeping it till it is five years old, and then taking it as a purgative in doses of one semi-sextarius. The hairs of the tail, it is said, plaited and attached to the left arm, are a cure for quartan fevers. Chapter 27 Seventy-nine remedies derived from the hyena. But of all animals, it is the hyena that has been held in the highest admiration by the magicians, who have gone so far as to attribute to it certain magical virtues even, and the power of alluring human beings and depriving them of their senses. Of its change of sex each year, and other monstrous peculiarities in its nature we have spoken already. We will now proceed to describe the medicinal virtues that are ascribed to it. The hyena, it is said, is particularly terrible to panthers, so much so indeed that they will not attempt to make the slightest resistance to it, and will never attack a man who has any portion of a hyena's skin about him. A thing truly marvellous to tell of, if the hides of these two animals are hung up facing one another, the hair will fall off of the panther's skin. When the hyena flies before the hunter, it turns off on the right, and letting the man get before it follows in his track, should it succeed in doing which the man is sure to lose his senses and fall from his horse even. But if, on the other hand, it turns to the left, it is a sign that the animal is losing strength, and that it will soon be taken. The easiest method, however, of taking it, they say, is for the hunter to tie his girdle with seven knots, and to make as many knots in the whip with which he guides his horse. In addition to all this, so full of quirks and subtleties are the vain conceits of the magicians that they recommend the hyena to be captured while the moon is passing through the sign of the Gemini, and every hair of it to be preserved if possible. They say, too, that the skin of the head is highly efficacious if attached to a person suffering from headache, that the gall applied to the forehead is curative of ophthalmia, and that if the gall is boiled down with three syaphi of attic honey and one ounce of saffron, it will be a most effectual preservative against that disease, the same preparation being equally good for the dispersion of films on the eyes and cataract. If, again, this preparation is kept till it is old, it will be all the better for improving the sight, due care being taken to preserve it in a box of Cyprian copper. They assert also that it is good for the cure of argima, eruptions and excrescences of the eyes, and marks upon those organs. For diseases of the crystalline humors of the eyes, it is recommended to anoint them with the gravy of hyena's liver roasted fresh incorporated with clarified honey. We learn also from the same sources that the teeth of the hyena are useful for the cure of toothache, the diseased tooth being either touched with them or the animal's teeth being arranged in their regular order and attached to the patient, that the shoulders of this animal are good for the cure of pains in the arms and shoulders, that the teeth extracted from the left side of the jaw and wrapped in the skin of a sheep or he-goat are an effectual cure for pains in the stomach, that the lights of an animal taken with food 
are good for celiac affections, that the lights reduced to ashes and applied with oil are also soothing to the stomach, that the marrow of the backbone used with old oil and gall is strengthening to the sinews, that the liver tasted thrice just before the paroxysms is good for quartan fevers, that the ashes of the vertebrae applied in hyena's skin with the tongue and right foot of a sea calf and a bull's gall, the whole boiled up together, are soothing for gout, that for the same disease, hyena's gall is advantageously employed in combination with stone of assos, that for the cold shiverings, spasms, sudden fits of starting, and palpitations of the heart, it is a good plan to eat some portion of a hyena's heart cooked, care being taken to reduce the rest to ashes, and to apply it with the brains of the animal to the part affected, that this last composition, or the gall applied alone, acts as a depilatory, the hairs being first plucked out, which are wanted not to grow again that by this method superfluous hairs of the eyelids may be removed, that the flesh of the loins, eaten and applied with oil, is a cure for pains in the loins, and that sterility in females may be removed by giving them the eye of this animal to eat, in combination with licorice and dill, conception within three days being warranted as the result. Persons afflicted with nightmare and dread of specters will experience relief, they say, by attaching one of the large teeth of the hyena to a, the body with a linen thread. In fits of delirium, too, it is recommended to fumigate the patient with the smoke of one of these teeth and to attach one in front of his chest with the fat of the kidneys or else the liver or skin. They assert also that a pregnant woman will never miscarry if she wears suspended from her neck the white flesh from a hyena's breast, with seven hairs and the genitals of a stag, the whole tied up in the skin of a gazelle. The genitals, they say, eaten with honey, act as a stimulant upon a person, according to the sex, and this even though it should be the case of a man who has manifested an aversion to all intercourse with females. Nay, even more than all this, we are assured that if the genitals and a certain joint of the vertebrae are preserved in a house with the hide adhering to them, they will ensure peace and concord between all members of the family. Hence, it is that this part is known as the joint of the spine or Atlantean knot. This joint, which is the first, is reckoned among the remedies for epilepsy. The fumes of the burnt fat of this animal will put serpents to flight, they say, and the jawbone, pounded with anise and taken with the food, is a cure for shivering fits. A fumigation made therewith has the effect of an amenagogue, and such are the frivolous and absurd conceits of the professors of the magic art, that they boldly assert that if a man attaches to his arm a tooth from the right side of the upper jaw, he will never miss any object he may happen to aim at with a dart. The palate, dried and warmed with Egyptian alum, is curative of bad odors and ulcers of the mouth. Care t being taken to renew the application three times. Dogs, they say, will never bark at persons who have a hyena's tongue in the shoe, beneath the sole of the foot. The left side of the brain, applied to the nostrils, is said to have a soothing effect upon all dangerous maladies, either in men or beasts. They say, too, that the skin of the forehead is a preservative against all fascinations, that the flesh of the neck, whether eaten or dried and taken in drink, is good for pains in the loins, 
that the sinews of the back and shoulders used as a fumigation are good for pains in the sinews, that the bristles of the snout applied to a woman's lips have all the effect of a filter, and that the liver administered in drink is curative of gripping pains and urinary calculi. The heart, it is said, taken with the food or drink, is remedial for all kinds of pains in the body. The milt for pains in the spleen, the call, in combination with oil for inflammatory ulcers, and the marrow for pains in the spine and weakness in the sinews. The strings of the kidneys, they say, if taken with wine and frankincense, will restore fruitfulness. In cases where it has been banished through the agency of noxious spells, the uterus, taken in drink with the rind of a sweet pomegranate, is highly beneficial for diseases of the uterus, and that the fat of the loins, used as a fumigation, removes all impediments to delivery and accelerates parturition. The marrow of the back, attached to the body as an amulet, is an effectual remedy for fantastic illusions, and the genitals of the male animal, used as a fumigation, are good for the cure of spasms. For ophthalmia, ruptures, and inflammations, the feet, which are kept for the purpose, are touched. The left feet, for affections on the right side of the body, and the right feet for affections on the left. The left foot, if laid upon the body of a woman in travail, will be productive, they say, of fatal effects. But the right foot, similarly employed, will facilitate delivery. The vesicle which has contained the gall, taken in wine or with food, is beneficial for cardiac disease, and the bladder, taken in wine, is a good preservative against incontinence of the urine. The urine, too, which is found in the bladder, taken with oil, sesame, and honey, is said to be useful for diseases of long standing. The first rib and the eighth, used as a fumigation, are said to be useful for ruptures. The vertebrae for women in travail and the blood, in combination with polenta, for griping pains in the bowels. If the doorposts are touched with this blood, the various arts of the magicians will be rendered of no effect. They will neither be able to summon the gods into their presence nor to converse with them, whatever the method to which they have recourse, whether lamps or basin, water or globe, or any other method. The flesh of the hyena, taken as food, is said to be efficacious for the bite of a mad dog, and the liver still more so. The flesh or bones of a human being, which have been found in the belly of a slain hyena, used as a fumigation, are said to be remedial for gout. But if among these remains the nails are found, it is looked upon as a presage of death to someone among those who have captured it. The excrements or bones which have been voided by the animal at the moment when killed are looked upon as counter charms to magic spells. The dung found in the intestines is dried and administered in drink for dysentery, and it is applied to all parts of the body with goose grease in the form of a liniment. In the case of persons who have received injury from some noxious medicament. By rubbing themselves with the grease and lying upon the skin of a hyena, persons who have been bitten by dogs are cured. On the other hand, the ashes of the left pastern bone, they say, boiled with weasel's blood and applied to a person's body will ensure universal hatred, a similar effect being equally produced by the eye when boiled.
But the most extraordinary thing of all is their assertion that the extremity of the rectum of this animal is a preservative against all oppression on the part of chiefs and potentates, and an assurance of success in all petitions, judgments, and lawsuits, and this if a person only carries it about him. The anus, according to them, has so powerful an effect as a filter that if it is worn on the left arm, a woman will be sure to follow the wearer the moment he looks at her. The hairs, too, of this part, reduced to ashes and applied with oil to the body of a man who is living a life of disgraceful effeminacy, will render him not only modest, they assure us, but of scrupulous morals even. Chapter 28. Nineteen Remedies Derived from the Crocodile For fabulous stories connected with it, the crocodile may challenge the next place, and indeed for cunning, the one which lives both upon land and in the water is fully its equal. For I here would remark that there are two varieties of this animal. The teeth of the right jaw of the amphibious crocodile, attached to the right arm as an amulet, acts as an aphrodisiac, that is, if we choose to believe it. The eye teeth of the animal, filled with frankincense, for they are hollow, are a cure for periodical fevers, care being taken to let the patient remain five days without seeing the person who has attached them to his body. A similar virtue is attributed to the small stones which are found in the belly of this animal, as being a check to the cold shiverings in fevers, when about to come on. And with the same object, the Egyptians are in the habit of anointing their sick with the fat of the crocodile. The other kind of crocodile resembles it, but is much inferior in size. It lives upon land only, and among the most odoriferous flowers. Hence it is that its intestines are so greatly in request, being filled as they are with a mass of agreeable perfumes. This substance is called crocodilea, and it is looked upon as an extremely beneficial for diseases of the eyes, and for the treatment of films and cataract being applied with leek juice in the form of an ointment. Applied with oil of cypress, it removes blemishes growing upon the face, and employed with water, it is a cure for all those diseases, the nature of which it is to spread upon the face, while at the same time it restores the natural tints of the skin. An application of it makes freckles disappear, as well as all kinds of spots and pimples, and it is taken for epilepsy in doses of two oboli in oxymel. Used in the form of a pessary, it acts as an eminagogue. The best kind of crocodiles is that which is the whitest, friable, and the lightest in weight. When rubbed between the fingers, it should ferment like leaven. The usual method is to wash it as they do white lead. It is sometimes adulterated with amylum or with simoleon earth, but the most common method of sophistication is to catch the crocodiles and feed them upon nothing but rice. It is recommended as one of the most efficient remedies for cataract to anoint the eyes with crocodiles' gall incorporated with honey. We are assured also that it is highly beneficial for affections of the uterus to make fumigations with the intestines and rest of the body, or else to envelop the patient with wool impregnated with the smoke. The ashes of the skin of either crocodile, applied with vinegar to such parts of the body as are about to undergo an incision, or indeed the very smell of the skin when burning, will render the patient insensible to the knife. 
The blood of either crocodile, applied to the eyes, effaces marks upon those organs and improves the sight. The body, with the exception of the head and feet, is eaten, boiled, for the cure of sciatica, and is found very useful for chronic coughs. In children, more particularly, it is equally good, too, for the cure of lumbago. These animals have a certain fat also, which, when applied to the hair, makes it fall off. Persons anointed with this fat are effectually protected against crocodiles, and it is the practice to drop it into the wounds inflicted by them. A crocodile's heart, attached to the body in the wool of a black sheep, without a speck of any other color, do care too being taken that the sheep was the first lamb yeaned by its dam, will effectually cure a courting fever, it is said. <laughs> Chapter 29. Fifteen Remedies Derived from the Chameleon. To these animals we shall annex some others that are equally foreign and very similar in their properties. To begin, then, with the chameleon, which Democritus has considered worthy to be made subject of an especial work, and that each part of which has been consecrated to some particular purpose. This book, in fact, has afforded me no small amusement, revealing as it does and exposing the lies and frivolities of the Greeks. In size, the chameleon resembles the crocodile last mentioned and only differs from it in having the backbone arched at a more acute angle and a larger tail. There is no animal, it is thought, more timid than this, a fact to which it owes its repeated changes of color. It has a peculiar ascendancy over the hawk tribe, for, according to report, it has the power of attracting those birds when flying above it and then leaving them a voluntary prey for other animals. Democritus asserts that if the head and neck of a chameleon are burnt in a fire made with logs of oak, it will be productive of a storm, attended with rain and thunder, a result equally produced by burning the liver upon the tiles of a house. As to the rest of the magical virtues which he ascribes to this animal, we shall forbear to mention them, although we look upon them as unfounded, except, indeed, in some few instances where their very ridiculousness sufficiently refutes his assertions. The right eye, he says, taken from the living animal and applied with goat's milk, removes diseases of crystalline humors of the eyes, and the tongue, attached to the body as an amulet, is an effectual preservative against the perils of childbirth. He asserts also that the animal itself will facilitate parturition, if in the house at the moment, but if, on the other hand, it is brought from elsewhere, the consequences, he says, will be most dangerous. The tongue, he tells us, if taken from the animal alive, will ensure a favorable result to suits at law, and the heart, attached to the body with black wool of the first shearing, is a good preservative against the attacks of courtin fever. He states also that the right forepaw, attached to the left arm in the skin of the hyena, is a most effectual preservative against robberies and alarms at night that the pap on the right side is preventative of fright and panics, that the left foot is sometimes burnt in a furnace with the plant which also has the name of chameleon, and is then made up with some unguent into lozenges, and that these lozenges kept in a wooden vessel have the effect, if we choose to believe him, of making their owner invisible to others. That the possession, also, of the right shoulder of this animal will ensure victory over all adversaries or enemies, provided always the party throws the sinews of the shoulder upon the ground and treads them underfoot. 
as the left shoulder of the chameleon, I should be quite ashamed to say to what monstrous purposes Democritus devotes it. How that dreams may be produced by the agency thereof, and transferred to any person we may think proper. How that these dreams may be dispelled by the employment of the right foot, and how that lethargy, which has been produced by the right foot of the animal, may be removed by the agency of the left side. So too, headache, he tells us, may be cured by sprinkling wine upon the head, in which either flank of a chameleon has been macerated. If the feet are rubbed with the ashes of the left thigh or foot, milked with sow's milk, gout, he says, will be the result. It is pretty generally believed, however, that cataract and diseases of the crystalline humors of the eyes may be cured by anointing those organs with the gall for three consecutive days, that serpents may be put to flight by dropping some of it into the fire, that weasels may be attracted by water into which it has been thrown, and that applied to the body it acts as a depilatory. The liver, they say, applied with the lungs of a bramble frog is productive of a similar effect. In addition to which, we are told that the liver counteracts the effects of filters, that persons are cured of melancholy by drinking from the warm skin of a chameleon the juice of the plant known by that name, and that if the intestines of the animal and their contents, we should bear in mind that in reality the animal lives without food, are mixed with ape's urine, and the doors of an enemy are besmeared with the mixture, he will, through its agency, become the object of universal hatred. We are told, too, that by the agency of the tail, the course of rivers and torrents may be stopped, and serpents struck with torpor, that the tail, prepared with cedar and myrrh, and tied to a double branch of the date palm, will divide waters that are smitten therewith, and so disclose everything that lies at the bottom. And I only wish that Democritus himself had been touched up with the branch of the palm, seeing that, as he tells us, it has the property of putting an end to immoderate garrulity. It is quite evident that this philosopher, a man who has shown himself so sagacious in other respects, and so useful to his fellow men, has been led away in this instance, by too earnest a desire to promote the welfare of mankind. Chapter 30. Four Remedies Derived from the Sinkus Similar in appearance to the preceding animals is the Sinkus, which by some writers has been called the land crocodile. It is, however, whiter in appearance, and the skin is not so thick. But the main difference between it and the crocodile is in the arrangement of the scales, which run from the tail towards the head. The largest of these animals is the Indian Sinkus, and next to it that of Arabia. They are brought here salted. The muscle and fat of the Sinkus, taken in white wine, act as an aphrodisiac, when used with satyrion and rocket seed more particularly. In the proportion of one drachma of each, mixed with two drachmae of pepper, the whole being made up into lozenges of one drachma each, and so taken in drink. The flesh from the flanks, taken internally in a similar manner, in doses of two oboli, with myrrh and pepper, is generally thought to be productive of a similar effect, and to be even more efficacious for the purpose. According to Appels, the flesh of the Sinkus is good for wounds inflicted by poisoned arrows, whether taken before or after the wound is inflicted. 
it is used as an ingredient also in the most celebrated antidotes. Sextus tells us that taken in doses of more than one drachma in one semi sextarius of wine, the flesh is productive of deadly results. He adds, too, that a broth prepared from it, taken with honey, acts as an antiphrodisiac. Chapter 31. Seven Remedies Derived from the Hippopotamus Between the crocodile, too, and the hippopotamus, there is a certain affinity, frequenting as they do the same river and being both of them of an amphibious nature. The hippopotamus was the first inventor of the practice of letting blood, a fact to which we have made allusion on a previous occasion. It is found, too, in the greatest numbers in the parts above the prefecture of Sais. The hide, reduced to ashes and applied with water, is curative of inflamed tumors and the fat, as well as the dung, used as a fumigation, is employed for the cure of cold agues. With the teeth of the left side of the jaw, the gums are scarified for the cure of toothache. The skin of the left side of the forehead, attached to the groin, acts as an antiphrodisiac, and an application of the ashes of the same part will cause the hair to grow when lost through alopecky. The testes are taken in water, in doses of one drachma, for the cure of injuries inflicted by serpents. The blood is made of use of by painters. Chapter 32. Five Remedies Derived from the Lynx To foreign countries also belongs the lynx which of all quadrupeds is possessed of the most piercing sight. It is said that in the Isle of Carpathus, a most powerful medicament is obtained by reducing to ashes the nails of the lynx, together with the hide, that these ashes taken in drink have the effect of checking abominable desires in men and that, if they are sprinkled upon women, all libidinous thoughts will be restrained. They are good, too, for the removal of itching sensations in any part of the body. The urine of the lynx is a remedy for strangury, for which reason the animal, it is said, is in the habit of rooting up the ground and covering it the moment it is voided. It is mentioned, too, that this urine is an effectual remedy for pains in the throat, thus much with reference to foreign animals. Chapter 33, 9. Remedies furnished in common by animals of the same class, whether wild or tame. 54 medicinal uses of milk, with observations thereon. We will now return to our own part of the world, speaking, first of all, of certain remedies common to animals in general, but excellent in their nature, such as the use of milk, for example. The most beneficial milk to every creature is the mother's milk. It is highly dangerous for nursing women to conceive. Children that are suckled by them are known among us as colostrati their milk being thick like cheese in appearance. The name colostra, it should be remembered, is given to the first milk secreted after delivery, which assumes a spongy, coagulated form. The most nutritive milk in all cases is woman's milk, and next to that, goat's milk, to which is owing, probably, the fabulous story that Jupiter was suckled by a goat. The sweetest next to woman's milk is camel's milk, but the most efficacious, medicinally speaking, is ass's milk. It is in animals of the largest size and individuals of the greatest bulk 
that the milk is secreted with the greatest facility. Goat's milk agrees the best with the stomach, that animal browsing more than grazing. Cow's milk is considered more medicinal, while ewe's milk is sweeter and more nutritive, but not so well adapted to the stomach, it being more oleaginous than any other. Every kind of milk is more aqueous in spring than in summer, and the same in all cases where the animal has grazed upon a new pasture. The best milk of all is that which adheres to the fingernail when placed there, and does not run off from it. Milk is most harmless when boiled, more particularly if sea pebbles have been boiled with it. Cow's milk is the most relaxing, and all kinds of milk are less apt to inflate when boiled. Milk is used for all kinds of internal ulcerations, those of the kidneys, bladder, intestines, throat, and lungs in particular. And externally, it is employed for itching sensations upon the skin and for purulent eruptions, it being taken fasting for the purpose. We have already stated, when speaking of the plants, how that in Arcadia, cow's milk is administered for phthisis, consumption, and cachexy. Instances are cited also of persons who have been cured of gout in the hands and feet by drinking ass's milk. To these various kinds of milk, medical men have added another, to which they have given the name schistin, the following being the usual method of preparing it. Goat's milk, which is used in preference for the purpose, is boiled in a new earthen vessel and stirred with branches of a fig tree newly gathered, as many kayathi of honeyed wine being added to it as there are semi sextarii of milk. When the mixture boils, care is taken to prevent it running over by plunging it into a silver kayathis measure filled with cold water, none of the water being allowed to escape. When taken off the fire, the constituent parts of it divide as it cools, and the whey is thus separated from the milk. Some persons, again, take this whey, which is now very strongly impregnated with wine, and after boiling it down to one-third, leave it to cool in the open air. The best way of taking it is in doses of one semi sextarius at stated intervals during five consecutive days. After taking it, riding exercise should be used by the patient. This way is administered in cases of epilepsy, melancholy, paralysis, leprosy, elephantitis, and diseases of the joints. Milk is employed as an injection when exoriations have been caused by the use of strong purgatives, in cases also where dysentery is productive of chafing. It is similarly employed, boiled with sea pebbles or tzian of barley. Where, however, the intestines are exoriated, cow's milk or ewe's milk is the best. New milk is used as an injection for dysentery, and in an unboiled state, it is employed for affections of the colon and uterus, and for injuries inflicted by serpents. It is also taken internally as an antidote to the venom of cantharides, the pine caterpillar, the buprestis, and the salamander. Cow's milk is particularly recommended for persons who have taken colchium, hemlock, dorichinium, or the flesh of the sea hare, and ass's milk in cases where gypsum, white lead, sulfur, or quicksilver have been taken internally. This last is good, too, for constipation attendant upon fever, and is remarkably useful as a gargle for ulcerations of the throat. It is taken also internally by patients suffering from atrophy for the purpose of recruiting their exhausted strength, as also in cases of fever unattended with headache. The ancients held it as one of their grand secrets, to administer to children before taking food, a semi sextarius of ass's milk, or for want of that, goat's milk, a similar dose too, 
was given to children troubled with chafing of the rectum at stool. It is considered a sovereign remedy for hardness of breathing to take cow's milk whey mixed with nasturtium. In cases of ophthalmia, too, the eyes are fomented with a mixture of one semi sexterius of milk and four drachmae of pounded sesame. Goat's milk is a cure for diseases of the spleen, but in such case the goats must fast a couple of days and be fed on ivy leaves the third. The patient, too, must drink the milk for three consecutive days without taking any other nutriment. Milk, under other circumstances, is detrimental to persons suffering from headache, liver complaints, diseases of the spleen, and affections of the sinews. It is bad for fevers also, vertigo, except, indeed, where it is required as a purgative, oppression of the head, coughs, and ophthalmia. Sow's milk is extremely useful in cases of tenesmus, dysentery, and phthisis. Authors have been found, too, to assert that it is very wholesome for females. End of section 11 of Pliny's Natural History. Recording by Devin Tatlow. Section 12 of The Natural History, Volume 6. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Randall Meredith. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 12, Book 28, Chapters 34 through 45. Chapter 34, Twelve Remedies Derived from Cheese. We have already spoken of the different kinds of cheese when treating of the mammalae and other parts of animals. Sextius attributes the same properties to mare's milk cheese that he does to cheese made of cow's milk. To the former he gives the names of hippace. Cheese is best for the stomach when not salted, or, in other words, when new cheese is used. Old salted cheese has a binding effect upon the bowels, and reduces the flesh, but it is more wholesome to the stomach than new salted cheese. Indeed, we may pronounce of aliments in general that salt meats reduce the system, while fresh food has a tendency to make flesh. Fresh cheese, applied with honey, effaces the marks of bruises. It acts also emolliently upon the bowels, and, taken in the form of tablets, boiled in astringent wine, and then toasted with honey on a platter, it modifies and alleviates gripping pains in the bowels. The cheese known as saprum is beaten up in wine with salt and dried sorb apples and taken in drink for the cure of celiac affections. Goat's milk cheese, pounded and applied to the part affected, is a cure for carbuncle of the generative organs. Sour cheese also, with oxymel, is productive of a similar effect. In the bath it is used as a friction, alternately with oil, for the removal of spots. Chapter 35. 25 Remedies Derived from Butter From milk too, butter is produced. Held as the most delicate of food among barbarous nations, and one which distinguishes the wealthy from the multitude at large, it is mostly made from cow's milk, and hence its name. But the richest butter is that made from ewe's milk. There is a butter made also from goat's milk, but previously to making it, the milk should first be warmed in winter. In summer, it is extracted from the milk by merely shaking it to and fro in a tall vessel. With a small orifice at the mouth to admit the air, but otherwise closely stopped, a little water being added to make it curdle the sooner. The milk that curdles the most floats upon the surface. This they remove, and, adding salt to it, give it the name of oxygala. They then take the remaining part and boil it down in pots, 
and that portion of it which floats on the surface is butter, a substance of an oily nature. The more rank it is in smell, the more highly it is esteemed. When old, it forms an ingredient in numerous compositions. It is of an astringent, emollient, repletive, and purgative nature. Chapter 36. Oxygola. One Remedy. Oxygola too is prepared another way, sour milk being added to the fresh milk which is wanted to curdle. This preparation is extremely wholesome to the stomach. Of its properties we shall have occasion to speak in another place. Chapter 37. The Various Uses of Fat and Observations Upon It, 52 in Number. Among the remedies common to living creatures, fat is the substance held in the next highest esteem, that of swine in particular, which was employed by the ancients for certain religious purposes even. At all events, it is still the usage for the newly wedded bride, when entering her husband's house, to touch the doorposts with it. There are two methods of keeping hog's lard, either salted or fresh. Indeed, the older it is, the better. The Greek writers have now given it the name of axungia, or axle grease, in their works. Nor, in fact, is it any secret why swine's fat should be possessed of such marked properties, seeing that the animal feeds to such a great extent upon the roots of plants, owing to, to which, its dung is applied to such a vast number of purposes. It will be as well, therefore, to premise, that I shall here speak only of the hog that feeds in the open field, and no other, of which kind it is the female that is much the most useful, if she has never farrowed more particularly. But it is the fat of the wild boar that is held in by far the highest esteem of all. The distinguishing properties, then, of swine's grease are emollient, calorific, resolvent, and detergent. Some physicians recommend it as an ointment for the gout, mixed with goose grease, bull suet, and wool grease. In cases, however, where the pain is persistent, it should be used in combination with wax, myrtle, resin, and pitch. Hog's lard is used fresh for the cure of burns and of blains too, caused by snow, with ashes of burnt barley and nut galls in equal proportions it is employed for the cure of chillblains. It is good also for exoriations of the limbs and for dispelling weariness and lassitude arising from long journeys. For the cure of chronic cough, new lard is boiled down in the proportion of three ounces to three cyathe of wine, some honey being added to the mixture. Old lard, too, if it has been kept without salt, made up into pills and taken internally, is a cure for phthisis, but it is a general rule not to use it salted in any cases except where detergents are required, or where there are no symptoms of ulceration. For the cure of phthisis, some persons boil down three ounces of hog's lard and honeyed wine, in three siathi of ordinary wine and after swathing the sides, chest, and shoulders of the patient with compresses steeped in the preparation, administer to him every four days some tar with an egg. Indeed, so potent is this composition that if it is only attached to the knees even, the flavor of it will ascend to the mouth, and the patient will appear to spit it out, as it were. The grease of a sow that has never farrowed is the most useful of all cosmetics for the skin of females. But in all cases, hog's lard is good for the cure of itch scab mixed with pitch and beef suet in the proportion of one-third, the whole being made lukewarm for the purpose. Fresh hog's lard, applied as a pessary, imparts nutriment to the infant in the womb and prevents abortion. Mixed with white lead or litharge, it restores scars to their natural color, and in combination with sulfur, it rectifies malformed nails. It prevents the hair also from falling off, and, applied with a quarter of a nut gall, it heals ulcers upon the head in females. When well smoked, it strengthens the eyelashes. Lard is recommended also 
or phthisis, boiled down with old wine in the proportion of one ounce to a semi-sextarius, till only three ounces are left. Some persons add a little honey to the composition. Mixed with lime, it is used as a liniment for inflamed tumors, boils, and indurations of the mammalae. It is curative also of ruptures, convulsions, cramps, and sprains. Used with white hellebore, it is good for corns, chaps, and callosities, and with pounded earthenware which has held salted provisions, for imposthumes of the parotid glands and scrofulous sores. Employed as a friction in the bath, it removes itching sensations and pimples. But for the treatment of gout, there is another method of preparing it. By mixing it with old oil and adding pounded sarcophagus stone and sank foil bruised in wine, or else with lime or ashes. A peculiar kind of plaster is also made of it for the cure of inflammatory ulcers, 75 denarii of hog's lard being mixed with 100 of litharge. It is reckoned a very good plan also to anoint ulcers with boar's grease and, if they are of a serpiginous nature, to add resin to the liniment. The ancients used to employ hog's lard in particular for greasing the axles of their vehicles that the wheels might revolve the more easily, and to this, in fact, it owes its name of axongia. When hog's lard has been used for this purpose, incorporated as it is with the rust of the iron upon the wheels, it is remarkably useful as an application for diseases of the rectum and of the generative organs. The ancient physicians, too, set a high value upon the medicinal properties of hog's lard in an unmixed state, separating it from the kidneys, and carefully removing the veins, they used to wash and rub it well with rainwater, after which they boiled it several times in a new earthen vessel, and then put it by for keeping. It is generally agreed that it is more emollient, calorific, and resolvent when salted, and that it is still more useful when it has been rinsed in wine. Masurius informs us that the ancients set the highest value of all upon the fat of the wolf, and it was for this reason that the newly wedded bride used to anoint the doorposts of her husband's house with it, in order that no noxious spells might find admittance. Chapter 38. Suet. Corresponding with the grease of the swine is the suet that is found in the ruminating animals, a substance employed in other ways, but no less efficacious in its properties. The proper mode of preparing it, in all cases, is to take out the veins and to rinse it in sea or salt water, after which it is beaten up in a mortar, with a sprinkling of sea water in it. This done, it is boiled in several waters, until, in fact, it has lost all smell, and is then bleached by continual exposure to the sun, that of the most esteemed quality being the fat which grows about the kidneys. In case stale suet is required for any medicinal purpose, it is recommended to melt it first, and then to wash it in cold water several times, after which it must again be melted with a sprinkling of the most aromatic wine that can be procured, it being then boiled again and again until the rank smell has totally disappeared. Many persons recommend that the fat of bulls, lions, panthers, and camels in particular should be thus prepared. As to the various uses to which these substances are applied, we shall mention them on the appropriate occasions. Chapter 39. Marrow. Common, too, to all these animals is marrow, a substance which in all cases is possessed of certain emollient, expletive, desiccative, and calorific properties. The most highly esteemed of all is the deer's marrow, the next best being that of the calf, and then that of the goat, both male and female. These substances are prepared before autumn by washing them in a fresh state and drying them in the shade, after which they are passed through a sieve and then strained through linen and put by in earthen pots for keeping in a cool spot. Chapter 40. Gall but among the substances which are furnished in common by the various animals, it is the gall, we may say, that is the most efficacious of all. 
the properties of this substance are of a calorific, pungent, resolvent, extractive, and dispersive nature. The gall of the smaller animals is looked upon as the most penetrating, for which reason it is that it is generally considered the most efficacious for the composition of eye salves. Bull's gall is possessed of a remarkable degree of potency, having the effect of imparting a golden tint to the surface of copper even, and to vessels made of other metals. Gall in every case is prepared in the following manner. It is taken fresh, and the orifice of the vesicle in which it is contained being tied fast with a strong linen thread, it is left to steep for half an hour in boiling water, after which it is dried in the shade and then put away for keeping in honey. That of the horse is condemned, being reckoned among the poisons only. Hence it is that the flamen of the sacrifices is not allowed to touch a horse, notwithstanding that it is the custom to immolate one of these animals at the public sacrifices at Rome. Chapter 41. Blood. The blood also of the horse is possessed of certain corrosive properties, and so too is mare's blood, except indeed where the animal has not been covered, it having the effect of cauterizing the margins of ulcers and so enlarging them. Bull's blood, too, taken fresh, is reckoned among the poisons except, indeed, at Ajira, at which place the priestess of the earth, when about to foretell coming events, takes a draught of bull's blood before she descends into the cavern. So powerful, in fact, is the agency of that sympathy, so generally spoken of, that it may occasionally originate, we find, in feelings of religious awe, or in the peculiar nature of the locality. Drusus, the tribune of the people, drank goat's blood, it is said, it being his object by his pallid looks to suggest that his enemy, Q. Sepio, had given him poison, and so expose him to public hatred. So remarkably powerful is the blood of the he-goat that there is nothing better in existence for sharpening iron implements, the rust produced by this blood giving them a better edge even than a file. Considering, however, that the blood of all animals cannot be reckoned as a remedy in common, will it not be advisable, in preference, to speak of the effects that are produced by that of each kind? Chapter 42 Peculiar Remedies Derived from Various Animals and Classified According to the Maladies Remedies Against the Poison of Serpents Derived from the Stag, the Fawn, the Ophion, the She-Goat, the Kid, and the ass. We will therefore classify the various remedies, according to the maladies for which they are respectively used, and first of all, those to which man has recourse for injuries inflicted by serpents. That deer are destructive to these reptiles no one is ignorant, and also of the fact that they drag them from their holes when they find them, and so devour them. And it is not only while alive and breathing that deer are thus fatal to serpents, but even when dead and separated limb from limb. The fumes of their horns, while burning, will drive away serpents, as already stated. But the bones, it is said, of the upper part of a stag's throat, if burnt upon a fire, will bring those reptiles together. Persons may sleep upon a deer's skin in perfect safety, and without any apprehension of attacks by serpents. Its rennet, too, taken with vinegar, is an effectual antidote to the stings of those reptiles. Indeed, if it has been only touched by a person, he will be for that day effectually protected from them. The testes, dried, or the genitals of the male animal, are considered to be very wholesome, taken in wine, and so are the umbles, generally known as the centipelio. Persons having about them a deer's tooth, or who have taken the precaution of rubbing the body with a deer or fawn's marrow, will be sure to repel the attacks of all serpents. But the most effectual remedy of all is thought to be the rennet of a fawn that has been cut from the uterus of the dam, as already mentioned in another place. Deer's blood, burnt upon a fire of lentisk wood with dracontium, cunilago, and alkanet, will attract serpents, they say, while, on the other hand, if the blood is removed and perethrum substituted for it, they will take to flight, 
I find an animal mentioned by Greek writers, smaller than the stag but resembling it in the hair, and to which they give the name of Ophion. Sardinia, they say, is the only country that produces it. I am of opinion, however, that it is now extinct, and for that reason I shall not enlarge upon its medicinal properties. As a preservative against the attacks of serpents, the brains and blood of the wild boar are held in high esteem. The liver also, dried and taken in wine with rue, and the fat used with honey and resin. Similar properties are attributed to the liver of the domesticated boar and the outer filaments, and those only of the gall, these last being taken in doses of four denarii. The brains also taken in wine are equally effectual. The fumes of the burning horns or hair of a she-goat will repel serpents, they say. The ashes, too, of the horns, used either internally or externally, are thought to be an antidote to their poison. A similar effect is attributed to goat's milk, taken with Taminian grapes, to the urine of those animals taken with the squill vinegar, to goat's milk cheese, applied with origanum, and to goat suet, used with wax. In addition to all this, as will be seen hereafter, there are a thousand other remedial properties attributed to this animal, a fact which surprises me all the more, seeing that the goat, it is said, is never free from fever. The wild animals of the same species, which are very numerous, as already stated, have a still greater efficacy attributed to them. But the he-goat has certain properties peculiar to itself, and Democritus attributes properties still more powerful to the animal when it has been the only one yeaned. It is recommended also to apply she-goat's dung, boiled in vinegar, to injuries inflicted by serpents, as also the ashes of fresh dung mixed with wine. As a general rule, persons who find that they are recovering but slowly from injuries inflicted by a serpent will find their health more speedily re-established by frequenting the stalls where goats are kept. Those, however, whose object is a more assured remedy, attach immediately to the wound the paunch of a she-goat killed for the purpose, dung and all. Others, again, use the flesh of a kid just killed and fumigate it with the singed hair the smell of which has the effect of repelling serpents. For stings of serpents, as also for injuries inflicted by the scorpion and shrew mouse, some employ the skin of a goat newly killed, as also the flesh and dung of a horse that has been out at pasture, or a hare's rennet in vinegar. They say, too, that if a person has the body well rubbed with a hare's rennet, he will never receive injury from venomous animals. When a person has been stung by a scorpion, she-goat's dung, boiled with vinegar, is considered a most efficient remedy. In cases, too, where a buprestus has been swallowed, bacon and the broth in which it has been boiled are highly efficacious. Nay, what is even more than this, if a person applies his mouth to an ass's ear and says that he has been stung by a scorpion, the whole of the poison, they say, will immediately pass away from him and be transferred to the animal. All venomous creatures, it is said, are put to flight by a fumigation made by burning an ass's lights. It is considered an excellent plan, too, to fumigate persons, when stung by a scorpion, with the smoke of burnt calves' dung. Chapter 43. Remedies for the Bite of the Mad Dog. Remedies derived from the calf, the he-goat, and various other animals. When a person has been bitten by a mad dog, it is the practice to make an incision round the wound to the quick, and to make the patient take either veal broth or hog's lard, mixed with lime, internally. Some persons recommend a he-goat's liver, and maintain that if it is applied to the wound, the patient will never be attacked with hydrophobia. She-goat's dung, too, is highly spoken of, applied with wine, as also the dung of the badger, cuckoo, and swallow, boiled and taken in drink. For bites inflicted by other animals, dried goat's milk cheese is applied with oregonum and taken with the drink, and for injuries caused by the human teeth, boiled beef is applied. Veal, however, is still more efficacious for the purpose, provided it is not removed before the end of four days. Chapter 44 
Remedies to be adopted against enchantments. The dried muzzle of a wolf, they say, is an effectual preservative against the malpractices of magic, and it is for this reason that it is so common to be seen fastened to the doors of farmhouses. A similar degree of efficacy, it is thought, belongs to the skin of the neck when taken whole from the animal. Indeed, so powerful is the influence of this animal, in addition to what we have already stated, that if a horse only treads in its track, it will be struck with torpor in consequence. Chapter 45. Remedies for Poisons In case where persons have swallowed quicksilver, bacon is the proper remedy to be employed. Poisons are neutralized by taking ass's milk. Henbane, more particularly, mistletoe, hemlock, the flesh of the sea hare, apocarpathon, farrakhan, and dorysnium. The same, too, where coagulated milk has been productive of bad effects for the bee stings, or first curdled milk, should be reckoned as nothing short of a poison. We shall have to mention many other uses to which ass's milk is applied. But it should be remembered that in all cases it must be used fresh, or, if not, as new as possible, and warmed, for there is nothing that more speedily loses its virtue. The bones, too, of the ass are pounded and boiled, as an antidote to the poison of the sea hare. The wild ass is possessed of similar properties in every respect, but in a much higher degree. Of the wild horse, the Greek writers have made no mention, it not being a native of their country. We have every reason to believe, however, that it has the same properties as the animal in a tame state, but much more fully developed. Mare's milk effectually neutralizes the venom of the sea hare and all narcotic poisons. Nor had the Greeks any knowledge from experience of the urus and the bison. Although, in India, the forests are filled with herds of wild oxen, it is only reasonable, however, to conclude that all their medicinal properties must be much more highly developed than in the animal as found among us. It is asserted also that cow's milk is a general counterpoison, in the cases above mentioned, more particularly as also where the poison of ephemeron has settled internally, or cantharides have been administered, it acting upon the poison by vomit. Broth, too, made from goat's flesh, neutralizes the effects of cantharides in a similar manner, it is said. To counteract the corrosive poisons which destroy by ulceration, veal or beef suet is resorted to, and in cases where a leech has been swallowed, butter is the usual remedy, with vinegar heated with a red-hot iron. Indeed, butter employed by itself is a good remedy for poisons, for where oil is not to be procured, it is an excellent substitute for it. Used with honey, butter heals injuries inflicted by millipedes. The broth of boiled tripe, it is thought, is an effectual repellent of the above-mentioned poisons, aconite and hemlock more particularly. Veal suet also has a similar repute. Fresh goat's milk cheese is given to persons who have taken mistletoe, and goat's milk itself is a remedy for cantharides. Taken with Taminian grapes, goat's milk is an antidote to the effects of ephemeron. Goat's blood boiled down with the marrow is used as a remedy for the narcotic poisons, and kid's blood for the other poisons. Kid's rennet is administered where persons have taken mistletoe, the juice of the white chameleon, or bull's blood, for which last, hare's rennet in vinegar is also used by way of antidote. For injuries inflicted by the pastinica and the stings or bites of all kinds of marine animals, hare's rennet, kid's rennet, or lamb's rennet is taken in doses of one drachma in wine. Hare's rennet, too, generally forms an ingredient in the antidotes for poisons. Moth that is seen fluttering about the flame of a lamp is generally reckoned in the number of the noxious substances. Its bad effects are neutralized by the agency of goat's liver. Goat's gall, too, is looked upon as an antidote to venomous preparations from the field weasel. But we will now return to the other remedies, classified according to the various diseases. End of section 12. Recording by Randall Meredith. Section 13 of The Natural History, Volume 6. 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Michelle Eaton. The Natural History, Volume 6, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 13, Book 28, Chapters 46 to 61. Chapter 46, Remedies for Diseases of the Head and for Alopecia. Bear's grease mixed with ladanum and the plant adiantum prevents the hair from falling off. It is a cure also for alopecia and defects in the eyebrows mixed with the fungus from the wick of a lamp and the soot that is found in the nozzle. Used with wine, it is good for the cure of Parisio, a malady which is also treated with the ashes of deer's horns in wine. This last substance also prevents the growth of vermin in the hair. For Parisio, some persons employ goat's gall in combination with simoleon chalk and vinegar, leaving the preparation to dry for a time on the head. Sow's gall, too, mixed with bull's urine, is employed for a similar purpose, and when old, it is an effectual cure, with the addition of sulphur, for furfuraceous eruptions. The ashes, it is thought, of an ass's genitals, will make the hair grow more thickly, and prevent it from turning grey. The proper method of applying it being to shave the head, and to pound the ashes in a leaden mortar with oil. Similar effects are attributed to the genitals of an ass's foal, reduced to ashes and mixed with urine, some nard being added to render the mixture less offensive. In case of alopecia, the part affected is rubbed with bull's gall, warmed with Egyptian alum. Running ulcers of the head are successfully treated with bull's urine or stale human urine in combination with cyclaminos and sulphur, but the most effectual remedy is calf's gall, a substance which heated with vinegar has also the effect of exterminating lice. Veal suet pounded with salt and applied to ulcers of the head is a very useful remedy. The fat, too, of the fox is highly spoken of, but the greatest value is set upon cat's dung, applied in a similar manner with mustard. Powdered goat's horns, or the horns reduced to ashes, those of the he-goat in particular, with the addition of nitre, tamarisk seed, butter and oil, are remarkably effectual for preventing the hair from coming off, the head being first shaved for the purpose. So too the ashes of burnt goat's flesh, applied to the eyebrows with oil, impart to them a black tint. By using goat's milk, they say, lice may be exterminated, and the dung of those animals, with honey, is thought to be a cure for alopecia. The ashes, too, of the hoofs, mixed with pitch, prevent the hair from coming off. The ashes of a burnt hair, mixed with oil of myrtle, alleviate headache. The patient drinking some water that has been left in the trough, after an ox or ass has been drinking there. The male organs of a fox, worn as an amulet, are productive, if we choose to believe it of a similar effect. The same too with the ashes of a burnt deer's horn, applied with vinegar, rose oil, or oil of iris. Chapter 47. Remedies for Affections of the Eyes. For defluxions of the eyes, beef suet boiled with oil is applied to the parts affected, and for eruptions of those organs, ashes of burnt deer's horns are similarly employed, the tips of the horns being considered the most effectual for the purpose. For the cure of cataract, it is reckoned a good plan to apply a wolf's excrements. The same substance, too, reduced to ashes, is used for the dispersion of films, in combination with attic honey. Bear's gall, too, is similarly employed, and for the cure of epinictus, while boar's lard mixed with oil of roses is thought to be very useful. An ass's hoof reduced to ashes and applied with ass's milk is used for the removal of marks in the eyes and indurations of the crystalline humours. 
beef marrow from the right foreleg, beaten up with soot, is employed for affections of the eyebrows and for diseases of the eyelids and corners of the eyes. For the same purpose also, a sort of calibre farum is prepared from soot, the best of all being that made from a wick of papyrus mixed with oil of sesame, the soot being removed with a feather and caught in a new vessel prepared for the purpose. This mixture too is very efficacious for preventing superfluous eyelashes from growing again when once pulled out. Bull's gall is made up into eye salves with white of egg, these salves being steeped in water and applied to the eyes for four days successively. Veal suet with goose grease and the extracted juice of osimum is remarkably good for diseases of the eyelids. Veal marrow with the addition of an equal proportion of wax and oil or oil of roses, an egg being added to the mixture, is used as a liniment for indurations of the eyelids. Soft goat's milk cheese is used as an application with warm water to allay defluxions of the eyes, but when they are attended with swelling, honey is used instead of the water. In both cases, however, the eyes should be fermented with warm whey. In cases of dry ophthalmia, it is found a very useful plan to take the mussels lying within a loin of pork and after reducing them to ashes, to pound and apply them to the part affected. She-goats, they say, are never affected with ophthalmia from the circumstance that they browse upon certain kinds of herbs. The same too with the gazelle. Hence it is that we find it recommended at the time of a new moon to swallow the dung of these animals coated with wax, as they are able to see too by night. It is a general belief that the blood of a he-goat is a cure for those persons affected with dimness of sight, to whom the Greeks have given the name of nyctalopes. A similar virtue is attributed to the liver of a she-goat, boiled in astringent wine. Some are in the habit of rubbing the eyes with the thick gravy, which exudes from a she-goat's liver, roasted or with the gall of that animal. They recommend the flesh also as a diet, and say that the patient should expose his eyes to the fumes of it while boiling. It is a general opinion, too, that the animal should be of a reddish colour. Another prescription is to fumigate the eyes with the steam arising from the liver boiled in an earthen jar, or, according to some authorities, roasted. Goat's gall is applied for numerous purposes, with honey or film, repeat, with honey for films upon the eyes with one-third part of white hellebore for cataract, with wine for spots upon the eyes, indurations of the cornea, films, webs and argema, with extracted juice of cabbage, for diseases of the eyelids, the hairs being first pulled out, and the preparation left to dry on the parts affected, and with woman's milk for rupture of the coats of the eye. For all these purposes, the gall is considered the most efficacious when dried. Nor is the dung of this animal held in disesteem, being applied with honey for defluxions of the eyes. The marrow, too, of a goat, or a hare's light, we find used for pains in the eyes, and the gall of a goat, with raisin wine or honey, for the dispersion of films upon those organs. It is recommended also for ophthalmia, to anoint the eyes with wolf's fat or swine's marrow. We find it asserted, too, that persons who carry a wolf's tongue inserted in a bracelet will always be exempt from ophthalmia. Chapter 48 Remedies for Diseases and Affections of the Ears Pains and diseases of the ears are cured by using the urine of a wild boar. Kept in a glass vessel, or the gall of a wild boar, swine or ox, mixed with castor oil and oil of roses in equal proportions. But the best remedy of all is bull's gall, warmed with leek juice or with honey, if there is any suppuration. Bull's gall, too, warmed by itself in a pomegranate rind, is an excellent remedy for offensive exhalations from the ears. In combination with woman's milk, 
it is efficacious as a cure for rupture of those organs. Some persons are of opinion that it is a good plan to wash the ears with this preparation in cases where the hearing is affected, while others again, after washing the ears with warm water, insert a mixture composed of the old slough of a serpent and vinegar wrapped up in a docile of wool. In cases, however, where the deafness is very considerable, gall warmed in a pomegranate rind with myrrh and rue is injected into the ears. Sometimes also fat bacon is used for this purpose, or fresh asses dung, mixed with oil of roses. In all cases, however, the ingredients should be warmed. The foam from a horse's mouth is better still, or the ashes of fresh horse dung mixed with oil of roses. Fresh butter too is good. Beef suet mixed with goose grease, the urine of a bull or she-goat, or fuller's lant, heated to such a degree that the steam escapes by the neck of the vessel. For this purpose also, one third part of vinegar is mixed with a small portion of the urine of a calf, which has not begun to graze. They apply also to the ears calf's dung, mixed with the gall of that animal, and sloughs of serpents, care being taken to warm the ears before the application, and all the remedies being wrapped in wool. Veal suet, too, is used, with goose grease and extract of osimum, or else veal marrow, mixed with bruised cumin, and injected into the ears. For pains in the ears, the liquid ejected by a bore in copulation is used, due care being taken to receive it before it falls to the ground. For fractures of the ears, a glutinous composition is made from the genitals of a calf, which is dissolved in water when used, and for other diseases of these organs, fox's fat is employed. Goat gall mixed with rose oil warmed, or else extracted juice of leek. In all cases where there is any rupture, these preparations are used in combination with woman's milk. Where a patient is suffering from hardness of hearing, ox gall is employed with the urine of a he or she goat. The same too, where there is any suppuration. Whatever the purpose for which they are wanted, it is the general opinion that these substances are more efficacious when they have been smoked in a goat's horn for 20 days. Hare's rennet, too, is highly spoken of, taken in a minian wine, in the proportion of one-third of a denarius of rennet to one-half of a denarius of sycopanum. Bear's grease mixed with equal proportions of wax and bull suet is a cure for hypothumes of the parotid glands. Some persons add hypothesis to the composition, or else content themselves with employing butter only. After first fermenting the parts affected with a decoction of fenugreek, the good effects of which are augmented by strychnos. The testes, too, of the fox are very useful for this purpose, as also bull's blood, dried and reduced to powder. She-goat's urine made warm is used as an injection for the ears and a liniment is made of the dung of those animals in combination with axle grease. Chapter 49. Remedies for Toothache The ashes of deer's horns strengthen loose teeth and allay toothache, used either as a friction or as a gargle. Some persons, however, are of opinion that the horn, unburnt and reduced to powder, is still more efficacious for all these purposes. Dentifrices are made both from the powder and the ashes. Another excellent remedy is a wolf's head reduced to ashes. It is a well-known fact, too, that there are bones generally found in the excrements of that animal. These bones attached to the body as an amulet are productive of advantageous effects. For the cure of toothache, hare's rennet is injected into the ear. The head also of that animal, reduced to ashes, is used in the form of a dentifrice, and with the addition of nard, is a corrective of bad breath. Some persons, however, think it is a better plan to mix the ashes of a mouse's head with the dentifrice. In the side of the hair, there is a bone found similar to a needle in appearance, 
For the cure of toothache, it is recommended to scarify the gums with this bone. The paste and bone of an ox, ignited and applied to loose teeth which ache, has the effect of strengthening them in the sockets. The same bone reduced to ashes and mixed with myrrh is also used as a dentifrice. The ashes of burnt pig's feet are productive of a similar effect, as also the calcined bones of the cotyloid cavities in which the hip bones move. It is a well-known fact that introduced into the throat of beasts of burden, these bones are a cure for worms, and that, in a calcined state, they are good for strengthening the teeth. When the teeth have been loosened by a blow, they are strengthened by using ass's milk, or else ashes of the burnt teeth of that animal, or a horse's lichen, reduced to powder and injected into the ear with oil. By lichen I do not mean the hippomanes, a noxious substance which I purposely forbear to enlarge upon, but an excrescence which forms upon the knees of horses and just above the hooves. In the heart of this animal there is also found a bone which bears a close resemblance to the eye teeth of a dog. If the gums are scarified with this bone, or with a tooth taken from the jawbone of a dead horse, corresponding in place with the tooth affected, the pain will be removed, they say. Anaxilaeus assures us that if the liquid which exudes from a mare when covered is ignited on the wick of a lamp, it will give out a most marvellous representation of horses' heads, and the same with reference to the she-ass. As to the hippomanes, it is possessed of properties so virulent and so truly magical that if it is only thrown into fused metal, which is being cast into the resemblance of an Olympian mare, it will excite in all stallions that approach it a perfect frenzy for copulation. Another remedy for diseases of the teeth is joiner's glue, boiled in water and applied, care being taken to remove it very speedily and instantly to rinse the teeth with wine, in which sweet pomegranate rind has been boiled. It is considered also a very efficacious remedy to wash the teeth with goat's milk or bull's gall. The paste and bones of a she-goat, just killed, reduced to ashes, and indeed, to avoid the necessity for repetition of any other four-footed beast reared in the farmyard, are considered to make an excellent dentifrice. Chapter 50. Remedies for Diseases of the Face It is generally believed that ass's milk effaces wrinkles in the face, renders the skin more delicate, and preserves its whiteness. And it is a well-known fact that some women are in the habit of washing their face with it 700 times daily, strictly observing that number. Poppea, the wife of the Emperor Nero, was the first to practice this. Indeed, she had sitting baths, prepared solely with ass's milk, for which purpose whole troops of she-asses used to attend her on her journeys. Purulent eruptions on the face are removed by an application of butter, but white lead mixed with the butter is an improvement. Pure butter alone is used for serpiginous eruptions of the face, a layer of barley meal being powdered over it. The call of a cow that has just calved is applied, while still moist, to ulcers of the face. The following recipe may seem frivolous, but still, to please the women, it must not be omitted. The paste and bone of a white steer, they say, boiled forty days and forty nights, till it is quite dissolved, and then applied to the face in a linen cloth, will remove wrinkles and preserve the whiteness of the skin. An application of bull's dung, they say, will impart a rosy tint to the cheeks, and not crocodilia even is better for the purpose. The face, however, must be washed with cold water, both before and after the application. Sunburns and all other discolorations of the skin are removed by the aid of calves' dung, kneaded up by hand with oil and gum. Ulcerations and chaps of the mouth by an application of veal or beef suet, mixed with goose grease and juice of osimum. There is another composition also made of veal suet, with stag's marrow and leaves of white thorn, 
the whole beaten up together. Marrow too mixed with resin, even if it be cow marrow only, is equally good, and the broth of cow beef is productive of similar effects. A most excellent remedy for the lichens on the face is a glutinous substance prepared from the genitals of a male calf. Melted with vinegar and live sulphur, and stirred together with a branch of a fig tree. This composition is applied twice a day and should be used quite fresh. This glue, similarly prepared from a decoction of honey and vinegar, is a cure for leprous spots, which are also removed by applying a he goat's liver warm. Elephantiasis, too, is removed by an application of goat's gall, and leprous spots and furfuraceous eruptions by employing bull's gall with the addition of nitrate or else ass's urine about the rising of the dog star. Spots on the face are removed by either bull's gall or ass's gall, diluted in water by itself, care being taken to avoid the sun or wind after the skin has peeled off. A similar effect is produced also by using bull's gall or calf's gall in combination with seed of unilla and the ashes of a deer's horn, burnt at the rising of canicula. Ass's fat in particular restores the natural colour to scars and spots on the skin caused by lichen or leprosy. A he-goat's gall mixed with cheese, live sulphur and sponge reduced to the ashes effectively removes freckles, the composition being brought to the consistency of honey before being applied. Some persons, however, prefer using dried gall and mix with it warm bran in the proportion of one obolus to four oboli of honey, the spots being rubbed briskly first. He goat suet, too, is highly efficacious, used in combination with gith, sulphur and iris, this mixture being also employed with goose grease, stag's marrow, resin and lime for the cure of cracked lips. I find it stated by certain authors that persons who have freckles on the skin are looked upon as disqualified from taking any part in the sacrifices prescribed by the magic art. Chapter 51. Remedies for diseases of the tonsillary glands and for scrofula. Cow's milk or goat's milk is good for ulcerations of the tonsillary glands and of the trachea. It is used in the form of a gargle, warm from the udder or heated, goat's milk being the best, boiled with mallows and a little salt. A broth made from tripe is an excellent gargle for ulcerations of the tongue and trachea, and for diseases of the tonsillary glands. The kidneys of a fox are considered a sovereign remedy, dried and beaten up with honey and applied externally. For quinsy, Bull's gall or goat's gall is used mixed with honey. A badger's liver taken in water is good for offensive breath and butter has a healing effect upon ulcerations of the mouth. When a pointed or other substance is stuck in the throat by rubbing it externally with cat's dung, the substance, they say, will either come up again or pass downwards into the stomach. Scrofulous sores are dispersed by applying the gall of a wild boar or of an ox, warmed for the purpose. But it is only when the sores are ulcerated that hare's rennet is used, applied in a linen cloth with wine. The ashes of the burnt hoof of an ass or horse, applied with oil or water, is good for dispersing scrofulous sores. Warmed urine also, the ashes of an ox's hoof taken in water, goat's dung boiled in vinegar, or the testes of a fox. Soap too is very useful for this purpose, an invention of the galls for giving a reddish tint to the hair. This substance is prepared from tallow and ashes, the best ashes for the purpose being those of the beech and yoke elm. There are two kinds of it, the hard soap and the liquid, both of them much used by the people of Germany, the men in particular more than the women. Chapter 52. Remedies for pains in the neck. For pains in the neck, the part should be well rubbed with butter or bear's grease, and for a stiff neck with beef suet. 
a substance which in combination with oil is very useful for the cure of scrofula for the painful cramp attended with inflexibility to which people give the name of apisthotony the urine of a she-goat injected into the ears is found very useful as also a liniment made of the dung of that animal mixed with bulbs in cases where the nails have been crushed it is an excellent plan to attach them to the gall of any kind of animal whitlows upon the fingers should be treated with dried bull's gall dissolved in warm water some persons are in the habit of adding sulphur and alum of each an equal weight chapter fifty three remedies for cough and for spitting of blood a wolf's liver administered in mulled wine is a cure for cough a bear's gall also mixed with honey the ashes of tips of cow horn or else the saliva of a horse taken in the drink for three consecutive days in which last case the horse will be sure to die they say a deer's lights are useful for the same purpose dried with the gullet of the animal in the smoke and then beaten up with honey and taken daily as an electuary the spitter deer be it remarked is the kind that is the most efficacious for the purpose spitting of blood is cured by taking ashes of burnt deer's horns or else a hare's rennet in drink in doses of one-third of a denarius with samian earth and myrtle wine the dung of this last animal reduced to ashes and taken in the evening with wine is good for coughs that are recurrent at night the smoke too of a hare's fur inhaled has the effect of bringing off from the lungs such humours as are difficult to be discharged by expectoration purulent ulcerations of the chest and lungs and bad breath proceeding from a morbid state of the lungs are successfully treated with butter boiled with an equal quantity of attic honey till it assumes a reddish hue a spoonful of the mixture being taken by the patient every morning some persons however instead of honey prefer using larch resin for the purpose in cases where there are discharges of blood cow's blood they say is good taken in small quantities with vinegar but as to bull's blood it would be a rash thing to believe in any such recommendation for inveterate spitting of blood bull glue is taken in doses of three oboli in warm water chapter fifty four remedies for affections of the stomach ulcerations of the stomach are effectually treated with ass's milk or cow's milk for gnawing pains in that region beef is stewed with vinegar and wine fluxes are healed by taking the ashes of burnt deer's horn and discharges of blood by drinking the blood of a kid just killed made hot in doses of three cyathi with equal proportions of vinegar and tart wine or else by taking kids rennet with twice the quantity of vinegar chapter fifty five remedies for liver complaints and for asthma liver complaints are cured by taking a wolf's liver dried in honeyed wine or by using the dried liver of an ass with twice the quantity of rock parsley and three nuts the whole beaten up with honey and taken with the food the blood too of a he-goat is prepared and taken with the food for persons suffering from asthma the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses taken in drink for persons suffering from asthma the most efficient remedy of all is the blood of wild horses taken in drink and next to that ass's milk boiled with bulbs the whey being the part used with the addition of nasturtium steeped in water and tempered with honey in the proportion of one cyathus of nasturtium to three semisextari of whey the liver or lights of a fox taken in red wine or bear's gall in water facilitate the respiration chapter fifty six remedies for pains in the loins for pains in the loins and all other affections which require emollients frictions with bear's grease should be used or else ashes of stale boar's dung or swine's dung should be mixed with wine and given to the patients 
The magicians, too, have added to this branch of medicine their own fanciful devices. In the first place of all, madness in he-goats, they say, may be effectually calmed by stroking the beard, and if the beard is cut off, the goat will never stray to another flock. To the above composition they add goat's dung, and recommend it to be held in the hollow of the hand, as hot as possible. A greased linen cloth being placed beneath, and care being taken to hold it in the right hand, if the pain is on the left side, and in the left hand if the pain is on the right. They recommend also that the dung employed for this purpose should be taken up on the point of a needle made of copper. The mode of treatment is for the patient to hold the mixture in his hand till the heat is felt to have penetrated to the loins, after which the hand is rubbed with a pounded leek and the loins with the same dung annealed with honey. They prescribe also for the same malady the testes of a hare to be eaten by the patient. In cases of sciatica, they are for applying cow dung warmed upon hot ashes in leaves, and for pains in the kidneys they recommend a hare's kidneys to be swallowed raw, or perhaps boiled, but without letting them be touched by the teeth. If a person carries about him the pastern bone of a hare, he will never be troubled with pains in the bowels, they say. Chapter 57. Remedies for Affections of the Spleen. Affections of the spleen are alleviated by taking the gall of a wild boar or hog in drink. Ashes of burnt deer's horns in vinegar, or what is best of all, the dried spleen of an ass, the good effects being sure to be felt in the course of three days. The first dung voided by an ass's foal, a substance known as palea, by the people of Syria, is administered in oxymel for these complaints. A dried horse tongue, too, is taken in wine, a sovereign remedy which Cecilius Bion tells us he first heard of when living among the barbarous nations. The milk of a cow or ox is used in a similar manner, but when it is quite fresh, the practice is to roast or boil it and take it with the food. For pains in the liver, a topical application is made by bruising twenty heads of garlic in one sextarius of vinegar and applying them in a piece of ox bladder. For the same malady, the magicians recommend a calf's milt, bought at the price set upon it and without any haggling, that being an important point, and one that should be religiously observed. This done, the milt must be cut in two lengthwise and attached to the patient's shirt on either side after which the patient must put it on and let the pieces fall at his feet, and must then pick them up and dry them in the shade. While this last is doing, the diseased liver of the patient will gradually contract, they say, and he will eventually be cured. The lights, too, of a fox are very useful for this purpose, dried on hot ashes and taken in water. The same, too, with a kid's milt, applied to the part affected. Chapter 58. Remedies for Bowel Complaints To arrest looseness of the bowels, deer's blood is used, the ashes also of deer's horns, the liver of a wild boar, taken fresh and without salt in wine, a swine's liver roasted, or that of a he-goat, boiled in five semi-sextari of wine, a hare's rennet boiled in quantities the size of a chickpea, in wine or if there are symptoms of fever in water. To this last some persons add nut galls, while others again content themselves with hare's blood boiled by itself in milk. Ashes too of burnt horse dung are taken in water for this purpose, or else ashes of the part of an old bull's horn which lies nearest the root sprinkled in water. The blood too of a he goat boiled upon charcoal or a decoction made from a goat's hide boiled with the hair on. For relaxing the bowels, a horse's rennet is used, or else the blood marrow or liver of a she-goat. A similar effect is produced by applying a wolf's gall to the navel, with elaterium by taking mare's milk, goat's milk with salt and honey, or a she-goat's gall with juice of cyclaminos, and a little alum 
in which last case some prefer adding nitre and water to the mixture. Bull's gall, too, is used for a similar purpose, beaten up with wormwood and applied in the form of a suppository, or butter is taken in considerable doses. Celiac affections and dysentery are cured by taking cow's liver, ashes of deer horns, a pinch in three fingers swallowed in water, hare's rennet kneaded up in bread, or, if there is any discharge of blood, taken with polenta, or else boar's dung, swine's dung, or hare's dung, reduced to ashes and mixed with mulled wine. Among the remedies also for the celiac flux and dysentery, veal broth is reckoned, a remedy very commonly used. If the patient takes ass's milk for these complaints, it will be all the better if honey is added, and no less efficacious for either complaint are the ashes of ass's dung taken in wine, or else polia, the substance above mentioned. In such cases, even when attended with a discharge of blood, we find a horse's rennet recommended by some persons known as hippus, ashes of burnt horse dung, horse's teeth pounded and boiled cow's milk. In cases of dysentery, it is recommended to add a little honey and for the cure of griping pains, ashes of deer's horns, bull's gall mixed with cumin or the flesh of a gourd should be applied to the navel. For both complaints, new cheese made of cow's milk is used as an injection. Butter also in the proportion of four semi-sextari to two ounces of turpentine, or else employed with a decoction of mallows or with oil of roses. Veal suet or beef suet is also given, and the marrow of those animals is boiled with meal, a little wax and some oil, so as to form a sort of pottage. This marrow too is kneaded up with bread for a similar purpose, or else goat's milk is used boiled down to one half. In cases too where there are gripings in the bowels, wine of the first running is administered. For the last name pains, some persons are of opinion that it is a sufficient remedy to take a single dose of hare's rennet in mulled wine, though others again who are more distrustful are in the habit of applying a liniment to the abdomen made of goat's blood, barley meal and resin. For all the defluxions of the bowels, it is recommended to apply soft cheese and for celiac affections and dysentery, old cheese. Powdered, one syathus of cheese being taken in three syathi of ordinary wine. Goat's blood is boiled down with the marrow of those animals for the cure of dysentery and the celiac flux is effectually treated with the roasted liver of a she-goat, or what is still better, the liver of a he-goat, boiled in astringent wine, and administered in the drink, or else applied to the navel with oil of myrtle. Some persons boil down the liver in three sextari of water, to half a sextarius, and then add rue to it. The milt of a he or she-goat is sometimes roasted for this purpose, or the suet of a he-goat is incorporated in bread baked upon the ashes. The fat, too, of a she-goat taken from the kidneys more particularly is used. This last, however, must be taken by itself and swallowed immediately, being generally recommended to be taken in water moderately cool. Some persons, too, boil goat suet in water, with a mixture of polenta, cumin, anise and vinegar and for the cure of celiac affections, they rub the abdomen with a decoction of goat's dung and honey. For both the celiac flux and the dysentery, kid's rennet is employed, taken in myrtle wine, in pieces the size of a bean, or else kid's blood, prepared in the form of a dish, known by the name of sanguiculus. For dysentery, an injection is employed, made of bull glue dissolved in warm water. Flatulency is dispelled by a decoction of calf's dung in wine. For intestinal affections, deer's rennet is highly recommended, boiled with beef and lentils and taken with the food. Hare's fur also reduced to ashes and boiled with honey, or boiled goat's milk, taken with a small quantity of mallows and some salt. If rennet is added, 
the remedy will be all the more effectual. Goat suet, taken in any kind of broth, is possessed of similar virtues, care being taken to swallow cold water immediately after. The ashes of a kid's thighs are said to be marvellously efficacious for intestinal hernia, as also hare's dung boiled with honey and taken daily in pieces the size of a bean. Indeed, these remedies are said to have proved effectual in cases where a cure has been quite despaired of. The broth, too, made from a goat's head, boiled with the hair on, is highly recommended. Chapter 59 Remedies for Tenesmus, Tapeworm and Affections of the Colon The disease called tenesmus, or in other words a frequent and ineffectual desire to go to stool, is removed by drinking ass's milk or cow's milk. The various kinds of tapeworm are expelled by taking the ashes of deer's horns in drink. The bones which we have spoken of as being found in the excrements of the wolf, worn attached to the arm, are curative of diseases of the colon, provided they have not been allowed to touch the ground. Pelea, too, a substance already mentioned, is remarkably useful for this purpose. Boiled in grape juice, the same too with swine's dung, powdered and mixed with cumin in a decoction of rue. The antler of a young stag, reduced to ashes and taken in wine, mixed with African snails, crushed with the shells on, is considered a very useful remedy. Chapter 60 Remedies for Affections of the Bladder and for Urinary Calculi Diseases of the bladder and the torments attendant upon calculi are treated with the urine of a wild boar or the bladder of that animal taken as food both of them being still more efficacious if they have been thoroughly soaked first. The bladder when eaten should be boiled first, and if the patient is a female, it should be a sow's bladder. There are found in the liver of the wild boar certain small stones, or what in hardness resemble small stones, of a white hue, and resembling those found in the liver of the common swine. If these stones are pounded and taken in wine, they will expel calculi, it is said. So oppressed is the wild boar by the burden of his urine, that if he has not first voided it, he is unable to take to flight, and suffers himself to be taken as though he were enchained to the spot. This urine, they say, has a consuming effect upon urinary calculi. The kidneys of a hare, dried and taken in wine, act as an expellent upon calculi. We have already mentioned that in the gammon of the hog there are certain joint bones. A decoction made from them is remarkably useful for urinary affections. The kidneys of an ass dried and pounded and administered in undiluted wine are a cure for diseases of the bladder. The excrescences that grow on horses' legs, taken for 40 days in ordinary wine or honeyed wine, expel urinary calculi. The ashes, too, of a horse's hoof, taken in wine or water, are considered highly useful for this purpose. And the same with the dung of a she-goat. If a wild goat, all the better, taken in honeyed wine. Goat's hair, too, is used, reduced to ashes. For carbuncles upon the generative organs, the brains and blood of a wild boar or swine are highly recommended and for serpiginous affections of those parts, the liver of those animals is used, burnt upon juniper wood more particularly, and mixed with papyrus and arsenic. The ashes also of their dung, ox gall kneaded to the consistency of honey, with Egyptian alum and myrrh, beetroot boiled in wine being laid upon it, or else beef. Running ulcers of those parts are treated with veal suet and marrow, boiled in wine or with the gall of a she-goat, mixed with honey and the extracted juice of the bramble. In cases where these ulcers are serpiginous, it is recommended to use goat's dung with honey or vinegar, or else butter by itself. Swellings of the testes are reduced by using veal suet with nitre, or the dung of an animal boiled in vinegar. The bladder of a wild boar, eaten roasted, 
acts as a check upon incontinence of urine, a similar effect being produced by the ashes of the feet of a wild boar or swine sprinkled in the drink, the ashes of a sow's bladder taken in drink, the bladder or lights of a kid, a hare's brains taken in wine, the testes of a male hare grilled, the rennet of that animal taken with goose grease and polenta, or the kidneys of an ass beaten up and taken in undiluted wine. The magicians tell us that after taking the ashes of a boar's genitals in sweet wine, the patient must make water in a dog kennel and repeat the following formula. This I do, that I may not wet my bed as a dog does. On the other hand, a swine's bladder attached to the groin facilitates the discharge of the urine, provided it has not already touched the ground. Chapter 61. Remedies for diseases of the generative organs and of the fundament. For diseases of the fundament, a sovereign remedy is bear's gall, mixed with the grease, to which some persons are in the habit of adding litharge and frankincense. Butter too is very good, employed with goose grease and oil of roses. The proportions in which they are mixed will be regulated by the circumstances of the case, care being taken to see that they are of a consistency which admits of their being easily applied. Bull's gall upon lint is a remarkably useful remedy and has the effect of making chaps of the fundament cicatrize with great rapidity. Swellings of those parts are treated with veal suet, that from the loins in particular, mixed with rue. For other affections, goat's blood is used with polenta. Goat's gall, too, is employed by itself for the cure of condylomata, and sometimes wolf's gall mixed with wine. Bear's blood is curative of inflamed tumours and apostemes upon these parts in general as also bull's blood dried and powdered. The best remedy, however, is considered to be the stone which the wild ass voids with its urine. It is said at the moment he is killed. This stone, which is in a somewhat liquefied state at first, becomes solid when it reaches the ground. Attached to the thigh, it disperses all collections of humours and all kinds of suppurations. It is but rarely found, however, and it is not every wild ass that produces it, but as a remedy it is held in high esteem. Ass's urine, too, used in combination with gith, is highly recommended. The ashes of a horse's hoof, applied with oil and water, a horse's blood, that of a stone horse in particular, the blood also of an ox or cow, or the gall of those animals. Their flesh, too, applied warm, is productive of similar results. The hoofs reduced to ashes and taken in water or honey, the urine of a she-goat, the flesh of a he-goat, boiled in water, the dung of these animals boiled with honey, or else a boar's gall or swine's urine applied in wool. Riding on horseback, we well know, galls and chafes the inside of the thighs. The best remedy for accidents of this nature is to rub the parts with the foam which collects at a horse's mouth. Where there are swellings in the groin arising from ulcers, a cure is effected by inserting in the sores three horsehairs tied with as many knots. End of section 13